And live now from Fox it does continue here as we go out to a breaking news right now in Princeton, Minnesota. You're taking a look at what was once a home and uh, this house explosion is being investigated right now. And uh, you are taking live Sky Fox aerials of, uh, of this horrific scene right here of uh, the house that is gone. And we have the fire crews there on the scene. Uh, just checking it all out right now, but uh, as Sky Foxes will zoom out in just a little bit, you'll really get to see, unfortunately, the, the huge uh, explosion here that was uh, for this home here. But uh, crews continue to go around it right now. We have nothing confirmed at this moment as far as injuries here, but once we get some confirmation, we will bring it to you here on live now from Fox, but a really sad scene as you're seeing a lot of debris there. Obviously what was once a home, looks like the garage was able uh, to remain there and fire crews and investigators on the scene right now in Princeton, Minnesota. You can see they also have all the yellow tape around uh, the perimeter of this home. A lot of times with these uh, stories, unfortunately, it's some sort of gas leak, something of that nature to uh, have this house just explode like that. And you can imagine what the sound must have been in this neighborhood for neighbors and really even a couple of blocks away, I bet, heard this as well. And uh, the debris all over the front and backyard of this home here. And uh, once we get some more confirmation as far as any injuries associated with this, we will bring it to your attention here on Live Now from Fox. Always bringing you live feeds as they're happening in real time right here. That's what we do here. If we have the shot, we go to it and uh, bring you this live breaking news. Wish it was a better one here for everyone that is watching on this afternoon here, Thursday, about 3.30 out on the East Coast, 12.30 out on the West Coast as we continue to roll on right here on Live Now from Fox. And you can see right there more uh, fire crews there in the rubble right now of this home going through it as they continue to uh, look at the debris right now. And you can see large, obviously, fire and EMS response right here. And uh, once we get a little bit more information, we'll bring it to you here on Live Now from Fox, everybody. We're going to take another quick two-minute break. All right, and again, Chopper is leaving right now. If we get any more updates throughout the day on this, we'll bring it to you here on Live Now from Fox, everyone.
Uh, using Welcome back, everyone. Here to live now from Fox, getting a little briefing on the State Department's side right here. The United States. Does the U.S. expect China to solve the nuclearization of North Korea? Is it is this the only U.S. have the tool for resolving the North Korean denuclearizations? Or you have, uh, or is there any other tools you have? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, I would answer it by. Uh, saying that and reiterating that our relationship with China uh, is uh, predominantly competitive. It is a relationship predicated on the idea of competition, uh, and that is the overriding feature of it. Uh, there are certainly aspects of our relationship uh, that are adversarial, uh, and uh, we've spoken uh, quite a bit about that often in the context of um, uh, doing so jointly with our partners and allies. Uh, but there are also areas of that relationship that either are or have the potential to be cooperative. And the way we look at this is uh, through the lens of our own national interests. Uh, and that is to say that uh, we seek cooperation with China if and when our interests are aligned. Uh, and now importantly, I think it's fair to say we are never going to have identical interests with uh, the PRC. Uh, but North Korea, the DPRK, uh, is one of those areas where there is at least some alignment of interests. Um, <clears throat> and so we think that uh, there is room for, at the very least, discussion uh, with the PRC when it comes to the challenge posed by the DPRK's uh, nuclear and ballistic missile programs and its other uh, threatening activity. That's precisely why uh, Secretary Blinken, when he spoke with Director Young, uh, most recently, I believe it was last month, uh, briefed uh, and offered an update to Director Young on the conclusion of our uh, DPRK uh, policy review. Uh, it is uh, precisely why uh, the United States, over the course of years, um, in different formats, has uh, engaged the PRC in discussions uh, over the DPRK. Uh, so, as you know, uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman. Or a State Department briefing there on relations, North Korea and South Korea. You are watching live now from Fox, everybody. <clears throat> what I, I want to do now is uh, go out to earlier today with the White House COVID-19 Task Force talking a lot about the new uh, Delta variant as well as CDC uh, being asked about, will there be an update to federal mask guidelines. So watch this and see what they say. Today, I want to speak about our need to come together against a common enemy, SARS-CoV-2 and the Delta variant. The Delta variant is spreading with incredible efficiency and now represents more than 83% of the virus circulating in the United States. Compared to the virus we had circulating initially in the United States at the start of the pandemic, the Delta variant is more aggressive and much more transmissible than previously circulating strains. It is one of the most infectious respiratory viruses we know of and that I have seen in my 20 year career. We recognize that some of you are still thinking about whether you will get vaccinated. Maybe you're seeing your local officials stepping forward publicly to get vaccinated, or maybe you're watching on local news that your community hospitals are getting full. Or, scarier still, maybe COVID-19 sickness has tragically hit you or your community closer to home. If you are still on the fence, if you still have questions about the vaccines, we welcome them. My request to you is this. Ask your questions. Talk to your healthcare provider. Talk to your pharmacist. Talk to your friends and neighbors who have gotten vaccinated and get your questions answered so that you feel comfortable and informed in making this critical decision. And please continue to do the things that we know worked to protect you and your family until you are fully vaccinated. If you are not vaccinated, please take the Delta variant seriously. This virus has no incentive to let up and it remains in search of the next vulnerable person to infect. Please consider getting vaccinated and take precautions until you do.
And if you've already had COVID infection, CDC guidance strongly recommends that you get vaccinated. It gives you longer lasting and more robust protection with the breadth and depth of coverage needed to conquer the variants currently circulating in this country. To those of you who have already gotten vaccinated, I know you are watching the rise in cases and have questions about what it means for you. I know you're probably worried about two things, whether you will still get COVID despite being vaccinated and which activities are safe. Let's start with the first concern. Being fully vaccinated to a high degree of protection against infection and an even higher degree of protection against severe illness, hospitalization, and death. That is what these vaccines were designed for and what the clinical trials studied and the vaccines generally do their job quite well. These vaccines are some of the most effective that we have in modern medicine. And the good news is that current scientific evidence shows that our current vaccines are working as they did in clinical trials, even against the Delta variant. Importantly, our data show that infections are much less common in vaccinated people compared to unvaccinated, and most illness in vaccinated individuals is asymptomatic or mild. The most important public health step is to increase the vaccination coverage in all communities in the U.S. and globally. There are places in this country where cases are high and cases caused by the Delta variant are also really high. And many of these areas have low vaccine coverage. In areas with high vaccine coverage and low rates of disease transmission, the, late, the chances of you coming in close contact with someone who is infectious is relatively low. In contrast, in areas with low vaccine coverage and high transmission, there is a much higher chance of you coming in close contact with one or many persons who are infectious. And that in those cases, the greatest risk is for those who are not fully vaccinated. Whether you are vaccinated or not, please know we together are not out of the woods yet. And you will want to make thoughtful decisions to protect your health and the health of your family and your community. We are yet at another pivotal moment in this pandemic, with cases rising again and some hospitals reaching their capacity in some areas. We need to come together as one nation, unified in our resolve to protect the health of ourselves, our children, our community, our country, and our future with the tools we have available. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Fauci. Thank you. Very much, Dr. Walensky. What I'd like to address for the next few minutes is the phenomenon that many have been speaking about lately, and that is the occurrence of infection after full vaccination. So let's just give a bit of a background on the first slide. What do we mean by that? That is the detection of SARS-CoV-2 equal to a 14 days after completion of all recommended doses of what would be an FDA EUA authorized vaccines. It's important to remember, as I'll get to in a moment, that infections after vaccination are expected. No vaccine is 100% effective. However, even if a vaccine does not completely protect against infection, it usually, if it's successful, protects against serious disease. And that's what I'd like to spend a moment on. If I could have the next slide. This is a slide that I put together several years ago in trying to describe the situation with vaccines against the standard childhood and adult diseases, as well as the difficulty we were having with developing vaccines against HIV. And when you think about vaccines being successful or unsuccessful, i.e. a failure, you really have to look at it in multiple subsets. For example, one element of a successful vaccine in one in which there's no illness, but there's no replication of the virus, no dissemination of the virus, and clearance of the virus. That is something that is an unusual feat for a vaccine to give truly what we call sterilizing immunity. Then there's also within the framework of a successful vaccine, one in which there's no clinical illness, but there is replication of the virus. 
It doesn't disseminate throughout the body. It stays at the level of entry, be that the upper airway, the GI tract, or what have you. Another element of a successful vaccine is one in which there might be mild illness that really does not interfere with the function of a person. It has replication, mild, very mild dissemination, but ultimately the virus is clear. You have a failure of a vaccine when actually you get frank disease. In other words, you haven't prevented the disease caused by the virus or the pathogen in question. In this place, you get substantial replication, you get substantial dissemination, and unless you have a lethal virus that kills the patient, ultimately the virus is cleared from the body. So what we're talking about when we talk about infection after vaccination, which is clearly being discussed now in the context of the Delta variant, by no means does that mean that you're dealing with an unsuccessful vaccine. The success of the vaccine is based on the prevention of illness. So let's just look at that very briefly. Next slide. These are the data that I've shown you multiple times about the efficacy of the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna, 95 and 94% respectively. Note, it is not 100% effective. Next slide. The same holds true for the J&J, which in the United States is 72% effective against clinically recognizable disease, not 100% effective. And so if you go to the last slide, what we're really dealing with is effectiveness against serious disease leading to hospitalization, and in some cases, death. And since the Delta variant is, as Dr. Walensky said, now 83% in this country, it's the one we're dealing with. So even though we are seeing infections after vaccination, referred commonly to as breakthrough infections, the effectiveness against <coughs> severe disease is still substantial, which is yet again, Another argument, which all of us say continually, get vaccinated. It offers good protection against disease. With that, we'll go back to Jeff. Well, thank you, uh, both Dr. Fauci and Dr. Walensky. It is clear that we're experiencing what many other countries are experiencing, increased case counts driven by the more transmissible Delta variant. We are concerned with the rise than we were early this year for three reasons. First and foremost, as Dr. Fauci just showed, our vaccines work. Fully vaccinated individuals have a high degree of protection against severe illness, hospitalization, and death. While we will see some cases among those who are vaccinated, as to be expected with any vaccine, these cases are generally mild and oftentimes asymptomatic which is just more proof that the vaccines work. In fact, unvaccinated individuals account for virtually all, 97% of the COVID hospitalizations and deaths in the US. Second, we have fully vaccinated 162 million Americans, including 80% of those most vulnerable, individuals 65 years and older. As a result, we have fundamentally changed the course of this pandemic. The threat is now predominantly only to the unvaccinated. The data is clear. The case increases are concentrated in communities with low vaccination rates. In fact, the counties with the highest case rates have significantly lower vaccination rates than counties with lower case rates. This week, just three states, Florida, Texas and Missouri, three states with lower vaccination rates, accounted for 40% of all cases nationwide. For the second week in a row, one in five of all cases occurring in Florida alone. And within communities, these cases are primarily among unvaccinated people. The third reason we're in a different situation than earlier in the year is that we're continuing to make more progress 
by increasing the number of vaccinated Americans. Importantly, states with the highest case rates are actually seeing their vac vaccination rates go up. In fact, in the past week, the five states with the highest case rates, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Nevada, had a higher rate of people getting newly vaccinated compared to the national average. This is a very positive trend. For the second week in a row, states with lower vaccination and higher case rates are seeing their vaccination rates grow faster than the national average. People in these states are feeling the impact of being unvaccinated and responding with action. And across the country in the past 10 days, more than 5.2 million Americans have gotten a shot. So each day, hundreds of thousands of Americans are choosing to protect themselves, their kids and their neighbors by getting their first shot. And just as importantly, hundreds of thousands more are getting their second shot on the way to being fully vaccinated. These Americans are stepping up and doing their part. Each shot matters. Each additional person fully vaccinated is a step closer to putting this pandemic behind us. So we're making continued progress in our fight against the virus. And today we're announcing additional resources to get more shots in arms and combat surges, particularly in rural communities. As the president said last night, unvaccinated Americans know and trust people in their own communities to help get them accurate information about vaccines and help answer their questions. Today, we are announcing that we are sending $100 million to rural health clinics to support vaccine education and outreach efforts in these communities where we are generally seeing low vaccine uptake. This funding made possible by the American Rescue Plan will provide nearly 2,000 rural health clinics the resources they need to better reach unvaccinated Americans in their communities with information about COVID-19 and the vaccines and answer to their questions. As we work to get more shots in arms, we're also doubling down on our efforts to detect, prevent, and respond to outbreaks caused by the Delta variant. Testing and building testing capacity is a key part of our surge response because we know quickly detecting cases allows us to help prevent outbreaks and contain the virus. Last week, we announced $400 million in American Rescue Plan funding for 1,540 small rural hospitals for COVID-19 to increase testing capacity in rural America. And today, as part of our efforts to reach more vulnerable individuals, we're making an additional $1.6 billion investment in American Rescue Plan funding to bolster testing and mitigation measures in high-risk congregate settings including homeless shelters, mental health and substance abuse treatment centers, domestic violence shelters, and prison systems. These resources will help local health officials and communities identify potential outbreaks before they happen and prevent the further spread of COVID-19. Our COVID-19 surge response teams are also working with governors and local public health officials to identify specific needs on the ground and provide federal resources and support to fight outbreaks due to the spread of the Delta variant. We are now providing CDC's technical expertise, including on genetic sequencing, data analysis, and outbreak response to Missouri, Illinois, and Colorado. FEMA will be deploying mobile vaccination clinics in North Carolina. And today, HHS Secretary Becerra is traveling to Nevada where we have deployed federal resources and 100 personnel from FEMA and HHS to support local health officials as they work to mitigate the spread of Delta and increase vaccinations. In closing, our whole of government response continues to do everything we can to get more Americans fully vaccinated and protected from the virus and help states and communities curb the spread of the Delta variant. As the president said last night, it's up to each and every single American to do their own part. 
We know everyone's vaccination journey is different. We are ready to get more Americans vaccinated whenever, wherever they're ready. So please, if you are unvaccinated, consider vaccination today. It's free, it's available, it's easy, it works, and it's never, never been more important. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Murphy. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. And it's great to be with all of you again today. I'll start uh, just by acknowledging uh, the obvious, uh, what we're all seeing in the numbers, that it is troubling to see this rise in COVID cases. And it's another reminder that we're not out of the woods yet. But it's important also that we not lose sight of how far we've come. Cases are down dramatically from their January peak when we were averaging 200,000 plus cases a day. We've gotten more than 161 million people fully vaccinated, which means they have a high degree of protection against COVID-19. And every day, hundreds of thousands of people are still choosing to get vaccinated. That is all good news. One fact that has been proven time and time again during this past year is that vaccines save lives. That's why 99.5% of COVID-19 deaths and 97% of hospitalizations are among the unvaccinated. It's also why nearly every death from COVID-19 is a preventable tragedy. I'd like to share a few updates about how we're continuing to support people in making their decisions about the vaccine. First, we are ramping up our work with trusted messengers in key communities. This summer, we've seen people in every community stepping up to get their loved ones and neighbors vaccinated. That's been really encouraging. And these groups include faith communities from the group Choose Healthy Life, which has worked with powerful networks of 48 black churches in five cities to test and vaccinate people. It also includes the American Muslim and Multi-Faith Women's Empowerment Council, which has engaged their communities through phone banking, text banking, social media, and door-to-door -door canvassing. Healthcare professionals have also been stepping up, have more conversations with their patients. And earlier this summer, the Alpha chapter of the Chi Eta Phi Sorority, a service organization made up of nurses, had more than 1,145 conversations about vaccinations at barbershops, grocery stores, and throughout their communities. We're also continuing to work with the student COVID-19 community core, where students participate in calls to learn best practices and hear from their peers about how they can talk about vaccines with their friends and family and community members. And we're working with platforms like Twitch to answer user questions about the vaccines. But very importantly, we're also increasingly asking vaccinated people to help get their family and friends vaccinated. And the importance of this last item, family and friends, talking to family and friends, is underscored by recent data, which found that one out of five adults who were unsure about the vaccine in January have now been vaccinated. And when asked what changed their mind, it was talking to family, friends, and their doctors and seeing that people they knew had been safely vaccinated. So we need to keep having these conversations, reminding people that vaccination is still the best way to keep our family and friends safe from the worst outcomes of COVID-19. The second way that we're gaining ground against the virus is by addressing health misinformation. Last week, I issued a Surgeon General's advisory to call the nation's attention to the threat of health misinformation. Since then, we have continued to emphasize what individuals can do to stop health misinformation in its tracks. That includes asking everyone to raise their own bar for sharing health information by checking to make sure that it's backed by credible scientific sources. As we say in the advisory, if you are not sure, don't share. And we'll continue to say that on social media, in a video PSA that we've created and released, and in conversations we're convening with uh, people around the country. We're also mobilizing other stakeholders to address misinformation from technology companies and healthcare professionals to researchers and community-based organizations. In fact, right after this briefing, my office will be hosting a conversation with community organizations around the country to discuss the steps that they can take to stop the spread of health misinformation. Here's the bottom line. Misinformation is a threat to our health, and the speed, scale, and sophistication with which it is spreading is unprecedented. I will not hesitate to say that and to call for greater accountability and action to address health misinformation. A word about equity, though. We recognize that equity must be at the center of our work to confront health misinformation, and here's why. Because unequal access to the healthcare system, education, and technology means that some people have more limited access to accurate information than others. 
And when those people instead encounter health misinformation, it can worsen their health outcomes, which exacerbates health inequities and what becomes a vicious cycle. Ultimately, while the threat of the Delta variant uh, is, is here, while climbing infection rates are what we're seeing day to day, uh, primarily among the unvaccinated, it is more important than ever before that we not let our guard down. And that's why I'm asking everyone to please talk to your family and friends about getting vaccinated, because you could be saving their life. That's the people power movement that we've got to expand in our country. We've made great progress thanks to the hard work of millions of people across this country. We should not forget that, and we should be proud of it. But we have more work to do to end this pandemic. I look forward to taking your some of your questions, and I'll turn it back to you, Jeff. Thanks, doctor. And let's open it up for a few questions. Thanks, Jeff. Sabrina Siddiqui at The Wall Street Journal. Hi, thank you as always for uh, holding the briefing. And uh, maybe this is a question for Dr. Fauci, who spoke about- I believe we're having effective. trouble hearing the questions. The Sorry, questions can you hear me now? Hi, can you hear me better? Can you hear Jeff? Okay, we're taking a minute to sort through this technical issue. Let's uh, let's circle back and we'll go to Ouija at CBS. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Okay, we can hear. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this question's for Dr. Walensky. Uh, last night, President Biden indicated that the vaccine may be approved for children under 12 as soon as August, September, or October. Is there anything you can share about what led to that time frame and what any preliminary data shows so far for children who are participating in clinical trials? Um, and one more quick thing on this. Do you anticipate approval will be for all children under 12 at once or likely be separated by age groups? Um, so maybe I'll just say that uh, we're looking at the clinical trial data now. We're waiting for the clinical trial data to come in. The approval of the data and the authorization will be a regulatory FDA de decision. So after we have seen the clinical trial data, I have not seen them myself. After we will see them, then, then they will go to the FDA for the uh, regulatory process of authorization. Dr. Fauci, anything to add there? We're having trouble hearing Dr. Fauci. I'm sorry, Jeff, we were on mute. Um, no, I just to underscore what Dr. Walensky said, and that is that the clinical trials that are in progress are doing an age de-escalation. That relates to the second part of the question is question. So they'll do 12 to nine years old, nine to six, six to two, and then six months to two years. The data are being collected right now. Ultimately, as Dr. Walensky correctly said, this will be a regulatory decision based on the data that's accumulated. And I'll just reiterate what we've talked about before, which is the FDA is the gold standard for vaccine review and approval. They'll run an independent and rigorous scientific process. And when that process is complete, the American people can rest assured that the FDA maintained those world-class standards uh, throughout this period. Next question. Let's try Sabrina again. Okay, great. Just want to make sure that you can hear me. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Um, perhaps it's a question for Dr. Fauci, who talked about how effective the vaccines are at preventing severe illness. I'm curious if we know more about what the risk of breakthrough cases resulting in long COVID is, and given how recently people have been vaccinated, how long might it take to start identifying trends among possible long haul patients who've been vaccinated? Well, that's, a, that's a, uh, an object of a very intensive study right now following individuals with various levels of seriousness of disease as to what the uh, incidence and prevalence will be of long COVID. We don't have enough information right now to give you an accurate number of what that incidence is, but that's something that is being very 
actively followed right now. Next question. Elizabeth Wise at USA Today. Great, thanks so much for taking my call. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Walensky. I've been talking to epidemiologists and um, one of their concerns is that the CDC's masking policy lacked teeth. So most people just took it to mean they didn't need to wear a mask at all. Uh, San Francisco is now contemplating requiring uh, proof of vaccination to get into bars and restaurants. Um, other people have suggested that masking regulations change if cases go above five per 100,000. Are there any thoughts in the works of either clarifying or changing CDC's masking policy? Thank you, Elizabeth. You know, as we have said consistently, the greatest risk right now is to those who are unvaccinated. And we have consistently and repeatedly said, if you are unvaccinated, you need to be wearing a mask to protect yourself and others around you. And we need more people to get vaccinated to stop this pandemic. So overall, the CDC recommendations haven't changed. Fully vaccinated people are protected from severe illness. And we've always said that communities and individuals need to make the decisions that are right for them based on what's going on in their local areas. So if you're in an area that has a high case rate and low rates of vaccination where Delta cases are rising, you should certainly be wearing a mask if you are unvaccinated. If you are vaccinated, you get exceptional protection from the vaccines, but you have the opportunity to make the personal choice to add extra layers of protection if you so choose. Next question. Michael Shear, New York Times. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is for uh, Jeff, probably. Um, one specific and one general question. The specific question is there was this report overnight about the White House discussing masks. All right, that was the question and answer round with the White House COVID-19 Task Force as we continue on right here on Live Now from Fox, everybody. I'm your host, Mike Page. Happy Thursday to you all. This is the shot of the White House. We're going to take another quick two-minute break. When we come back, we'll go out to Florida for an update out there from America's Sheriff. We continue to roll on right here on Live Now from Fox. I'm your host, Mike Page. Thank you so much for everyone watching across the country, including even there in California, Samia, a, a fellow former New, News Now or Now Live Now from Fox. Thanks so much for watching as we continue to bring you the very latest right here on Live Now from Fox. Going out to Florida, getting a fresh update on a major drug sting uh, in Florida. Let's bring that to you here. 
when you work together, good things happen. And that's what happened in this particular investigation. These guys were known as the Bell Gang. Today we talk about the Bell Gang has the Bell Gang Blues because they're locked up in the county jail. But let me tell you how this began. It goes back as far as March of 2020 when FDLE and Lake Wells Police Department were investigating a group of people that were dealing in cocaine, methamphetamine, and cannabis. You know, all three of those low-level nonviolent drugs people want you to think are low-level nonviolent drugs. In November of 2020, the Sheriff's Office was investigating a gentleman by the name of James McLean. And as we did our deconfliction on the investigation, our undercover detectives determined that we were all working the same group of people. So we began a joint investigation. Now let's fast forward. As this investigation occurred, our detectives thought the best way to deal with this is with what we call a Title III in federal courts or 934 in state courts. It's a wiretap. It's where we listen to their phones. We go online with them with a court order. So our detectives working together in February of 2021 went up on the first telephone and they went up on the phone of James McLean. James is 34 years of age. He goes by the street name of Mook. He was dealing in meth, cannabis, and he was a major distributor for the Lake Wells area. And interestingly enough, during the investigation, James told our undercover folks when they asked him, why is this methamphetamine blue? He said, oh, we dyed it blue in recognition of the Democrat Party, of the Democrats. Now, I'm not sure the Democrat Party would be proud of that, but that's why it was blue, according to him. From that telephone, they listened into Vincent Thomas. That was the second phone they went up on. He's also, as you see on our chart here, he's 35. He's a major distributor in and around the Lake Wells area. And he's also a rapper. He's known as, known as Cheese. And you'll hear more about him in just a second. And then the third one whose phone we went up on was Patrick Fields. Patrick Fields is known as Big Pat. He's also a rapper. In fact, on the street, he's known as Big Pat Bank Account. That's right. If you look to see their cars, you look, you see that they're bragging about jewelry and guns. They're really proud. And then I always like to talk about Earl Thomas. Now, Earl Thomas is the father to Vincent. Like father, like son. What do you think about the county jail? Well, son, you got me in trouble again. That's right. Like father, like son. Only Vincent is the distributor and Earl was selling drugs on the street level at his car wash. See you later, son. Give me a kiss. Now, what did this result in? Well, we charged 32 people criminally. 29 of them have been arrested. Three are still at large, and you can see we've designated the ones that are at large. So, hey, you can go ahead and turn yourself in, or you're just going to go to jail tired from running, but you're going to jail. We served eight search warrants seven of them in Lake Wells, and one of them in the frostproof area. On one of the search warrants, we had to use a SWAT team. 
because when we went there, the guy threatened to commit suicide and he held himself hostage. But after a while, we were able to get him out of the house without there being any injuries. It was touch and go for, about, for a few minutes, but once again, we had our best trained deputies and law enforcement officers there, and we were able to work through that. We seized 11 firearms. Two of them were reported stolen to us. So let, let me let you see this. And let me let you see the marijuana. And Chris, can you hold that for me, Chief? And then you tie that to the money. And then there's people out here every day in the media saying, oh, this marijuana is low-level, nonviolent. People are dying because of that. And it's not low-level, nonviolent, and there, neither is the other drugs. You think about that the next time somebody tells you cocaine, methamphetamine, marijuana, it's just low-level, nonviolent. They're lying to you. So let's look at their previous charges. Eight of them are previously convicted felons. They had a total of 314 previous felonies, 331 misdemeanors for a total of 645 previous crimes. Well, that didn't seem to teach them that they need to go by society's rules. So here's what our Lake Wells FDLE agents like Wells police officers and our detectives from the sheriff's office did. We added another 301 felonies, 134 misdemeanors, and 435 total charges. We seized $88,000 in cash, $89,000 in jewelry, and street value, we seized 283000 in narcotics, $460,000 worth. And they were marketing themselves, as you might well expect that they would. In fact, they were marketing themselves because they look cool in the community, and we have or, or we'll show you some video of the vehicles they had. That's right. They thought they were cool. Well, how cool are you today? Can you all make up a rap song about this? Well, I'll help you out. You see, we got your gold. We put your tail in the county jail. You think about that, brothers. And you know what? This, you could call it the Blue Gang, the Bell Gang Blue rap song. How's that? You may think it's cool, but it'll end up with you arrested every time. It's not bad if you got it legal. Now, I want to give my colleagues a chance to talk. I explain they didn't have to do the rap song, but we, we are all excited because it took a lot of work by a lot of great detectives to make this happen, all in Lake Wells. So we'll start with uh, my friend and, and just a great police chief, um, Chief Velasquez. Thank you, Sheriff. You can dance if you like, though, by the way. I appreciate it. I appreciate you also not having me do the, uh, the rap song. Um, it would be hard to, hard to, to top that. Um, this is a great example of people working together, of law enforcement agencies working together. The criminals don't follow any kind of a jurisdiction. They don't stay within boundaries. They go wherever they want. And by us partnering and working together as a team, we did the same thing. So wherever they like to go, I can guarantee you that we'll follow them. The community asked for us to help 
and to step up and, and to deal with these drug dealers, and, uh, and we responded. This is just a great example. Uh, 32 people with warrants, and a good number of them, most of them already arrested. I can tell you right now, and our message is very clear, that we know who the others are, and we're hearing a lot from our friends here on the wall, and uh, you're next. So thank you. And we'll ask our Iraq, uh, Brandon Sheely from FDLE, if he'll speak. I just want to echo what the chief and the sheriff said, and I want to extend our appreciation to the men and women of each respective department. They put in 16 months of very hard work, and this is what happens. This is a success. It's the safety we provide our community. And this represents exactly the type of cases and the hard work, collaboration, and partnership we need to have to make sure that our citizens are safe here. Thanks, Sheriff. Thank you very much. Now, I asked Chief Stewart if he would speak, and he said, no. He said, I'm, I'm satisfied just to be standing there. Then he added, but, but you could tell them we rang their bell. And uh, that's exactly what we did. But there's more bell ringing to come. So if you think this is the end, it's only the beginning. And these folks like to talk. Are there any questions for us? Can you elaborate on how important it is to get these drugs off the streets, especially when there's so many young people around this area? These are the folks. Now, some of these people were users of drugs. For example, Angela, we have a warrant for. She was not selling. She was using. But these are the folks that are dealing with this drug at, at the ground level. We call it ground zero. It's where the drug is going from the dealers or from the, the distributor to the dealers, and they're handing it directly to the people in the community to include our children. And that's why these are the most dangerous. And they carry these guns. You know, they carry these guns to protect themselves from each other. They don't fear the police, but they certainly fear each other in the rip-offs and the home invasions and the drive-by shootings. And that's what makes this so very dangerous. We know that when we work together and good things happen, and make no mistake about it, your local police hears it on the street. But for us to be ultimately successful, we need to, to do this wiretap to, to ferret out the people who were, who were big time involved in distributing drugs on the streets of Lake Wells. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the criminal charges we have now. And a lot of these cases are 15-year minimum mandatories. I'll never let up saying there are people that think we need to do away with the minimum mandatories. Oh, let's just do away with them. Oh, so they can distribute these kinds of drugs to your children and not be held appropriately accountable? Oh, so they can just have their guns and they brag with their, their gold and their fancy cars? When you show a bunch of kids cash, they think it's cool. And you don't think they should be held ultimately responsible? Fortunately, the overwhelming majority of the Florida legislature gets it. Our governor gets it. And we're going to keep locking people up like this because this is where it's going to the kids on the streets. I think this makes a significant dent in the Lake Wells area because this was a network of drug dealers and sellers and some users. Does that mean that we've stopped all drug sales in Lake Wells or Polk County? Obviously not. There's competitors out there, but I consider that more opportunities to make more arrests. I'm very comfortable with it. And heck, who knows? We may end up making another rap song. What was your reaction to figuring out how many people were intertwined in this and it just kept growing? We truly expected that, but that's why 
these types of 934 investigations are important because otherwise you can't always sew together the distributors and all of their partners. And we were able to do that. This takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of legwork behind the scene that you don't see. You said that you guys aren't done yet. There's a lot more to do. Going forward, do you expect that there to be a lot more cases like this? Or? Well, first and foremost, we're going to work with the state attorney's office and see if we can bring additional charges to them. I like racketeering. Racketeering is a 30-year minimum mandatory, or I'm sorry, it's a 30-year felony. It's a first-degree felony. So it's not a minimum mandatory. It's a 30-year felony. So I want to look at racketeering charges, at least for the kingpins here. In addition to that, some of these people are going, oh, wait a minute. You know, I'm just selling drugs to get along here, and some of them will cooperate or are cooperating and are pointing out other drug dealers and other distributors. We're coming for them, as the chief said. So it, it's, like, it's like dropping a pebble into the water. It started out as a little ripple, and now we've got some big waves, and we hope a tsunami over, overcomes these drug dealers as we try to wash them away into the prison system because that's where we can make a difference when they're not on the street selling drugs and not on the street pointing guns at people. And make no mistake about it, they don't carry these just for looks. They don't carry these for any other reason than self-protection and intimidation for whoever they're dealing with at the time. Anything else? Well, all of most most of your drugs comes from a variety of areas. Now, now your marijuana, we see some of it local, but this is pretty good stuff here. So somebody's growing it. One of the guys we arrested actually works at a medical or at a at a marijuana growing facility. But the drugs that we caught him with was that he was buying from someone else. So it wasn't from the facility he worked at, but he actually worked in a Lake Wells facility that legally grows marijuana, at least by state law. Anything else? Thank you all very much. Have a good day. And there is the wrap up there on this story there. Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd always talking in sound bites. You're watching live now from Fox. Let's take a quick two minute break.
Hubbard Farms right down the street. Uh, and the Big story, everyone. Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. We go out to the Detroit area, getting an update on affordable housing in this area. Starting around us uh, because of those seeds that were planted decades ago. And we're really proud of that. We're really proud of that work. What this bit of history illustrates is that the strategic revitalization of our neighborhood has been an evolutionary and deeply collaborative process that builds momentum as it goes. And the renovation of the Murray capitalizes on that momentum and also advances it. We're very proud to be a partner in this wonderful achievement, and we hope it will serve as a model for other neighborhoods in our city. I want to thank you all for celebrating with us, and thank you for being here. Emery. Thank you, Sean. Uh, at this moment, I'm going to pause to acknowledge my family that is here. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I see you. I appreciate it. You're embarrassing me, but I'm glad you're here. Embarrassing in a good way in that I don't deserve it. I just want to be clear. You're not embarrassing. You guys need to edit that piece out. I don't need that getting around to the Matthews around the world that my family embarrassed me. Oh, man. I got Thanksgiving will come fast this year. Um, Obviously, the project required uh, an enormous commitment from our capital partners, uh, and we have two of the best in the city of Detroit. We have done deals across the country, but I have to tell you, they are unparalleled. And the first up is uh, Invest Detroit. And I just want to say that without Invest Detroit and their fellow co-lender, this is not possible in the very real way. But more importantly, they figure out ways to provide supportive measures to not just deliver the project, but to deliver some of the support services that go around to help develop the talent that is necessary to do these projects many times over. They are all about building capacity in the city of Detroit. And so I am eternally grateful to Mr. Mike Verge, who will come up now uh, to talk a little bit about Invest Detroit. Mike? Great. Thank you, Emery. Um, I love a groundbreaking, but I love a uh, ribbon cutting so much more because it's it's a plan or a dream that has been realized and I think it's so important that uh, that we plan that we dream but then when those things become real it's awesome so that's why I'm celebrating today uh, I thank all the partners this has been a wonderful opportunity to take a building that was not being utilized and if it was it was not being utilized for good things and bring it back to life. So that is exciting. And that point of uh, getting things involved, getting dreams to become reality, the, the dream started with talking with the neighbors. And what did the neighborhood want here? And that was something that was vital for Emory, for Southwest Solutions, and for us also at Invest Detroit, to make that be what they wanted it to be in their in their neighborhood in their town and and we have a saying at Invest Detroit what we do is we ignite growth um, that's a dream that's a plan but now you start to see what this building does with that building and the park down the street and things that'll be announced on Verner very soon and on Bagley that's what this is all about and what also is so important to us is that the citizens of this city participate in this and that's why it's so wonderful to have Emory as a native Detroiter being the one who participates in this who does this and we come alongside him and now we're already talking about other projects and other neighborhoods that he's going to do the magic that he does so it has been an honor and it's been very humble to be just a part of this I thank all our partners mayor of the city Emory you especially um, Southwest Solutions our friends at CIP and uh, everyone who participated in this. So thank you so much. You know, one of the things that was important to us um, to make sure we respond to provide affordable options. A project like this obviously is very expensive, particularly when you try to honor the building's history in a very real way. But thanks to the support of Invest Detroit and especially Capital Impact, we are able to offer a quarter of the units at a far below market rate. It's not possible without folks like Elizabeth Luther at Capital Impact Partners, who I'd like to bring up now. Elizabeth. Thanks, Emery, for the introduction and for having me here today. My name is Elizabeth Luther. I'm the Director of Detroit Programs for Capital Impact Partners. 
Uh, I will keep my remarks very brief. Uh, Emery, Stan, and Sean, congratulations. Uh, Mayor Duggan, Katie, and the rest of the City of Detroit team, thank you for your continued leadership. Uh, to Mike and our friends at Invest Detroit, thank you for your continued partnership. Uh, and to our investors at J.P. Morgan Chase, thank you for in investing in Detroit's mission-driven lenders in order to make projects like this possible. Capital Impact, a community development lender, is proud to be involved in supporting the revitalization of vacant properties in Detroit neighborhoods through financing and technical assistance throughout the housing development life cycle. I'll speak personally as a neighborhood resident who has been walking, jogging, biking, and driving by this property for the better part of nine years. Uh, I can safely say that this beautiful 12-unit mixed-income rehab looks fantastic and is a huge improvement from where it was one year ago and for the decades plus prior. Uh, I actually remember when Emery started joining the Hubbard, Far Hubbard Farms Neighborhood Association meetings. I don't remember how many years ago, but I was, <laughs> I was on the board at the time. Um, in order to engage in initial discussions around the project with a really genuine and thoughtful approach. In the current development market, smaller scale rehabs uh, like this one require significant coordination, tenacity, and willpower to complete. And I know it was no small feat to get this one over the finish line. So congratulations again to all involved. Um, and I will turn it back over to Emery. Thanks. OK, thank you for coming out today. I want to end today's um, session with my co-founder and business partner, Mr. Stan Edwards. Stan is a superstar who believed in our company when few other people did and helped guide this process through fruition. And so it is uh, a very proud moment that I get to share it with someone with whom I worked and been partnered with for so long. So at this point, I'd like to bring Mr. Stan Edwards up to share a few thoughts. Thank you, Emery. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor's office and all the partners here. Uh, this project is something that Real Estate Interest LLC takes very, very serious. Both Emery and I are born and raised in Detroit, longtime Detroiters. Our firm is dedicated to making sure we do our role and our part to impact the beautification of the city. So we thank everyone for coming out and supporting us. We thank all of the neighborhood folk that we listened to and had input in what we were attempting to do. And we look forward to you guys to more ribbon cuttings in the future. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. We appreciate it. With that event wrapping up, you're watching live now from Fox. Everybody will be taking another quick two-minute break.
Congress Caucus, uh, members of Congress who are doctors who uh, have been on the front lines of taking care of people their whole lives to talk about real concerns we have regarding COVID, regarding especially the origins of COVID and the lack of interest by Speaker Pelosi uh, to look into the origins of COVID, to actually be willing to hold China accountable for what happened with the creation of this virus. Going back over a year ago, uh, many of our colleagues have been saying we need to have hearings in Congress on the origins of COVID. This is an evil virus. It's killed over 600,000 Americans, millions worldwide, and yet Speaker Pelosi refuses to hold a hearing on how this started. Uh, if we're ever gonna be able to get through this and especially to prevent something like this from happening again, we need to at least find out how it really did happen. And while Speaker Pelosi refuses to investigate this, many of us have taken action on our own to start digging into the facts, to try to get the facts as best we can. On the select subcommittee on the coronavirus, all of the Republican members of that select subcommittee held a hearing on the origins of COVID. We brought in medical experts from around the country, and it was very, very eye-opening to see what they said. Every one of those medical doctors testified that the virus likely started in the Wuhan lab. They also testified that it is very likely gain of function research, not bat to animal to human transmission that created this virus. Everybody in America ought to be concerned about those findings. But everybody in America also is demanding the same kind of answers we are. And the fact that the only person that won't investigate what really happened is Speaker Pelosi. What does Speaker Pelosi have to hide? Why is Speaker Pelosi actively fighting to get the facts out, fighting against it? Why is she trying to do the work of the Chinese Communist Party in covering this up? We know that the Chinese Communist Party won't release the background, the data, the facts, uh, won't let us talk to those people that worked in that Wuhan lab. Uh, was there American tax dollars that went directly or indirectly to the Wuhan lab to perform gain of function research? A lot of evidence indicates there was. All of these questions deserve answers. And we're going to continue fighting for those answers, even if Speaker Pelosi tries to participate in a colossal cover up of the facts. That's what we're here to talk about. And to talk about it further, I'm proud to introduce our conference chair, Elise Stefanik. Thank you so much, Whip Scalise. Just as a reminder, we were here with the Docs Caucus just two weeks ago. These members have been active throughout the COVID crisis, sharing their medical expertise, sharing their policy expertise. And I want to publicly thank the members of the Republican Docs Caucus for this leadership, these policy proposals, and this expertise throughout the crisis. From delivering vaccines to the American people, to their public service announcements encouraging vaccines, and of course their important work to follow the facts and the science to investigate the origins of, the, of COVID when Democrats have refused and failed to do so. I also want to take this moment to thank my local county public health officials and providers in my district who have worked hard to educate and answer questions and serve the public. Some of the most rural counties in New York's North Country have been nationally recognized for their leadership and vaccine rates throughout the pandemic. Americans across the country know we cannot afford another shutdown. We need to keep our schools and businesses open, and we must remain focused on getting answers as to the origins of this devastating global pandemic. Every American has been negatively impacted in some way by the COVID-19 virus. The question is, why are Democrats stonewalling our efforts to uncover the origin of the COVID virus? Why are Democrats not investigating the growing list of evidence that leads us directly to the Chinese Communist Party and their cover-up? And why is this administration refusing to hold China accountable? Our re Republican members will continue to work to demand answers and accountability and transparency for the American people. And the GOP Docs Caucus is leading the way. And I'm proud to turn it over to one of the co-chairs of the Republican Docs Caucus, Dr. Andy Harris. Thank you very much. Uh, today, before we, before we talk about the origins and where we go from here, let's just summarize a little bit about the Delta variant and the vaccines. 
Look, the Delta variant is with us to stay. We know that the vast majority of new cases in the United States are Delta variant. Uh, that's the bad news. Uh, it's, it's, more, it's a more transmissible variant. The good news is it looks like it's no more virulent. That, in fact, uh, if you look at deaths and, and hospitalizations, it's probably no, no worse than, than the, uh, the original uh, virus or the variants. Uh, the the uh, Vaccinations, in a, in a study just published yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, a two-series, uh, uh, two-course series of vaccinations uh, does protect against symptomatic infection from the Delta variant. So members of the DOC caucus, like myself and others, have been, have been vaccinating patients, have been participating in clinics, getting the message out that if you are at risk, you should uh, be getting this vaccine. This vaccine does, in fact, uh, protect against symptomatic Delta variant, and uh, we continue to deliver that message. We urge all Americans to talk to their doctors about the risks of COVID, uh, talk to the, their doctors about the benefits of getting vaccinated, and then come to a decision that's right for them about the vaccine. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Miller Meeks to talk a little bit more about the source. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh And thank you all for being here today. It has become increasingly clear, profoundly so after the Republicans hearing last month on the origins of COVID-19, that SARS-CoV-2 emanated from a laboratory leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. You know, criminals have been convicted on less circumstantial evidence than currently exists supporting a lab leak, and every day more evidence is revealed. What did the Chinese Communist Party know and when? Independent scientific studies concluded that the first cases of COVID in China occurred somewhere between mid-October to mid-November in 2019. Workers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology became ill with a respiratory infection at that same time, three of whom sought hospital care for a respiratory illness, which would now be considered COVID-like symptoms. Investigators from WIV and collaborators across the globe reported in 2015 Nature Medicine publication the creation of a new hybrid bat coronavirus that could bind to and infect human airway cells, proving that the lab was doing dangerous research on bat coronaviruses, including gain-of-function research, which could, which could accentuate the ability of these viruses to cause pandemics. Both SARS-1 and MERS showed extensive human infection prior to developing human-to-human -human transmission, and none was found in 9,522 stored hospital records in Wuhan. No coronavirus in the subgenus Sarbre covirus had a fur furin cleavage site. There was no CGG, CGG jublet anywhere in the subgenus, and there is an absence of genetic diversity. All of this points to laboratory leak. We know it did not come from a wet market, which was the source of secondary spread. The World Health Organization investigation report failed to detect the presence of this virus after testing more than 80,000 wildlife, livestock, and poultry samples from 32 provinces in China. And remember, both SARS and MERS had an identified intermediate host. There were known laboratory leaks at this laboratory, as there are at other research laboratories and bat coronavirus research and level four biosafety research was conducted in level two labs. The World uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology had been cited before for their lack of laboratory security. Despite this evidence, the World Health Organization perpetuated the myth that it could not come from a lab leak. The World Health Organization cannot be rel relied upon to do thorough, impartial, and an objective investigation. It perpetuated the lies of the Chinese Communist Party that there was no human-to-human -human transmission. It delayed labeling this as a pandemic and it, that there was a potential for asymptomatic spread. Wu helped the Chinese Communist Party cover up the true nature and origins of the pandemic, which has caused the loss of millions of lives around the globe. Only recently has the World Health Organization finally relented and acknowledged that the lab leak theory is possible, but yesterday, the Chinese Communist Party still refuses to cooperate. At our hearing, Dr. Richard Mueller indicated that they have found no credible evidence that favors zoonotic origin. The origins of SARS-CoV-2 in the cover-up and its origins, both the cover-up and where it came from, they're important for a variety of reasons. It's important for public health, national security, and it's also important for how you and the media treat dissenting opinions.
regardless from who they come. Those who talked about the origins of a lab leak were ridiculed and marginalized. In the public health arena, it's extremely important for the international community to set standards for the regulation of gain-of-function research and whether dangerous research can be conducted in these laboratories, standards for bio lab safety and breach of laboratory safety protocols or research done in adequate level safety levels and repercussions if there's not immediate disclosure and transparency of potential viruses that could lead to a pandemic. This will better help pandemic preparedness in the future. And as discussed in our hearing last month, Chinese Communist Party has acknowledged doing bioweapons research, including gain of function research. This is a national security issue for us all. The delays in acknowledging the pandemic and the human to human transmission also allowed the Chinese Communist Party to stockpile PPE, swabs and testing reagents that would be needed to protect the health and safety of people around the world, costing numerous lives. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Greg Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Miller Meeks. Good morning, everyone. I think it's incumbent upon all of us here, um, especially you guys in the media, to understand that science is an objective, uh, an objective issue. Not anybody in here in this crowd, I believe, checks a, a physician's credentials, whether they're Republican or Democrat, before they go see them and seek their advice. They sure don't, at least now anyway. Uh, look in medical school applications to see if you're a Republican or Democrat. This should not be a Republican-Democrat issue. And it's been made one by the Democratic Party, and honestly, it's been made one by the media. I'm honored to be part of this group, which is the GOP Doctors Caucus, and we would love to have uh, Democratic physicians on this, but there's been no leadership from Speaker Pelosi on that side. We just truly don't understand what she's hiding. You know, as physicians, we all stand and we stand trained to look at evidence when we diagnose a problem and we draw fact-based conclusions. We're all in a unique position, actually, to dissect the origins of this pandemic so that we can prevent further health crises. It's obvious, it is obvious for anyone in the medical field that the genetic evidence at this point in time shows that this is a gain of function, res result from a gain of function and possibly in part of Chinese bioweapons research. As we all know, the, there is clear and categorical evidence that leads us to believe that the COVID-19 virus started in the Wuhan lab. Despite what was pushed by the media, the evidence is overwhelming that this is what happened. It is up to doctors, scientists, legislators, public health experts to get to the bottom of what really happened in the Wuhan lab and hold those responsible accountable, whether they be in China, whether they be here in the United States, for their part in creating and spreading this virus. Last year, Republicans called for an investigation into the culpability of the Wuhan lab in the origins of COVID-19. Unfortunately, House Democrats quickly swept any notion of Chinese culpability under the rug, and big tech companies like Facebook prevented users from hypothesizing about gain-of-function research and genetic sequencing of this virus. I won't go into the genetic issues about this because all our eyes would glaze over with this, but let's just say when you put the pieces of a puzzle together and they fit, they fit. The Trump administration opened an investigation into the Wuhan lab despite left-wing criticism, but the inquiry, inquiry, which we wonder why, was quickly canceled by the Biden administration. Again, why is the Biden administration being beholden to the Chinese Communist Party? A big question. Any delay of an open investigation into the origins of COVID-19 makes it more difficult for Americans to get the facts and easier for China to bury the truth. No one will ever accuse the Chinese Communist Party of being transparent. We know for a fact that the Chinese Party, Communist Party lied to the world in the early days of the pandemic. They must be held accountable not only by us, but by the entire world for the millions and millions of lives lost. When considering the facts behind the lab leak, let's look at the data. Medically speaking, the genetic fingerprint of the COVID-19 virus dispels any theory that the virus is naturally occurring. Scientists have found no evidence of a natural outbreak among bat populations, as was originally propagated by the Chinese lying Communist Party or any other natural occurring organisms. 
presence of a double GG sequence strain in the COVID-19 strain points to gain of function acceleration. Why Dr. Fauci is still dancing around this baffles all of our scientists. Recently, House Republicans on the SEC Select Subcommittee held a hearing to discuss the origins of COVID-19. Those doctors and scientists came forward to testify that all of the available medical information on the table was there so that Americans can learn how this pandemic started and they pointed exactly to gain of function and bioweapons research. Go on. Right now, to some tape playback, uh, President Biden, let's take a listen. NATO, and I tell you, the rest of the world is looking to see whether we can get something done. I'm not joking about that. The single biggest issue that we travel the world, all of you. The fact is that they're trying to figure out whether we're so divided that we can't get something done. And, uh, but uh, I'm convinced that uh, they're convinced now that we have an opportunity to make some real fundamental changes that generate growth in the future. You know, the days used to be that we were in a position where the United States invested more money in research and development three, four decades ago than any nation in the world. Now we're number eight. And it used to be that China was, uh, was number nine, and now they're number two. This is about a race for the 21st century. And you know, uh, and uh, what we're doing here is, in this race for the future, it's about connecting Americans, all Americans, rural and, and, and uh, urban, to a uh, high-speed internet, repairing our roads and our bridges so that we can, in fact, uh, no longer be ranked number uh, nine or ten in terms of infrastructure in America, back to what we used to be, we used to lead the world. We're going to electrify our school buses and our transit systems, and we're going to build national charging networks for electric vehicles, eliminate the nation's lead service pipes. We got 400,000 uh, home. I mean, there's just a whole lot we can do that's going to put a lot of people to work, and it's going to improve the life of a lot of people. We're going to update our power grid, which, as you saw, what happened in Texas last year. There's a lot we can do. It's going to generate. Alana, your outcome is going to be awful busy. Um, and, uh, we're ready. Um, and uh, we, we're going to, we have to win the comp. We really do. This is not hyperbole. We have to win the competition for the 21st century. That's really what's at stake, and I think you all know that. And that's what the bipartisan infrastructure does, in my view. I want to thank everyone here for supporting it. We're going to get into the details and, uh, among all of us about what we think about what needs to be improved and what could be made better or worse. Um, you know, so we want everybody to be engaged. So thank you all folks for being here. We're going to now get down to business. Thank you. <laughs> to the COVID question quickly. We follow the science. What's happening now is all the major scientific operations in this country and the 25-person group we put together are looking at all the possibilities of what's happening now. We have a pandemic among the non-vaccinated, those who are not vaccinated. If you are vaccinated, you are safe. If you are vaccinated, you have over a 98% chance of never catching the virus at all. But if you catch it, you're likely to be overwhelming proof so far is you're not going to be hospitalized, you're not going to be sick, you're going to probably have no signs that you had it, and you are not going to die. So it's a simple proposition. And what they're doing is they're going and they're investigating every aspect of any change that could or might take place. But the vaccines are good against all of the variants that are out there, including the Delta variant. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. President Biden making uh, some remarks there on the COVID-19 vaccine. He says the administration not liking seeing the lagging support there for vaccines. You're watching live now from Fox. Everyone, we are going to go to another event here. This time we go out to, uh, and then they go out to Chicago where we do have the Justice uh, Department. You got the Attorney General in Chicago there. This is a way to try to aim... Uh, 
uh, stopping the gun violence in major cities like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. So Attorney General Merrick Garland launching this gun trafficking strike force. And we are going to listen to a little bit of this playback right now. And uh, most times, let me say high percentages, it's spot on. Yes, sir. Um, and so, then, so one, one, th one thing I think to keep in mind is my fellow mayors, shot spotters obviously out there trying to hawk uh, their right. services. Right. That's why and I get calls all the time saying, hey, the shots better work. It works if you've got a camera system. Yeah. If you don't have a camera system, it, it's not nearly as effective. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You've got to have the camera system to be able to really zoom in and give the officers that are then responding uh, the guidance. Without the, the two uh, working hand and glove, I don't think it's that, that effective. And uh, finally, the one other set that you see, we have an inbox that every SDC room manages, and that's how we get information with partners. Uh, sometimes we get information from our community partners that they send, like just uh, alerts or uh, information that they have received. And then we try to put that together in slide forms uh, and then present it in roll calls. Because again, the beat cars, which are on the field, are the ones that need to get this information because that's their beat. That's who they're going to be constantly uh, monitoring those and patrolling those areas. Uh, which I'll pass over to our analyst, and he'll give you an example of how this mapping works. All right, sir. Um, gentlemen, thank you, everybody. Um, so real quick, I'm going to talk a little bit about the success stories that occurs here at the SDSC. So because we have all this technology fused together, we like to try to synthesize everything. Um, for example, in this particular case, this was back in October. I know it's a little bit dated. But the SDSC was instrumental in actually getting the cars at the proper location as soon as the, as soon as the shot spotter went off. And then they were able to direct, due to the cameras, specifically where the shooters were at this location and at this location so that they, we had successful arrests. Particularly in this one right here, uh, the shot spotter went off at 234 South Independence. After the vehicle pulled up in the area, the SDSC was able to uh, direct our units to go to that particular location. Um, now, as far as the analytical portion of what goes on here on a day-to-day -day basis, I like to provide my commander with tactical level intelligence. A lot of the stuff that I provide on a daily basis, we do keep track of the shootings that occur within our district. A lot of it, we try to link whether it's going to be narcotic related, it's also going to be gang related or whatever the cause may be. Sometimes it's just a simple altercation that causes an actual shooting. But what I like to do is I like to highlight certain areas where I know with very high confidence that there will be a shooting, whether it's going to be because of retaliation or because of the shot spotters that continuously keep occurring within that general area, there is a high probability that a shooting would occur within the next 24 to 36 hours. So I like to provide that with him with a little bit of an explanation why he's moving his resources to that particular uh, area for a more uh, a better focus, so to speak. Uh, I also do the anniversaries, like Officer Cortez uh, explained here. These tend to cause mass gatherings. Uh, in particular, some of them go back as far as hey, 2014. Hey, before you keep going, uh, yes, sir. just for the media, this is sensitive information. Some are juveniles, some are gang affiliations. We don't so, want so no, so no publicly reported, okay? okay? So just repeat the information if, if you don't mind. All right, thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, for the month, we just keep track of all the homicides. We do know that there's gatherings, and a lot of shootings do occur because of these. So we like to keep track of them, and I also like to give uh, where there's going to be a very high likelihood. All right, so that was the update there. Attorney General Merrick Garland in Chicago focusing on gun trafficking, uh, not only in Chicago, but other major cities as well, like New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and, of course, D.C. There, as we see week and week out, uh, major major problems with gun violence. You're watching live now from Fox, always here with you. Uh, on that side, we just truly don't understand what she's hiding. You know, as physicians, we all stand and we stand trained to look at evidence when we diagnose a problem and we draw fact-based conclusions. We're all in a unique position, actually, to dissect the origins of this pandemic so that we can prevent further health crises. 
It's obvious. It is obvious for anyone in the medical field that the genetic evidence at this point in time shows that this is a gain of function res result from a gain of function and possibly in part of Chinese bioweapons research. As we all know, the, there is clear and categorical evidence that leads us to believe that the COVID-19 virus started in the Wuhan lab. Despite what was pushed by the media, the evidence is overwhelming that this is what happened. It is up to doctors, scientists, legislators, public health experts to get to the bottom of what really happened in the Wuhan lab and hold those responsible accountable, whether they be in China, whether they be here in the United States, for their part in creating and spreading this virus. Last year, Republicans called for an investigation into the culpability of the Wuhan lab in the origins of COVID-19. Unfortunately, House Democrats quickly swept any notion of Chinese culpability under the rug, and big tech companies like Facebook prevented users from hypothesizing about gain-of-function research and genetic sequencing of this virus. I won't go into the genetic issues about this because all our eyes would glaze over with this, but let's just say when you put the pieces of a puzzle together and they fit, they fit. The Trump administration opened an investigation into the Wuhan lab, despite left-wing criticism. But the inquiry, inquiry, which we wonder why, was quickly canceled by the Biden administration. Again, why is the Biden administration being beholden to the Chinese Communist Party? A big question. Any delay of an open investigation into the origins of COVID-19 makes it more uh, difficult for Americans to get the facts and easier for China to bury the truth. No one will ever accuse the Chinese Communist Party of being transparent. We know for a fact that the Chinese Party, Communist Party lied to the world in the early days of the pandemic. They must be held accountable, not only by us, but by the entire world for the millions and millions of lives lost. When considering the facts behind the lab leak, let's look at the data. Medically speaking, the genetic fingerprint of the COVID-19 virus dispels any theory that the virus is naturally occurring. Scientists have found no evidence of a natural outbreak among bat populations, as was originally propagated by the Chinese lying Communist Party or any other natural occurring organisms. Presence of a double GG sequence strain in the COVID-19 strain points to gain of function acceleration. Why Dr. Fauci is still dancing around this baffles all of our scientists. Recently, House Republicans on the Sec Select Subcommittee held a hearing to discuss the co origins of COVID-19. Those doctors and scientists came forward to testify that all of the available medical information on the table was there so that Americans can learn how this pandemic started and they pointed exactly to gain of function and bioweapons research in the Chinese lab. We have an obligation of physicians, lawmakers, and Americans to demand accountability and transparency on behalf of the millions of families, not only in the U.S., but across the world who have suffered an unimaginable loss because of the COVID-19 virus. Thank you for being here. I yield back now to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Michael Burgess. Thank you, and thanks everyone for being here this morning. I'm not gonna add any more to the lengthy comments we've already heard but uh, we're happy to take your questions. Yes. Oh, oh, we do have Dr. Marshall. All right. I beg your pardon. We always have to wait on the Senate. <laughs> thanks, 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 Mike. Yeah, we have anesthesia here. We're well ahead of us as well. But it, it is a great honor to stand here with the Doc Caucus. And as I look around, it's interesting. Every one of us have had a full career in medicine. And I think back to an oath that every one of us took above all to do no harm. And Whip Scalise, honorary Doc Caucus member. We're glad. You slept at a Holiday Inn Express. You slept at a Holiday Inn Express as well. We're glad that you're here, and I'd make a motion we make Steve an honorary member of the Doc Caucus. <laughs> All right. Uh, you need, we'll, so, we'll send us unanimous consent here. You know, as we all know, the Delta variant is making its way across America. And the way I look at it is if you haven't had the vaccine yet, this is a great opportunity for you to talk to your doctor about the pros and cons and the risk and benefits of taking the vaccine. On the other hand, I think we can all take a deep breath, a sigh of relief that the science shows us there's no reason to panic over the Delta variant. Here's the good news. Within two weeks, 
Two-thirds of all American adults will have had both vaccinations. 90% of seniors will have had both vaccinations. And the people that are left that haven't had the vaccination, we probably think half of those have natural immunity. And I would also add, by the way, that the, for our children, probably 40% or more uh, have had the vaccination as well. I want to reassure America that either natural immunity, having had the virus, or vaccination provide exceptional defense against the Delta variant, and all variants as far as we know. In fact, they probably prevent over 95% of hospitalizations due to the Delta variant. And I think that's what's important to be following right now is the number of hospitalizations and deaths from the Delta variant, not necessarily just the number of people that are carrying, colonizing the virus right now. Look, the science has not changed, and the clinical picture of America looks better every day. This is not the time to close down schools. It's not the time to close down our economy or insist on mask mandates. This is the time to believe in the science, to work with the science, that our vaccines and natural immunity, that they actually work, that you should have confidence in them, that we don't need masks if you've had the vaccine or if you have natural immunity. We don't need to shut things down. That is not the thing that we should do. Look, as far as I know, not one child under the age of 18 has died from COVID unless they had some type of a, of a serious health condition as well. On the other hand, we know that mask and closing schools without doubt is a cause of psychological and academic harm to our children. I believe and entrust our local school boards to make the right decision, not ordered by decree of politicians and bureaucrats here in Washington, D.C. Listen, this is not the time to panic. It's not the time for fear-mongering either. That doesn't do anybody any good. Science is not on the side of the fear-mongers. Here's the bottom line. If you haven't had the vaccine or if you haven't tested positive for the virus, go to your doctor, ask him for the antibody test, and then you and your doctor should decide the pros and cons, the risk and benefits, and if you want the vaccine. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you, had, you all came out today, and we will try to answer some of your questions. I think this gentleman here was going to be first. Yep. I was just going to ask, um, although, you know, the infection rates overall are not going up much higher, the Indian pocket of this country with a very large amount of unvaccinated people, and many of them in very conservative parts of this country, hospitals are filling up fast right now. And I'm curious why yep. you guys chose to make the emphasis yeah, of this press conference about the lab leak and not about stopping um, what is a, a resurgent virus right now. I, I, you must not have been listening. I opened, I opened the conference. You mentioned I opened the, I opened the doctor's part of this conference talking about the variant and vaccines, talking about the support of the vaccine by the doctor's caucus, by the realistic approach to the variant that I think Dr. Marshall has talked about. So I'm not sure the point of your question. We did not. <laughs> Uh, choose not to discuss the variants in the vaccine. Yes, sir. Uh, a quick question. Have you met with Dr. Moon and the Chinese whistleblowers who are very clear that it was a well-planned uh, sort of act of war? Uh, right. And that great use of a Christian doctor escaped from China. So uh, I, I can't speak for anyone else. I actually have. You have. Uh, and all I can tell you is that the reason why we have to look so carefully at the origin of this virus is because this might not be the last virus that comes out of China. So we, again, in the short term, we make sure, as we have all said, if you're at high risk, if you're at risk for this disease, talk to your physician, get the vaccine. But as a country, we have to investigate the origin very, very carefully, very, very accurately, because this might not be the last virus that comes out of China. Yes, ma'am. Uh, last week, the Blue Dog Coalition sent a letter that calling for a bipartisan investigation. So have you had any conversations with Democrats on this and working together on this? Yeah, ab absolutely. So on the Senate side, we passed a unanimous resolution led by Senator Gillibrand and myself calling on the World Health Organization to do their job and investigate it. And then the Health Committee has actually started a bipartisan investigation. And I did get a commitment from Diana to get the chairwoman of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee in Energy and Commerce a couple of weeks ago that they would hold a hearing on this. It has yet to materialize, but I'll, I'll take them at their word. And it was a good faith offer made. And uh, we, but we have to keep pushing. We, we can't 
there, it, it is not going to spring uh, voluntarily, apparently. And, I, and that is... They're still working, and I think the White House and, uh, and uh, Senator Portman and him were working on a couple of things, and he was representing that. And, you know, the letter, I understand the letter's been signed by Levin. So if they can get to a point, and we'll go from there. And that's what was asked about, you know, can you do that and present something? Our April meeting, it was brought up that they were asking for an investigation, the Science and Technology Committee, and we've yet to see anything come forward. So you can ask the Democrats why they don't want an investigation, but the net result is we don't have an investigation. We had a hearing several weeks ago. Not one Democrat participated in that hearing. And as you've already heard, this is not just an American issue. This is a world issue. It is not a partisan issue. Everybody should be interested because there are serious ramifications if this was a lab leak, either accidental or intentional. I, I would say not at all. Look, look, we, we believe in health privacy. The bottom line is we believe it. It doesn't stop at the COVID door. Uh, it's every citizen's right to choose to get a vaccine and then to choose not to reveal whether they've gotten a vaccine, just like it's your right not to reveal what medications you're on or what diagnoses you have. And look at what we've done. Two public service announcements that we have done. We have sent letters and to both uh, the head of uh, NIH uh, to the FDA, talking about vaccine, the separation of the vaccine, talking about using real-world evidence to go from emergency youth authorization to full authorization. I personally have given vaccines in all 24 counties in my district, and I think all of us have given vaccines. I spoke on the floor yesterday again about giving the vaccine and vaccine hesitancy. So I think we as members have been very vocal. Yeah, I was just going to uh, chime in and say I think that you as a press have a responsibility to ask questions of the Democrats as well. How many of the Democrats are willing to say whether or not they've been vaccinated? And what about the Texas delegation from the, from the Texas House that came here? Well, they've said that, it's including the, the, the six that tested positive. Do we have any evidence of that? I highly doubt that those six people were all vaccinated and tested positive for this virus. So you guys need to hold their feet to the fire. Well, I'm just telling you, they were up here, they've already, the they've, they stood right here and gave a brief and they've spread it to the speaker's office, they've spread it to the White House, and there's literally nothing coming from the mainstream media about that, and it's very hypocritical. Do Republicans have responsibility to their voters compared to the Democrats? Yeah, we all do. We all do. And look, down in my part of the world, it's probably the heart of Trump country. Where's the best place to open a vaccine hub? A NASCAR racetrack. <laughs> and we did, and it ran for months. And the vaccination rate was incredible. Now the hard part is getting that last mile of, of, of people who need vaccinations. And there are a variety of reasons why people haven't been vaccinated. And I think every one of us as a doctor's caucus would suggest to the administration, if they would listen, that it's now time to go to single dose vials administered in a doctor's office. You trust your doctor, talk to your doctor. You and your doctor come to the come to the conclusion you need a vaccine. It can be administered there and then. Let's go over here, uh, sir. Senator, and the rest of the doctors, fully accepting the premise that the, the, the virus emerged in China and the Chinese government has been completely opaque about it. These vaccines are American made by American companies, developed by American researchers with Western partners. Why shouldn't it be the patriotic duty of Americans to get this American vaccine and help the country? A vaccine is a medicine, right? A vaccine is a medicine. Just like with any other medicine, there are side effects. And this is a personal decision. This is not a mandate. This should not come down from the government saying you have to have something because there can be some side effects. Yes, we want people vaccinated. There's not one physician, there's not one doctor here that doesn't want people vaccinated. And I'll take umbrage at the fact that you guys are liking to point to people who are conservatives not getting this. I still practice medicine. And I have a doctor-patient relationship with one of those, which a government official knocking on your door is violating HIPAA. Is violating HIPAA by asking about vaccination status. And I will tell you, the patients that I see come from every race, every demographic, who have not been vaccinated. And that is their choice. That is their choice. So to point out and to say it's just not conservatives, it's not only disingenuous, it's a lie. But yes, it is our patriotic duty to care for other people 
but it is also our patriotic duty to understand that we have individual rights in this country, and when it comes to medicine, that is a doctor-patient decision. Can I follow up on the door-to-door -door because it's gotten so much attention and gotten so much blowback. The government goes door-to-door -to, -door to deliver the mail, to take the census, to do all sorts of things. Why is it wrong to go and encourage people to get this vaccine? Because it's a doctor-patient relationship when you're talking about medicine. It's not when you're delivering a piece of paper with a stamp. It's a doctor-patient relationship. That's why the house doctor, who is not my doctor, has no ability to ask whether I've been vaccinated or not. He does not have that relationship, which is a valued and precious relationship in this country. Yes. There's reporting this morning that the Biden administration is considering encouraging mask, mask wearing uh, for vaccinated individuals and unvaccinated individuals again nationwide in order to help curb the Delta variant. What's your reaction to that? And also on Capitol Hill, do you think that masking would help prevent the spread of the Delta variant? Please convey to the president that's not a good idea. I'll be happy to speak to the Speaker of the House. Look, we, we, we've been down that road. What we do know now is, as Dr. Harris told us, uh, people who've had the vaccination are very unlikely to have clinically significant disease, even from the Delta variant. Uh, I think until there is data showing that that is no longer operational, w there should be no need to, to retrogress into a, a masked up Congress or a a messed up uh, state. We all need to make our own decisions. We all need to make our own decisions. And if you have in your community a prevalence and uh, you don't feel it safe to go to your grocery store without a mask, by all means wear a mask. And let me just make a, a plug here, wear a mask that works. Don't wear one of these damn cloth things that you all had on your faces. Get an N95 mask, they're now available. Get one that's made in America and make sure it's properly fitted and only use it for a short period of time and then discard it. Because what did we learn during the Ebola outbreaks? It was taking the masks on and putting them off that actually resulted in more transmissions. Yes. Um, so I have heard somewhat more emphasis from Republicans on the importance of getting a vaccine. I'm wondering what changed for people that it felt important to emphasize that now? We've been emphasizing it all along. I mean, the doc talks have been emphasizing all. Let's take one more question. So you've been at one yeah, ask for a while. Why did you wait so long? And have all the rest of you been vaccinated as well? Well, first of all, I had done the antibody test months ago and tested positive for the antibodies. And so clearly that gives you protection. Uh, but with the Delta variant, I felt I wanted that extra level of pre uh, protection. I've always been vocal, whether it was in the select subcommittee on coronavirus, uh, going back over a year ago where I talked about my confidence in the process of Operation Warp Speed, which President Trump initiated, and then improvements to the FDA. And look, there, there have been bipartisan legislation, go back to the 21st Century Cures Act, that did a number of things that laid the foundation for the FDA to be able to move forward in a quicker way on getting multiple vaccinations approved through their conditional use. And so I, I emphasize to people this wasn't rushed because I do think there's some people that wonder if it came out in less than a year, which is uh, a record in the history of the world. I think four years to get to go from new virus to vaccine was was pretty much the record to go in less than a year to get vaccinations. I do think it's important for us to let people know that process because thousands of people were tested and a new process by the FDA that we helped create with the 21st Century Cures Act, very bipartisan legislation, putting additional funding at NIH, uh, putting additional reforms in the FDA's process so it won't take 10 years to do what could take months. And so the FDA followed those new abilities uh, to bring safe drugs and effective drugs to the market quicker. And so all of that to say, uh, we've expressed confidence in the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. But again, as all of these doctors have talked about, ultimately, if anybody in America, I would encourage people to get the vaccine. I have high confidence in it. I got it myself, uh, I sent the pictures out. Uh, but also, if somebody has a, has a hesitation, they ought to have that conversation with their doctor. Yeah. And whatever that hesitation is, address it with their doctor and then ultimately make that decision because it's a medical decision. But we ought to have the facts out there. And part of the fact process just to let people know that a new process was used. And the FDA is still the gold standard in the world for approval of vaccines. Uh, I know they're, they're looking at trying to get a permanent approval by FDA, but in the meantime, uh, the fact that the FDA was able to use new tools to get this to the market quicker shows us we need to be using that process for other life-saving uh, vaccines, for cancer 
drugs for uh, ALS, Alzheimer's. That research is being done right now, and frankly, through Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, a lot of other legislation where Republicans and Democrats came together years ago to put new... All right, so we've been listening to uh, House GOP members talk about uh, the origins of the coronavirus uh, and as Delta variant cases rise across the country, they are pleading with Democrats to begin a House Select Committee in order to uh, probe the origins of COVID-19 to investigate uh, these kind of competing theories at the moment about how uh, this could have started and how it got out of China. Uh, in the meantime, as you know, uh, the opening of the Olympics uh, are tomorrow in Tokyo. We want to go out because we have uh, some really cool live pictures. This is in uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil at the moment. It looks like our shot just froze, but uh, they were uh, lighting uh, an Olympic torch there uh, in Rio. As you know, the uh, Summer Games of 2016 were in Brazil, in Rio there. Uh, that was the last time the Summer Olympic Games were held. Uh, and so this is kind of customary for the uh, previous host city of the Summer Olympics to do there. You can see this is right in the heart uh, of Rio. And as you know, the uh, summer games just have been, you know, mired uh, in, in controversy, dogged by uh, a rising number of cases, uh, especially in Japan. Tokyo still under uh, an emergency order by officials there. That's why there can't be any foreign spectators coming in to watch the games. Uh, obviously, athletes uh, and their teams and coaches are already there. They had to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, but we're now getting these live pictures out of Rio de Janeiro, uh, out of Brazil, as you know, that uh, that was the last host city back in 2016 for the Summer Games. And remind you uh, that uh, another virus uh, was raging out of control there in South America at that time. That was the Zika virus. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, was a matter of, of concern to many of the officials trying to put on the Summer Games. Uh, obviously, uh, the viruses are, are much different, but uh, similar worries about uh, a similar pandemic. And so you can see this uh, Olympic flame and Olympic torch there uh, in the heart of Rio. Kind of undulating there and revolving. Uh, this is a really cool scene. Uh, and this is, from what I'm told, somewhat customary for the previous host city to do uh, the night before the opening ceremonies of the current host city. Now, you'll know Tokyo uh, has gone to great lengths to put this on. The, the games were canceled last year. They're still keeping the branding Tokyo 2020, uh, even though obviously it's summer 2021. And unfortunately, even here with Team USA, we have heard of a number of athletes who have tested positive basically uh, kind of ruining their chances to compete and participate in these games, one of which was uh, the really great young American tennis player, Coco Goff. Uh, there's some, been some members of the gymnastics team as well. Not Simone Biles, though. She is healthy, well, and safe, and so she'll be competing in Tokyo. We just wanted to take the moment, though, to show you uh, this really, really cool scene uh, in Rio at the moment there.
And at the moment, we do have these two live looks, the upper left in Rio de Janeiro there in Brazil. Uh, on the bottom right, that is uh, in Tokyo, Japan at the moment. Uh, many athletes obviously are already there for the start of the games uh, tomorrow. They had to quarantine for two days, or excuse me, two weeks rather, uh, before they could you know, come out of their hotels and, and compete uh, with other teams from around the world. Uh, and so uh, the Olympics are always so exciting. Obviously, we've been saying this for well over the last six months that they're going to be looking very, very different this year. Uh, they were canceled last year. Many uh, residents of Tokyo and, and Japanese citizens alike uh, have been taking to the streets recently saying they do not think the Tokyo Olympics should go on. Obviously, it's a little too late for that at that moment, but there's been an increasing uh, tension and discord amongst Japanese citizens about, you know, why exactly uh, the games should go forward. But they are. The opening ceremony is tomorrow. And uh, here in the United States, obviously, we'll be rooting on for Team USA in a number of different sports and competitions. Uh, but in the upper left, uh, we just got these live pictures. This is in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And you'll remember that that's where the summer games were held four years ago in 2016. Well, five years ago now. Uh, and I was kind of reminiscing there uh, because there was another concern about a virus, about a pandemic, and that was the Zika virus at the time. Obviously, I don't want to compare it to the coronavirus. They're very, very different, and they've had quite disparate impacts. Uh, but you can see this is, um, from what I understand, customary. Uh, that the former host city kind of uh, has some type of ceremony and lights a torch, an Olympic flame. Uh, and so you can see some people gathered around there in downtown Rio de Janeiro at the moment. And then, of course, in the lower right hand of your screen there, Tokyo 2020. We've been following all the latest. Oh, and there's the flame right there. You can see officials from the Olympic Committee in Brazil walking to light the flame. But we have been reporting as well that, as you know now, First Lady Jill Biden will lead the U.S. delegation in Tokyo. She made a stopover visit in Alaska uh, yesterday on her way there. And so that is the highest ranking U.S. official that will be present in Tokyo for the Games. Uh, we're going to take this full right now. We're just going to watch this uh, kind of all unfold here. They have the Olympic flame burning bright on this Thursday night in Rio de Janeiro. Let's just kind of watch and listen in.
dizer poucas palavras aqui. Primeiro, pedir uma salva de palma a esses dois jovens que acenderam o fogo ali. Chamar aqui o presidente da Câmara, a nossa presidente. So we just wanted to show you, it looks like uh, Brazilian Olympic officials uh, with kind of their Japanese counterpart there lighting the flame in this square in downtown Rio de Janeiro there. Uh, and this is all ahead of uh, the start of the Tokyo Games. The opening ceremony will be tomorrow. We have uh, a live shot as well just outside the stadium where all the main events will take place. That's where the opening ceremony will take place uh, as well. And it is actually happening. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic canceled the games last year. They're going forward, forward this year. Um, the last time Tokyo held the Olympic Games was back in 1964. Uh, and before that, uh, they were originally scheduled for 1940. That year they were canceled at the height of World War II. And so now Tokyo has the games yet again, uh, some 70 years later. And so. Uh, it's going to be very, very exciting, yet uh, different, very different from years previous. And so hopefully we'll be uh, kind of monitoring uh, the medal count uh, from Team USA uh, as they kick off tomorrow. They last till August 8th. And so we wish Team USA the best of luck. We'll have uh, continuing coverage of that if we can. And we get some of these shots uh, from around Tokyo. Anyway, I'm Andrew Kraft. Thank you for being with us on your Thursday afternoon. We have a little bit more left to get to in this hour. We're going to be transitioning into some political news on Capitol Hill after the two minute commercial break. We'll see you then. Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. You're taking a live look at the U.S. Capitol building. Uh, at the moment, we want to transition into some news on Capitol Hill uh, for uh, the remainder of this hour because a select House committee will push forward to investigate the Capitol attack on January the 6th, even as Republican leader McCarthy says he will not nominate any more members from his party to serve on the panel. Fox News correspondent Lauren Blanchard has more on this story from Washington. Leader Kevin McCarthy says he's pulling all five of his nominations to serve on a select committee that will look into how the January 6th attack on the Capitol happened and how to prevent another insurrection attempt. This after Speaker Nancy Pelosi rejected two of his nominations. There's no way that they're going to be on the committee. Has what Speaker Pelosi done ever happened before? The idea that she's going to pick and choose, you're not going to get an outcome. She denied Republicans Jim Jordan and Jim Banks. With respect for the integrity 
of the investigation with concern that, to, that the American people want to know the truth. I could not appoint them. I said that while this may be unprecedented, so was an attack on the Capitol. The first hearing for the committee will take place on Tuesday morning, with or without new nominations from McCarthy. The minority leader says Republicans may hold their own investigation, but Republicans can't call committees as the minority party in the House. Senate Republicans have already rejected establishing a 9-11 style commission on the insurrection. Nancy Pelosi shouldn't be picking the Republican members of a commission uh, if, if that commission is truly independent. Representative Liz Cheney is currently the sole GOP member on the committee appointed by Speaker Pelosi. The only other Republican representative who voted in favor of creating the panel is Adam Kinzinger. There, there are some members who would like to be on it, but we'll see. For the first hearing, the panel will focus on law enforcement with testimony from four police witnesses. In Washington, Lauren Blanchard, Fox News. Lauren, thanks so much for that update there. Uh, like she said, it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, the first hearing uh, of the committee will be uh, next Tuesday, and so they'll be focusing on law enforcement. Uh, members of the Capitol Police Force will be testifying as well, and so it might not have any Republicans uh, that are picked by uh, House Minority Leader McCarthy on the panel for that first hearing. As Lauren said there, you'll remember that uh, Nancy Pelosi tapped uh, Representative Liz Cheney, a Republican, uh, to be uh, on the committee. So it will have some Republican voice, uh, but just one. And so right now we want to play out for you kind of a, a majority of these remarks from both McCarthy and Pelosi earlier today talking about this drama all unfolding on Capitol Hill. Here is House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. to get a sense of their major concerns and what's happening in their day-to-day -day lives and how we can make it better. Over the past week, I set out just to do that. Because Democrats' reckless spending has led to inflation, I've asked American people to send me their stories about the soaring inflation, but how does it personally affect them and their families? The stories that I heard are just devastating. There's a few here I'd like to bring up. First, Chuck from Arkansas. He writes, I'm on a fixed income. I'm retired from the state police and the National Guard. My everyday expenses are up. My small amount of money is worth less. For example, I just bought gas for my truck. Last year it cost $35 to fill up. This time it cost 92 How many of us across America have actually felt that as they fill their cars up. Katrina from Idaho, gas is $3.78 a gallon. Milk is almost $3 a gallon. We have cut spending at the grocery store a bunch since prices have gone up. No extra outings are eating out. Home improvements are on hold till prices come down. Mike, a lead pastor at the church, my wife and I can't do as much as we used to do for others. So we're not liking it. So we just want to uh, break in here for just a moment. We'll come back to uh, Minority Leader McCarthy's comments from earlier this morning out of Washington. We want to go out to Miami at the moment because we're getting news and these recent live pictures uh, of a stage collapse at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami, Florida. You can see right there that... Uh, that was part of the stage, and it is completely kind of folded in on itself. We're learning that uh, this was all set up for the Rolling Loud Music Festival. That festival set to kick off just tomorrow. Uh, we apologize there. It looks like our shot is a little spotty. we working to get it back. Maybe the connection's not too great, but you can see there concert organizers, contractors who have set this up are kind of milling about, circling the uh, collapse stage itself, trying to figure out how this might have happened. Uh, the Rolling Loud Music Festival is uh, one of the biggest festivals uh, that happens in the state of Florida. Apparently it's the largest hip hop festival in the world. That's what the festival organizers bill it as. Acts like Kanye West, Travis Scott and the like are set to perform there uh, tomorrow. We are learning, though, that no injuries have been reported. 
And so uh, I guess what everyone's kind of thinking is, thank God this did not happen tomorrow. Uh, this is the day before the music festival was set to kick off. And this is at Hard Rock Stadium. Uh, that's where the pro football Miami Dolphins team plays when they are in season. Uh, so right now it's unclear what caused part of the structure to come down. We don't know of any potential reasons or if, you know, possible, you know, windy weather or a structural issue. And so you can see there the rest of the festival set up, that very, very large tent there, but not good news for organizers of what is billed as the world's largest hip hop festival having to contend with the day before it kicks off. And so you can see though, it's just a partial stage collapse. Looks like the main stage there to the right, still standing. Uh, no doubt they uh, must be concerned about the structural integrity of, of that stage, the main stage right there. And so uh, this is quite something. We're getting reports that uh, Miami-Dade fire rescue officials said they did not receive a call about the incident. That's most likely why you don't really see any uh, you know, police on the scene responding. Crews have worked for over a week, though, setting up multiple stages for this festival. It's a three-day event. Uh, many popular rap artists are, are set to, to take that stage including, you know, ASAP Rocky, Post Malone, Travis, Travis Scott, uh, Kanye West. And so it kind of remains to be seen, you know, how this will affect the festival going forward, if it will happen on time, if there will be delays or ticket refunds. We, we don't know anything of that just yet. This is just coming to us, these live pictures. Very, very unfortunate though, uh, you know, big crowds are back, music festivals are back this summer, and uh, this is just a, a really terrible setback for, for this one in particular. Thankfully though, no one was injured, we're not getting any reports of injuries at the moment, uh, just organizers are probably trying to just determine, you know, how this might have happened. And so at the moment, uh, it looks like the shot is still a little spotty, but, um, and it looks like our chopper there is flying away. But uh, if we do get any more information on what might have caused that partial stage collapse there, or if it will affect uh, the Rolling Loud Festival kind of going forward into the weekend, we'll bring you some of those updates uh, if we get them. Thanks for being with us on your Thursday afternoon. We want to go back, though. Uh, to listen to uh, a major, major Capitol Hill story, political story at the moment. Uh, what is going to be happening, uh, excuse me, with uh, the Capitol Riot Committee, the House Select Committee, the first hearing is set to be held January, or excuse me, July the 27th, that's next Tuesday. Uh, right now, House uh, Minority Leader McCarthy uh, was speaking a little bit earlier on why he pulled those five members after Speaker Pelosi rejected just two of them. Let's listen in back to McCarthy. to get a sense of their major concerns and what's happening in their day-to-day -day lives and how we can make it better. Over the past week, I set out just to do that. Because Democrats' reckless spending has led to inflation, I've asked American people to send me their stories about the soaring inflation, but how does it personally affect them and their families? The stories that I heard are just devastating. There's a few here I'd like to bring up. First, Chuck from Arkansas. He writes, I'm on a fixed income. I'm retired from the state police and the National Guard. My everyday expenses are up. My small amount of money is worth less. For example, I just bought gas for my truck. Last year it cost $35 to fill up. This time it cost 92. How many of us across America have actually felt that as they fill their cars up. Katrina from Idaho, gas is $3.78 a gallon. Milk is almost $3 a gallon. We have cut spending at the grocery store a bunch since prices have gone up. No extra outings are eating out. Home improvements, 
are on hold till prices come down. Mike, a lead pastor at the church, my wife and I can't do as much as we used to do for others. So we're not liking that. We're on a fixed income and working on building a church congregation from scratch. We are seeing many who are going without food, medication, etc. So we're taking food to them to hopefully make their lives easier. Inflation is destroying America's ability to strengthen their financial security. As I watched a clip from the president's town hall last night, I couldn't see a person more out of touch. A small business owner struggled to survive through the pandemic. He's got government now competing with him, paying higher unemployment an extra $15 an hour where he can't bring people back to work. And what's the president's answer? Just pay more. I wish the president understood what it was like to own a small business. For all the small business owners, they're the first to work, last to leave, and last to be paid. What they just went through in the pandemic, so many of them did not make it. They shut down and they, all their investment is gone. They're trying to survive today, and that's the response they get. Price is going up. Now, this is not just Republicans sounding the alarm on inflation. Larry Summers, who served as Treasury Secretary for President Clinton and Chief Economic Advisor for Obama, Biden administration, has been warning since February that Biden's big spending agenda would lead to inflation. Unfortunately, Larry was right. And last week, Biden's own Treasury Secretary, Janet, acknowledged that Americans have to brace for several more months of rapid inflation. So it's just not the three stories we told. It's not hope we can tell them. The White House tells them, the Treasury Secretary, prepare for more. Eat less. Drive less. This week, the President, in his choice words, that prices are now up. And what has he proposed? More spending. Not working together. Not finding that you can put an infrastructure bill together to build more roads for less, but it has to have Bernie Sanders' approach of three trillion and a half dollars. If the president won't listen to us, the president won't listen to his own economic advisors back when he was vice president, I don't know who he'll listen to. But America deserves more. Republicans will continue to work to bring inflation down, secure our borders, and stop crime in the streets. Because unfortunately, since Democrats have taken the majority, we took the majority in the House, the first thing they did was defund the police. I watch in my own home state, people just walk into stores and walk out without paying. I watch stores, big name brands like Target, just have to close down because they can't survive in a big city like San Francisco. We watch crime continue to rise where we see young kids walking the streets of New York being tackled as one person's running from another being shot. Or in a Chicago where they defunded the police. Or a man and woman are pulled from their car and shot on the street dead. We watch a border wide open with the new policies of this administration. Where fentanyl has increased by more than 300%. That goes to every single city in America and adds to the deaths of our youth and others. It is time to stop that, to make sure the next century for America could be theirs. With that, let's open it up for questions. You know we wrote your question down. Should I answer it before you ask it? But go ahead. Um, in your view, what is so wrong with having uh, Liz Cheney and potentially Adam Kinzinger serve on the select committee, potentially they could provide some level of ideological balance to this committee. What is wrong with having one or two members of the conference join with Democrats to investigate Look, what happened here? You, you know it, and we predicted it back at the very beginning. This is a sham committee that's just politically driven by Speaker Pelosi. When we proposed to do a commission back in January, she said no. She just wanted to make it political. When we responded back to her, she waited 10 weeks to say anything else. I don't think anybody in America, I think even your viewers understand what a sham this committee is and how politically driven. For her to pick and choose who can serve on, to say that the ranking member of judiciary, 
who uh, would have jurisdiction cannot serve. When she decides that Jim Banks, who served his nation in the Navy in Afghanistan, that he can't serve here. When she selects a chair of the committee that believes Republican senators are equal to terrorists, just dropped a lawsuit against the president and objected to the electors when it came to the election of George Bush, I think even you would understand that. Would yes, sir. Punish them in any way? Yes, sir. Can we talk about infrastructure for a second? I mean, how do you view the Senate's bipartisan infrastructure bill? Have you been briefed on the details? By you know, they continue to move. I haven't seen all the details. I would say, first of all, I'd like the idea of people working together and having an infrastructure bill. I think if there's one thing we should be able to do is infrastructure. Um, I laid out to the president what I thought a bipartisan infrastructure bill would look like. The first thing you'd have to do is agree on what, it, what infrastructure means. Roads, bridges, highways, broadband, and uh, airports. I think we would then look at the need of the nation. We'd want to make sure we could make some reforms with NEPA and others so you, you wouldn't wait a decade to build these so your money would go further. Um, and I think we could find compromise there. The most difficult part is at that moment in time when they did get an agreement. The president said there was an agreement, but in the same day he said, no, I still need the other three trillion. You just listen to the stories. Since this new administration and Democratic majority, they proposed a bill with a nice title, but it has nothing to do with it. We watched what they did back at the beginning of the year when they called it a COVID bill with less than 9% going to it, but now we have inflation. Um, I would like the idea of a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, no, they, 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 they don't, they don't have, they don't, even they tell you they can't vote on it yet because they don't have one. I think it matters in the details. I think a trillion dollars is a lot of money, so I'd like to see the details. But in the concept of a structure of putting one together, I'd like to do that. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, as far uh, as a, about two weeks ago, you said that, I don't know if this would work, and then you'd go get the committee assignments from the speaker and expect for them mm -hmm. to uh, have them for the conference as well. Where are you right now as far as... I'm right here. Look, our, our main focus is making sure that we stop the runaway inflation the Democrats have caused. The idea of securing our borders, of making sure the crime that is rising in California be, uh, throughout the entire nation because of defunding the police, uh, that we stop all that. I understand um, from a standpoint that others could have, be busy on other things. I think it's a conference decision. The conference will look at it. Yes, ma'am. I don't understand how I shifted my tone. I've been. Not your tone. I'm saying we've seen uh, more Republicans come out advocating for a vaccine. So I'm saying just generally in terms of your party, why the shift in tone? Well, I, I don't. I, I, I disagree with the nature because I don't think we shifted in our tone. I mean, the Republicans advocated for Operation Warp Speed, we funded it. We looked from it. When I sat back and I watched the then senator of California criticize and question whether they should get a vaccine as she was running for vice president. Or I watched the number of Democrats in the House go to the microphones and criticize for Operation Warp Speed and with the vaccines. Think about what we were able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. Where well, even Dr. Fauci said it was impossible to do that quickly. And the idea that we could have not one, but more, more than three vaccines out there. The investment we made, um, I think many times people will study that the number of lives we're able to save after this um, virus has come from a foreign land. Um, I think Republicans will go down from a perspective of looking forward and uh, saving a lot of lives. And I don't think we've changed from that position at all. Maybe, maybe at times through media, people are just now hearing it, but it wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that leadership. And the, pres the President Trump deserves a lot of credit for that. I, I know when President Biden... I I know he got the vaccine before he was sworn in, and somehow he thought he created it, but his own vice president criticized it, which was not good for the American public, which was real concerning to all of us that people would sit there and criticize something that could save a lot of lives. Mr. Leader. Mr. Leader. Yes. On vaccines again, there was a, a meeting or an event with uh, some GOP members earlier this morning advocating for their constituents to take the vaccine. Uh, 
Uh, should House members, Republican and Democrat, be putting out statements doing events to show that this isn't a partisan issue? Well, I, I think when um, members first got the vaccine, that's what they were doing and showing. I mean, I, I believe that's continuing to be going forward. More information should be provided because at this moment in time, I think anyone that wants a vaccine should be able to get it. But I, I think the aspect to it many times, if people have questions about it, let's answer the questions. Let's not say, oh, you can't put any information out. I think what would really have people have greater trust, provide all the science, provide all the information. Instead of trying to withhold something. That would bring something, somebody more doubt. And I think that's a wrong approach. And I think at times we hear that from the White House, and that's just wrong. Mr. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Um, we've seen you know, the Senate hold individual hearings on January 6th. But given that uh, what was supposed to be the authoritative investigation on it um, is now fractured, can you confidently say to the public that Americans are going to get a comprehensive and honest accounting of what happened that day? I, I would hope so. I, I, I thought... From what the speaker has done, that puts a great deal of doubt in it. I mean, at no time in the history of a select committee in America, and I, I checked with the historian, has what Speaker Pelosi done ever happened before. The idea that she's going to pick and choose, you're not going to get an outcome. I mean, she's picking and choosing, and she put a chairman on that objected to the election of George Bush. She put a chairman on this committee that just had to now pull back on his lawsuit against President Trump. And she questions having Jim Banks, a naval officer who served in Afghanistan, that somehow she predetermines. I mean, it doesn't matter today what she does with that committee, because it's not going to change the outcome of what it seems like a predetermined or already written report. And at the same time that she played politics with this for six months, the Senate acted. The FBI has investigated. And the architect of the Capitol has $10 million. What really comes down to is there are two questions. Why were we so ill-prepared? If you read the Senate report, you know every, they knew at December 14th. Why were we so ill-prepared? Second is, you got to make sure it never happens or has the ability to happen again. In that meantime, since that January, we have lost Officer Evans on Good Friday from a driven individual that could be politically motivated. I think everything should be looked at. Mr. Yes. I have that feeling Leader McConnell has said that in an interview that he thinks Democrats are going to need to go this alone, Republicans won't vote for it, and Democrats should hold it into their record. What's your position on the debt ceiling? How would you like to see the issues dealt with? And do you think Democrats should put it in reconciliation and vote for it themselves because Republicans don't? No, I think Democrats should put in reforms. The idea they, they want to do, you've got inflation caused by their spending. They have warning from their own Democrats, warning from their own economic advisors. If they go forward with this, they will get inflation. They went forward with it. They got inflation. Inflation is a tax on every single American. You just listen from the first story of a retired police officer and National Guard in Arkansas. That just last year he paid $35 to fill up his truck. Today it's 92 Or that mom who says they can't eat out anymore. This is the effects of their action. And what do they take from that? To propose to go spend another $3.5 trillion. I can't think of one Republican that wants to vote to allow them to do that. So they should think long and hard about what they propose to do and with the debt ceiling coming. And I think for all Americans, they should listen to America of the damage that they're causing. Not just in the crimes in the streets because they defunded police. Not just the, the drugs that are coming into America because they opened up the borders. And it's not just drugs. They are catching terrorists on the watch list. These, these, are not, these are not the senators on the other side that they believe are terrorists. These are actual terrorists from Yemen that are on the watch list that are coming across this border. There's inflation rising that we haven't seen in more than a decade.
That is a tax on every American. So when it comes to a debt ceiling, they should take it very serious, think it long and hard, and they ought to stop digging the hole that they are creating for America and change course. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. You about being prepared, what you said about being prepared. We need to engage directly. Okay, so there you just were hearing from uh, Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader. We're going to get to Speaker Pelosi's comments on the January 6th committee right now, but we want to go out to Chicago. Attorney General Merrick Garland speaking there on a recent effort by the Department of Justice on these uh, gun trafficking cities uh, and this, the effort to, to stem violence there. Uh, let's hear from the Attorney General right now. And we can't do um, uh, hope to solve this problem without some of both law enforcement as well as uh, community intervention, uh, community support, community trust uh, is what helps law enforcement. Law enforcement is help, what helps community trust. Um, happy to take some questions. General Garland, this is a bit of a homecoming for you. I wonder if you could address that. And I also wonder if any of your experience uh, prosecuting violent crimes and gang crimes in the 1990s in Washington informs this program and your broader strategy. Yeah, so, so yes, uh, this is coming home. Um, uh, I'm originally from Chicago and from the Chicago area. Um, my, I did have considerable experience um, um, in, in prosecuting violent gangs when I was uh, an assistant U.S. attorney. A lot of things have changed since then. Um, I think our focus now is both a combination of um, uh, tactics of um, building cases against gangs, but also of developing community support, uh, getting the trust of the community for that purpose. Also, the technology has changed and improved uh, dramatically with respect to our ability um, to make these cases. Um, Mr. Attorney General, yes. um, so the Chicago Police Department has a history, obviously, of uh, working with federal law enforcement over the years. There have been several pr um, programs which, in which CPDs work with ATF, DEA, FBI, et cetera, to tackle gang violence. How are the strike forces going to be different um, than those past efforts when those past efforts have come and gone? We still see such high numbers of shootings and homicides in Chicago. How is this federal effort going to be any different than the past federal efforts? We're building on the past. We're learning from the past. Um, this is a particular tactic, uh, this particular one, which is to work on networks of uh, gun trafficking, which are bringing the guns into the city and try to take those down in order to reduce the number of these illegal guns in the city. But this is only one part of a much bigger anti-violent crime initiative that we launched in May, which includes many of the elements of previous programs and an improvement and an expansion of the Project Safe Neighborhood program. This involves uh, coordination with the U.S. Attorney's Office, ATF, FBI, DEA, um, and the Marshal Service. We are going to try to focus as much of our attention on these problems, not only in Chicago, but in the rest of the country, which has also experienced similar problems. And we're going to try and mesh it up with uh, grants for communities to, as I said, to prevent violence, to interrupt violence, and to provide the kind of relationship between the police and the community necessary to build trust. Obviously, these cases are going to be looking at, obviously, this effort's going to be looking at, um, you know, um, criminal defense accused of gun running, accused of illegal transfer of firearms. Those are pretty difficult cases to bring to court on the state and federal levels. How is this, uh, how are the strike forces supposed to remedy that? Well, they're going to build the ne case necessary by putting in the kind of uh, resources that we have, the uh, new um, uh, statistical and uh, data collection that uh, ATF has is able now to trace guns all the way back and very quickly uh, from the time of the shooting all the way back to the original uh, illegal purchase. So we're, we have improved our ability to do that and we're going to be focusing our resources in that way. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, how does this initiative support the Biden administration's larger project of implementing and supporting gun control and gun control laws? Well. The gun sales we're talking about are illegal. These are not legal gun sales. They are illegal. Sometimes they're to straw purchasers. We heard uh, quite a bit uh, this morning about uh, the, the amount of uh, ghost gun sales, uh, which are uh, turning out to be a pretty significant portion of the guns used in gun crimes. Uh, as I'm sure you remember, we launched a regulatory initiative, the new rule, um, to restrict uh, ghost guns to make it clear that they are covered. Um, by the firearms laws and that they uh, have, will have serial numbers on it. So 
It's a part of the overall program. Um, there are many other parts of the program, uh, but this is certainly an important part of it. Mr. Attorney General, part of this is uh, targeting source cities, um, and in some cases, prosecutors have been hesitant to bring some cases, um, like lying on a federal firearms form, because it is, you know, a, a paper crime, so to speak. Can you speak to a little bit um, to uh, that approach that the department is taking in going after source cities in addition to the places where there is violent crime? And then secondarily, obviously, you issued a moratorium on federal executions. Um, but will you allow federal prosecutors to seek the death penalty, or do you, uh, or will you approve death penalty uh, submissions that come to your office? So these are two uh, quite distinct questions. I hope <laughs> you have that in mind. Um, as to the first question, there's going to be considerable cooperation. One thing I learned this morning and was very gratified to learn was that the uh, U.S. Attorney's offices in the target cities. Um, have now linked up with the uh, U.S. Attorney's offices in the SOAR cities uh, so that we can actually readily, readily, easily go back to those SOAR cities and make arrests where necessary. Um, it's unfortunate to call these paper crimes. People who lie in order to get illegal guns are feeding the gangs that are then using those guns to kill people in the, in, in the, in the um, uh, target cities. So we do not regard this as a minor matter. We regard this as a major matter. Um, you all know that we've, uh, on your second question, which I want to be clear is unrelated, um, uh, yes, it's correct. Uh, I've issued a moratorium on uh, the execution of a death penalty uh, pending uh, a, a process for evaluating um, what's been going on and, and, and the methods and, and the drugs, et cetera, being used. Um, I've said before that I have some pause myself about the death penalty. Um, based on the um, uh, small number uh, and therefore the relative arbitrariness of its application, uh, the problem of disparate impact on um, minority communities, um, and uh, the very real uh, uh, moral concern about uh, people being um, um, exonerated, um, which would indicate otherwise innocent people would, uh, would, would be uh, executed. So this is all under consideration. What would, you, what would you say to those who say that this latest effort is not terribly different than what past administrations have done, and that it doesn't really add new resources, and, and some would point to Operation Legend and, uh, and say, you know, that put boots on the ground. How would you counter that? What would be your, your argument? Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is this is just one piece of the overall package. This is a set of tactics uh, aimed at, the, at a particular kind of problem, the trafficking of illegal guns into these cities. It is part of our larger initiative, um, which includes Project Safe Neighborhoods, which was part of an early, a whole earlier program. We are wrapping that around with um, community uh, funding, with money for violence intervention, money for violence prevention. The President has authorized a substantial amount of money from the American Rescue Plan that can be used by the cities, including Chicago. Chicago is already planning to use it for hiring of police, um, community policing. Uh, for violence prevention, for violence intervention in the very place that, that we are today, um, uh, uh, one of the uh, premier violence interrupters um, who I met with in Washington uh, several weeks ago. So it is a wraparound program, and this is one part of it. We don't pretend this one part is going to uh, be the be all, all and end all, but it's the whole package uh, that we were hoping will reduce uh, uh, the risks here. I'm sorry. Sorry, no, um, sorry, I think you just uh, said a moment ago that the U.S. attorneys in the, the Target cities and large cities uh, have been linked up with source cities. Can you talk about which source cities the the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago has been linked up with, or which districts? Are yeah, I'll talk generally without uh, talking about specifics. Look, the sources here are from the Central District and Southern District of Illinois. They're from um, uh, Western District of Indiana, and they're from uh, I think the Eastern District of Wisconsin. Those are the I may have. Uh, Indiana, slightly wrong, but it is Indiana. Um, those are the sources uh, where the illegal guns are being sold, or being sold illegally, um, and uh, we're tracing them into Chicago. And so, so the U.S. Attorney's Office here is linked up with the U.S. They are communicating with their uh, uh, fellow U.S. attorneys in these districts, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank Very you. Much appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry to get in your face, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, so we just heard from uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland there taking questions uh, from reporters uh, in this room there. He met a little bit earlier with uh, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and this is all a part of the Justice Department's initiative and effort in five U.S. cities to reduce spiking gun violence uh, by addressing illegal gun trafficking uh, and prosecuting offenses that help put guns in the hands of criminals. So uh, you heard there from the Attorney General that uh, he grew up uh, in Chicago. He went to school in Chicago. He was uh, home, in, in his words. Uh, and this is just one of uh, many stops on this tour uh, on uh, raising awareness about what the DOJ is doing to implement these gun trafficking strike forces, not only in Chicago, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, San Francisco and New York uh, as well. So you heard there, he said the effort will include stepped up enforcement in so-called uh, supply areas. And these are cities and states where it's easier to obtain firearms that are later trafficked into other cities. So uh, this is a uh, kind of, uh, we heard, we've seen uh, from uh, Merrick Garland a little bit earlier today, he was touring the ATF's headquarters in Washington, DC. So that was just one of the stories we've been following. We also are kind of monitoring as well. This, uh, this story out of Miami at the moment. Uh, remember, we were bringing you uh, that from earlier, that, uh, that partial stage collapse in Miami, Florida. Thankfully, no injuries, but it was right ahead of a uh, major hip hop music festival uh, that's supposed to kick off tomorrow. So hopefully we'll have a little more details on exactly what happened there. But in the meantime, we're going to go to a quick two minute commercial break. When we come back, we're getting an update out of Detroit, Michigan. A township in the Detroit area is mandating that their local government employees have the vaccine. So that and more in two minutes. back here to live now from Fox. Uh, I'm Andrew Kraft. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, and like I said before the break, we want to move into uh, another story, this time about COVID-19 vaccines. I'm bringing in Fox 2's Hillary Golston uh, live for us in Detroit. Uh, Hillary, this is uh, really the one of the first cases we've seen of kind of a local entity uh, mandating vaccines for their employees. What did you learn? Yeah, it's a very interesting topic, obviously, because it's been a debate nationally to see what uh, municipalities and entities, organizations, what they're going to do. As far as we know, this is the first one in Michigan to make this move. And there's a lot of question, of course, about the legality and the question of freedom. Now, here's the irony also. There are three unions in Van Buren Township, and there are two men who lead the three unions, and both of them are vaccinated. So it's not necessarily about the individual question of vaccination, 
but much more about this question of freedom and keeping people on the job. We were out there earlier. Take a look. If you've been watching any kind of news, you know that the issue of mandatory vaccination has been controversial across the nation, but it's not shaping up to be a very adversarial issue in Van Buren Township. We are the trailblazer, simply meaning we are the first um, jurisdiction in the, in the state of Michigan to do this. There's a reason why the other 1,820 jurisdictions did not do it. It's not right. Government should, should not be intervening in this. As far as we can tell, that's true. Van Buren Township, one of the first municipalities in Michigan to require that all township employees get vaccinated against COVID-19. The Michigan Townships Association tells us they don't know of any others. There should be a freedom of choice, just like every other municipality in the state of Michigan. We have employees that provide public service and we should require them to get vaccinated. The decision coming from a recent township board meeting, the township supervisor says yes, the decision would require all employees to be vaccinated. The mandate takes effect August 16th, but pretty much all the other policy surrounding that decision is still up in the air. Like what happens to employees if they don't get vaccinated? That's still an open question. We're working with the unions right now to try and come up with some common ground. I don't know what that common ground is just yet. The board has not directed me to terminate employees at this time. And I will not terminate employees until the board directs me to do that. Ultimately, what do you want to do? I have to speak for the board, but I, personally, I would rather go back to the way uh, to the CDC and state guidelines. Besides freedom, the head of the Van Buren Township Police and Dispatchers Union says the issue is also about keeping critical police and fire employees on the job. His union filing a class action grievance against the township. It's hard enough to hire police officers right in A, which reduces our numbers as far as our membership. You reduce our numbers as far as membership, it used to be a time where you could just hire police officers. You can't do that anymore. And to make it absolutely clear, that mandatory vaccination date is still August 16th. That is the policy as of right now. But the township supervisor is working very closely with all the interested parties on this. And it's very possible that the board could reconsider. And uh, Hillary, just so interesting there, uh, talking to uh, officials from Van Buren Township. Uh, did you speak to any kind of residents of Van Buren Township? What are they saying? Uh, are they worried this will kind of trickle into the larger population? Yeah, well, we had a chance to talk to a few who were just passing us by actually wondering about it. And I don't think there is that concern because they do understand that there is definitely a separation between the public, obviously, and the municipality. People do choose to work, of course, for Van Buren Township or for any other company or county or city or township. So I think there is that understanding that it's impossible for the township to say that this could be a mandate, say, within the community. I think folks do understand that concept. And by the way, we should make it uh, known that Van Buren Township has no interest in trying to vaccinate this for every, or make this a mandate, the vaccination mandate, something that every citizen in that community would have to abide by. I, I think the, the legal bounds surrounding that uh, would be far out of bounds in this case. And, and Hillary, just last question for you, because, uh, you know, we, we've seen the cases uh, in, in Michigan at this point, and, and they've really remained steady. There hasn't been a very, very sharp increase. So I guess my other question is, you know, why now? Are they just worried about possibly, you know, like we've seen in the southern states, uh, you know, this could kind of spark some type of influx of cases in, you know, the Detroit suburbs? Yeah, well, I know you guys have done a great job of covering the Delta variant, which has been a big talking point right now. And there's concern and a forecast that the Delta variant could become dominant, not just in the United States, but here in Michigan. So I think this is a preemptive and preemptive measure uh, to make sure that they can protect their citizens. I think there's also a question of liability. If you have people who are um, going out, first responders, responding uh, and helping those who may be in a <coughs> medically precarious and vulnerable situation, they don't want to have any exposure risk or possibly take on that potential liability in that in that case. They also see it as a protective measure, a way to ensure that uh, they've done everything they can to make sure they're not pushing forward the spread of the disease. So uh, I think those are some of the concerns, some of the forecasts we have for the Delta variant becoming the dominant strain. And uh, the fact that we've also seen the vaccination numbers here in the state of Michigan 
be relatively stagnant, even though we have now a lottery to encourage people to get vaccinated. So I think this township is trying to be preemptive. Uh, the question is whether or not it will stand. As I mentioned right there at the end of the story, it's very possible that the board could decide to come back, have another discussion about this, maybe even take on some legal counsel and decide whether it really makes sense or it's a good idea. They still have to, of course, contend with the matter of that class action grievance, uh, which includes uh, not just that union, but anyone else who says, hey, I have been disadvantaged by this and it's unfair and a knock to my own freedoms as an American. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting uh, kind of case study uh, right now about this. Uh, Fox 2's Hillary Goldston live for us uh, in Detroit. Hillary, thanks for bringing us that story here on Live Now. Sure. Uh, we are going to stay in Michigan, though, for our next story, this having to do with uh, uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer uh, and the plot to kidnap her. Uh, and as you remember, uh, that happened, uh, well, it didn't happen, but the plot was un uh, revealed uh, and un unraveled last year. Well, anyway, an FBI agent who worked uh, the controversial investigation into the alleged plot to kill and kidnap Michigan's uh, governor was arrested earlier this week for assaulting his wife after the two went to a swingers party. Fox 2 in Detroit has this story. Tonight, disturbing new details involving the arrest of the lead federal investigator in the plot to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer. That same FBI agent has testified several times in court about the alleged scheme. Now he's facing charges accused of assaulting his wife. The agent is accused of beating and choking his wife after they attended a risque party on the west side of the state. The incident leaving her bleeding with head injuries. Fox 2's Taryn Asher joins us tonight with details. Taryn. Yes, we are talking about the FBI, FBI special agent at the center of the case against more than a dozen men in the plot to kidnap and kill the governor. His criminal case could hurt his credibility. He was allowed personal, personal bond, allowed to walk out where my client who committed no violence, um, got 10, started at $10 million. Nicholas Somberg referring to his client, 26-year-old Joseph Morrison, one of a total of 14 men accused at the state and federal level in the plot to kidnap and kill Governor Gretchen Whitmer. The most specific thing he said was when he was, he said, one, two, three, four, I'm going through Governor Whitmer's door. Okay. I mean, it sounds like a, a poem to me. Would you agree? Well, at the end of the day, when you put together a team that didn't, in fact, plan to go through her door, it, I think, takes on a little more context. Yet the FBI special agent, Richard Trask, who worked with the informants and provided key testimony here at the preliminary hearing, was able to walk out of jail for a much smaller bond. And Somberg adds Trask is accused of a lot more violence, slamming his wife's head several times against the nightstand after they argued at a swingers sex party near Kalamazoo. But that's just going to go to their, their character and their, and their credibility. Look at, look at the FBI, look at the guys they're hiring. These aren't Boy Scouts. These aren't clean-cut clean people. They're going to swingers parties and beating their wives, which is, you know, worse than my client ever did. And Somberg claims poke even more holes in the case against his client. Morrison is accused of making a terrorist threat and hosting live militia training at his Munich property. Keep moving. But his attorney says FBI informants can be heard on recorded phone calls pushing Adam Fox, the so-called ringleader of the plot, to train at his client's house. He insisted on doing it with other FBI agents in the background telling him what to say. And this was after my client had already told him, no, he's crazy, uh, he's a loose cannon, we don't want, I don't want to deal with him. That's why Somberg filed an entrapment motion at the state level. He feels the criminal charges FBI agent Richard Task is now facing will help his client's case, but feels their defense is strong without it. Came out that, that there's a, a dozen informants mm -hmm. that, that came out as well. So how many informants do you need until it's actually your plot? And now you've sort of become the criminal that you're trying to stop. Attorney Sonberg says they are still waiting for a response from the Attorney General's office on their motion to dismiss the state charges on the grounds of entrapment. They're expected to be back in court on the 23rd.
Well, these charges are going to make it tough for the FBI agent, Trask, to do his job. Well, absolutely, because first of all, during the, as his clay, case plays out, uh, he's not allowed to carry a firearm. And we don't know if he's suspended yet, but one would assume that's likely probably going to come with the criminal charges. We haven't heard yet uh, back from the FBI, but still, that's going to prevent him from testifying further mm -hmm. in this case and, and really, you know, helping to facilitate it. So. Mm -hmm. This is a very complicated case as it goes with lots of layers at the state and the federal level involving so many people and so many attorneys. You know, it's going to be interesting. But this changes everything. It changes some. Yeah, no question. For about sure. It. All, All right. right. Thanks, okay. Darren. Thank you. Such an interesting uh, kind of turn of events uh, in this plot. Uh, some 14 people were allegedly part of a group called the Wolverine Watchmen. They were charged in the plot, but the men have pushed back and said that they were set up by the FBI because of their political views. This was really uh, kind of all uh, started because of uh, Gretchen Whitmer, the Michigan governor's very, very onerous coronavirus restrictions in the very uh, midst of the pandemic that a lot of uh, residents there in her state objected to. These these uh, 14 individuals taking it very, very uh, further. Uh, and, and so we'll be monitoring that story. Uh, and we thank Fox 2 Detroit for bringing that to us here on Live Now. In the, in the meantime, we do want to uh, move into some of the other uh, political stories uh, on Capitol Hill. Remember, we've been following all the drama and fallout uh, after uh, Kevin McCarthy, the minority leader, uh, recalled the five members that he wanted to sit on the select committee investigating January 6th. Uh, well, Speaker Pelosi held her daily press conference today. She was asked about this a number of times and made remarks herself. We're going to play those out again uh, from earlier. Good morning, everyone. My apologies for being a few minutes late. On my way here, uh, we had the pleasure of visit of Chuck Schumer and his first grandchild, Noah. And... Uh, Noah looked in at the house and saw the American flag. He got some chocolate at my office, and uh, it was the perfect way to begin because he is the future, and all that we do is about the future. As we speak right now on the floor of the House, we have the Allies Bill. Promises made, promises kept to those who helped our men and women in uniform in, uh, in Afghanistan uh, to have the visas and the uh, opportunity for them uh, to be safe. I've been to Afghanistan nine times, bringing the, the best wishes of our, our, the American people to our men and women in uniform, and also thanking those who are helped to keep, helped to keep them safe. This is a, 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 a very important measure in that regard. And then, and then when I leave here, we will be welcoming the King of Jordan, King of His Majesty King Abdullah. Uh, to talk about peace in the Middle East. So it's a busy, it's a busy time. Uh, in terms of uh, where we are on this, we have uh, the, uh, the fact that the bipartisan agreement in the Senate looks like it has prospects to be brought up soon. I don't know when. I hope that it will, uh, because that infrastructure legislation is very important. But I want to talk about our men and women in uniform. We always promise them that we will build them. We will build for them a future worthy of their sacrifice. And President Biden's big Build Back Better initiative does exactly that. Uh, we are, uh, jobs are coming back, going to about 60,000 every three days. Uh, wages are rising, paychecks are growing, the strongest rate before the pandemic since 2006. The economy is booming, the CBO, the CBO, IMF, Federal Reserve, World Bank, OECD, and others all project that we will reach the highest levels of growth in nearly four decades, uh, and we'll do that this year. And we need bo build bold infrastructure investment to build back better, better jobs. When we ran in 18 and then in 20, we said we were going to lower health care costs, make, have lower health care costs, bigger paychecks, cleaner government. Uh, that's what we're said what we had set out to do and are in the works to accomplish. Jobs are coming back, as I, I mentioned uh, before. Now, as we go forward, it is important for us to, again, have them pass the, the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, as I said earlier, we don't know when. It's a Senate schedule, uh, but it seems to be imminent, and I hope that it will succeed. Uh, I have said, and I repeat, that we will not be, we, while we are 
eager for it to pass, we will not be taking it up until the pa Senate passes the reconciliation bill. And, uh, and the timing of that, of course, is up, up to the Senate. As you know, January 6th was a day of an assault capital that was one of the darkest days in our country's history. It was an assault on our democracy, it was an assault on our Congress, an assault on our Constitution, as the rioters uh, tried to undo or prevent us from honoring our constitutional responsibility uh, to ratify, to certify uh, uh, the Electoral College vote and officially name Joe Biden President of the United States. In the time since then, six months or more since then, we've tried to have a bipartisan commission. In the House, we passed it. It was, we yielded on many scores in terms of makeup, process, and timing. And it was bipartisan in terms of the committee, and I salute our chairman, Benny Thompson, and Mr. Kafko, the ra ranking member. Even though it was something that was bipartisan, and yielded on many points to the Republicans in order to achieve bipartisanship, uh, the leadership of the Republican Party in the House opposed and whipped against the bipartisan commission. Still in all, we had the votes. 35 members in the Republican side voted with us to send it to the Senate. It was very hopeful that we could pass it there. We had seven Republican votes, uh, but that, not 10, and we needed 10 to get up to 60. Hopefully one day that will still, that opportunity will still present itself. But because it was not possible in this time frame, uh, last month we passed uh, the, uh, our legislation for a select committee. The select committee uh, is um, bipartisan and it has a quorum and it will do the job it sets out to do. And that is to investigate the causes and that of the of, of what happened on January 6th to find out how it was organized who paid for it who messaged to get those people here for the assault on the Capitol as you know well over a hundred people were injured some died it was a horrible horrible thing I'll never forget the trauma it caused not only for our members but for our staff and for the people who work in the Capitol uh, to make our work here possible. Many, many, some of you were here that day as well, so you can attest to the fact that it was not all love, hugs, and kisses, as it has been characterized, in a, mischaracterized, shall we say. So, as you know, I, we named our commission, and it was committee, and it's bipartisan, again, and we have a quorum. Staff is being hired to do the job. We're there to seek the truth. We're not, we're there to get the truth, not to get Trump. Uh, T-R-U, truth, Trump. That seems to be what the other side is obsessed with. So as the legislation allows, I did not accept two of the five people were appointed. Uh, they had made statements and taken actions uh, that I think would impact the integrity of the commission, of the committee, the work of the committee. This is deadly serious. This is about our Constitution. It's about our country. It's about assault on the Capitol that is being mischaracterized for some reason at the expense, at the expense of finding the truth for the American people. I'm very pleased the response that we have received across the country and from my caucus uh, on this subject. And we will, I'm very pleased with the leadership of Benny Thompson, our chairman, the bipartisan nature of our committee with Liz Cheney, the other members who are on the committee uh, who have experience and patriotism as their calling cards. So we will proceed, and as I said, they're in the process of the committee is in the process of hiring staff uh, to that end. It is my responsibility as Speaker of the House to make sure we get to the truth on this, 
and we will not let their antics stand in the way of that. On another subject, again, uh, we are um, working very hard to get the job done for the American people, to lower health care costs, lower pollution, uh, raised, as I said to when we ran, we said lower health care costs, bigger paychecks, cleaner government, and that's what we are about. The cleaner government co comes with the H.R. 1, H.S. Uh, H.R. 1, S. 1. Combine them, the Senate resolution, the House resolution, to get this done. So, in any event, uh, as I mentioned, we are here to get the job done. Uh, we cannot respond to some of the legislation until the Senate acts. As I said, we will not take up the infrastructure bill until the Senate passes the reconciliation bill. With that, I'm pleased to take any questions. Yes, ma'am. Would you agree additional Republican members to serve on this select committee, given the fact that the resolution says you have the power to appoint team yes. members? Well, we did, I did suggest to the uh, leader that the th three, make, make sure you understand this. People, have, I hear the press saying, well, they didn't vote to accept the Biden. That had nothing to do with it. Right from the start, when the members acted in that way and said they were not going to vote for um, uh, the uh, certification that Joe Biden was president, I said to the members, do not let that stand in the way of you finding bipartisan agreement on legislation here. I'm not encouraging that at all. You find your common ground. We, want, we strive for bipartisanship. So how they voted on that bill is not relevant to how we are legislating. On the other hand, uh, the two people that I excluded, so three of the three that I appointed, one of them uh, voted uh, against the uh, ratification uh, and the other two voted for it. Having said that, though, the other two made statements and took actions that just made it ridiculous to put them on such a committee seeking the truth. At the same time, uh, we have a committee to, uh, uh, economic, a committee to uh, to address economic disparities in our country. And the um, leader gave me six names for that committee. Five of them voted against making the election of Joe Biden official, but I approved all six of them, even though only one of them voted in that regard. So it has not been a factor, uh, even though the press somehow or other you all think that it might be. It has not been a factor. Uh, the uh, Chairman of that committee, Jim Himes, is already staffed up and ready for hearing a hearing next week, as is Mr. Thompson for a hearing next week. But um, the, the leader may want to rescind those names. Uh, I'm ready to have them be accepted on the floor of the House. So we'll see. We'll see. I mean, there, there are some members who would like to be on it, but we'll see. Yes, ma'am. Well, no, I won't. I'll just give you their statements. You'll give you their statements. I think one of them was sort of the, of, of Mr. Banks, was that the Biden administration was responsible for January 6th. There was no Biden administration on January 6th. But let's not go into that. Have you, are you up to date on their statements? I, I'd, I'd like you to see them because they completely uh, just make it impossible for them to exercise judgment. Again, this is about seeking the truth. And it's about not, I, as I said in my comment, with respect for the integrity of the investigation, with concern that, to, that the American people want to know the truth, and in light of statements and actions taken by them, um, I could not appoint them. I said that while this may be unprecedented, so was an attack on the Capitol. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about them. Time. Yes, uh, Thank you. So uh, on the uh, bipartisan question about this committee and Ms. Cheney, yes. you said this is bipartisan. You know, when you talk in poll Republicans, uh, they, many of them believe that you know, the election was stolen from him and so on. How do you convince 
people on the other side of the aisle that what's going to go on in this committee is going to be bipartisan and truly get to the truth. Yeah. They're already it's not even it isn't even bipartisan, it's nonpartisan. It's about seeking an, uh, the truth, and that's what we owe the American people. And uh, probably the biggest incentive for that is that the more, uh, the less partisan it is, the more it will be accepted by the American, by the American people. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not talking about him. Okay. What else? You got? No, I'm not. I'm not concerned. And I'm, I mean. Uh, Let's not waste each other's time, okay? Madam Speaker, there's a bill before the House that uh, would prohibit uh, taxpayer-funded abortion. It's been brought by Republicans 37 times for a vote on the House floor, uh, but has been blocked by Democrats. Can you explain why? It has been blocked by Democrats? Well, it has been blocked for a vote to allow a vote on the House floor. The bill but it hasn't been blocked by Democrats. Well, it, it, hasn't, been, it hasn't been accepted. Well, we, we will be voting on it. It was passed in committee. We think it is the right thing to do. It is something that many of us have um, been concerned about for a long time uh, as an issue of health, as an issue of fairness. And we will send the bills over to the Senate. We'll see. Uh, it may be. No, I'm sorry. I think you misunderstood. It, it's, it's, a, it's a bill to, to prohibit taxpayer funded abortions, to, to have money. To well, that's in the law for Medicaid. You're talking about Medicaid. That's in the law. What we have in our bill is to overturn that. There's no need to have that. That is the law now. Hmm? And the reasons why to have it overturned? Because it's an issue of health of many women in America, especially those uh, in uh, uh, lower income situations and in uh, different states. And uh, it is something that has been a priority for many of us a long time. Uh, as a devout Catholic and mother of five in six years, uh, I uh, feel that God blessed my husband and me with our beautiful family, five children, six years almost to the day. But that may not be what we should, and it's not up to me to di dictate that that's what other people should do. And it, it's an issue of, of fairness and uh, justice for poor women in, in our country. Yes, ma'am. Given how divided the country is at this point, um, do you risk uh, half the American public not believing what the committee finds with, with your findings in the select committee? And also, can you talk about Liz Cheney's role now um, after Leader McCarthy and Cruz of withdrawing his number? Well, no. Uh, in fact, I don't accept your stipulation that half the country is de that There is a, a percentage of the country uh, who is in denial about COVID and getting vaccinated, and it's sort of the same crowd. That, but overwhelmingly, if you look at the polls, and if that's what your measure is, they, they want to know the truth. Is it like in the 70s that people want to know more about what happened on January 6th? And 59% of Republicans, according to the the polling that came out this morning, think we need to know more about what happened on January 6th. I think that, to, just uh, to take this to an end, we, uh, these people are going to act up, cause a problem. And people said to me, put them on, and then when they act up, you can take them off. I said, why should we waste time on something as predictable? The Republicans that they put on will have their own point of view. Nobody's saying, uh, that that uh, it all should be one point of view going on the committee. But it is uh, when statements are ridiculous and fall into the realm of uh, you must be kidding, there's no way that they're going to be on the committee. Okay, so I've got to go. House the right word shift of Latino voters in the 2020 election, and should the Democratic Party be preparing uh, to appeal to the demographic differently in the midterm? Well, you want to talk politics? <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, obviously, the, uh, the Latino community is the future of America. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you actually study the numbers, there was a very strong vote for Joe Biden in that. Uh, the, the message, part of our issue in the last election was that we could not go door to door. We could not go door to door uh, to get out the vote. We will be able to go out to door to door next. But regardless of that, 
we should be paying a great deal of attention. And I'm so proud of our uh, Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, for the work that they do in the Congress to bring the concerns of the community into the, a priority place in our debate and our discussion. And the, um, that, that their communication is helpful to us to, un to understand more fully uh, what some of the issues are. Some of the issues you are, um, um, are, are newer issues to the discussion. The Latino community is a young population. It's a young population, and we really have to reach out better to young people as, whether, as well as the Latino community. But I have to go to the floor because I have the, the King of, of Jordan coming right now. Uh, the, you know, what is taught in the curriculum in schools is a local decision. That's just the way it has been. Uh, I think it is a, a sadness for the children if they are not able to hear or learn about that speech because it is so inspirational about our country. It's not partisan. It's patriotic. It's fair. Uh, I, you remind me that this weekend we had the privilege many of us to go to San Diego for the launching of the John Lewis, the ship named for John Lewis. It was such a beautiful occasion. And I recalled when I made my speech, at the, I recalled what, that two years ago, around this time, the end of July, a little bit later, uh, John Lewis and the Black Caucus and I went to Ghana. And we went to where the door of no return, where the, the first slaves that came to the United States 400 years ago, well, to America, it wasn't the United States, yet, went through that door of no return and got on those death ships. If they survived, slavery was their destination. It was just so tragic. And John, you should have seen the reception he received. It was so beautiful there. But John said to us, you know, the, um, this is Amer as much a part of American history as the Selma, walk over the Selma Bridge, because this is how people came. And what he did say, and I'll close with this, he said, we may have come to America on different ships, but now we're in the same boat. And that's how we view this. We're in the same boat of America for a more perfect union. He's such an inspiration to us, as was Dr. King. Mr. Clyburn has it, I think, constantly going in his office, because no matter how many times you hear the speech of Dr. King, it, it continues uh, to inspire, strengthen, and keep us focused on our purpose, that we're all on the same ship. Thank you all. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. All right, a press conference with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi right there. We're heading into the 4 o'clock hour here on Live Now from Fox. I'm Daytona Everett. When we come back after the break, we have uh, a few stories that we want to be getting to, some caught-on-cam videos that you're not going to believe, uh, including the latest out of the Tamarack Fire, which uh, is really tearing through parts of California and Nevada right now. We'll also be getting an update from officials down on the ground, as well as uh, some other videos, including that seagull attack on a roller coaster. You're, you're not going to want to miss that either. Uh, see you back here in two.
Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. Uh, we want to follow up on a couple of stories we were following in the past uh, week here, taking a look out of Tucson, Arizona, new details about the mass shooting in Tucson from early last week. Police say the accused suspect has died. Leslie Scarlett, you saw him right there, was shot by police on Sunday, July 18th. They say that he opened fire on first responders and neighbors at the scene of a house fire. Six others were shot and two of them died. Detectives are still continuing their conversation right here. You're taking a look at that body camera footage that was captured by Tucson police just moments uh, before they had to go and shoot uh, again. Leslie Scarlett, 35 years old, who the latest that we know is that he has succumbed to his injuries. That's the latest from this investigation right here. Moving forward now out to Florida, some pretty wild footage you're going to see on this Florida highway here. Newly released video from the Florida Highway Patrol shows a chase in South Florida that led to a stolen SUV overturning on the highway. The incident occurred back in May, but troopers released the dash cam video this week. Five teens were accused of trying to steal a red Range Rover from a Fort Lauderdale home. It didn't go quite as planned. They found themselves involved in this police chase as they fled the neighborhood. Uh, the video shows troopers uh, and how dangerous the chase was on this busy freeway there. The teen's getaway vehicle was traveling on the express lanes, barreling over dividers and cutting into traffic. The video in the very beginning, you're going to see it again, showing them moving back into the express lanes and repeating their previous maneuver of running over a few orange poles there uh, and driving into the expressway in the middle of all these busy traffic lines here. The driver lost control and eventually flipped over. WSVN is reporting that other accidents occurred as a result of the chase. All of these teens were taken to a hospital and are currently facing charges at this point. Out now to some fire coverage. Firefighters going above the call of duty to protect the communities that they serve, as always, courageously putting their lives on the line. And sometimes their heroic acts are captured on video. UC Davis uh, Fire shared this video today of a crew uh, of firefighters racing through the flames of the Tamarack Fire to protect a housing development. They were sent to help battle the out of control wildfire that's burning further north in Alpine County. More than 1,200 firefighters are battling the Tamarack Fire, which has flattened at least 10 buildings, forcing evacuations in several communities and closing parts of U.S. 395 in Nevada and California. It erupted on July 4th and was one of nearly two dozen blazes that sparked by lightning strikes. So just wild images that we are getting right here from inside of this car. Uh, firefighters working hard to get this blaze under control. We have the latest uh, from officials down on the ground on what the latest is as far as evacuations go, containment, and in acreage at this point in time. Hey, good morning. I'm Pat Seekins, operations with the Rocky Mountain Area Type 1 Incident Management Team. And I'm here to give you an update on the Tamarack Fire this morning. Uh, right now we're sitting at just over 50,000 acres at 4% containment. Um, so we'll slide over to the map and we'll give you an update and we'll start here where we do have some good containment We've been talking about the last few days um, Right here along highway 89 where we see the black line here right along the fire's edge uh, We did call this contain yesterday. So a lot of really good work's been done in here the last uh, Three to four days and we're feeling confident along this fire edge um, That it's not going to move and that's where our containment's coming from um, continuing on, moving into, we're in Branch 1, Division Kilo. Uh, once again, right along the fire's edge, they've been successful at going direct with crews, as well as Dozer Line, down to a certain point towards the Carson River here. Um, but this ground is really steep and rugged and thick fields, and uh, things get really difficult here with the crews and uh, with the dozers that just can't access a steep country. Um, as we move up to the fire's edge here, we don't have any uh, hand line in here. Really steep, rugged ground uh, adjacent to the Carson River. Uh, there were some spot fires that were fairly well established that did cross the Carson River here. 
Um, this was kind of a priority for us yesterday, at least assessing if we could get crews in here or at least work this with aviation. Um, this is very steep, rugged terrain. They do have plans on potentially flying a crew in here to address this fire here. Um, but based on priorities, we'll see if that can continue today. So it is getting looked at, and we're really looking close, um, keeping the fire spread to the south. Uh, continuing on to the east is larger fire perimeter. So we're moving into uh, Division Oscar and all the way out to the 395 corridor. So obviously yesterday this was some pretty extreme fire behavior. We had yesterday where, where fuels and the wind um, and the drought conditions, these are super dry fuels, just really pushes fire. It just wanted to, to really burn east. And uh, this is where most of the activity was yesterday, as you can see. Um, so this is the highest priority for us, obviously, yesterday and moving forward. Um, primary focus is prioritizing the Highway 395 corridor and all the high values in the homes and any infrastructure and the power lines right along 395 will be the focus. Um, that's just going to continue. We know the fire has spread a little further north than what's showing on the map here, as well as this fire did make it out to the 395 road. But as of right now, the fire has not crossed the 395 road. So Highway 395, the fire is still west and south of the highway as, as, we, as it is now. Um, we do have a challenging day today. We know that um, today right here in this location, just west of Holbrook Heights and right along Highway 395. We're, we're very much predicting this fire that's going to want to move northeast. And these fuels right here, really heavy, heavy fuel loading, um, very dry and explosive fuels that we saw some, some very extreme fire behavior yesterday and towards the evening in here. Um, we had to pull firefighters back and focus on where we could be successful and really focus on where we could protect the values and not engaging the active edge. Uh, it's just not safe to do so when, when the fire is really moving that fast. So once again, just to recap, high priority today. Uh, we'll have a lot of resources in here focusing on um, this fire's progression and keeping the fire west of Highway 395 and future values to the south. Moving in here, we've added a new division. Um, and we'll focus on the larger area here and any values along this Highway 395 corridor. So nothing's changed there and really monitor this fire spread as it wants to move uh, south and east here um, towards the Highway 208 and Highway 395 intersection. So this is a very key, important piece for us here and a lot of good cooperation and a lot of good work got done yesterday, really focusing on those firefighting efforts right along Highway 395. All right, and I'll recap kind of sliding down to the fire's edge. Um, once again, this is very active. Um, we were not able to staff this flank of the fire. Um, once again, our primary focus is over here, um, but we are looking at all of this edge as we can with aircraft. Um, and we do have plans to staff portions of this fire where we can be successful in Division Kilo and Division Tango in the near future. Um, this fire perimeter was somewhat active. However, there was no major runs like we saw up here on the east side. Um, however, the fire is still uh, somewhat active and just moving slowly through those fuels um, where it's working against the wind that's coming from the west and southwest. Coming around the southeast corner of the fire, once again, um, there's a lot of natural barriers and rocks in here. It's not going to stop the fire spread. We know that. Um, this is still a priority for us at some point uh, to look at other options to the south. Utilizing natural barriers or road systems. Once again, this is monitor Division Zulu's unstaffed, as well as Division Alpha once we get over in the southwest corner. Um, slide around just, so, just south of Burnside Lake here. Uh, we do know we have several spot fires outside of the main fire edge here. Um, we do have aircraft looking at that and assessing the need to uh, potentially suppress that. But once again, this fire edge is unchecked. Um, we're just going to monitor this as we can, um, just focusing on the higher priority areas right now. But uh, definitely taking a look at that. We know it's there. Uh, we just want to make sure we're, we're keeping an eye on that as, as the days move on. 
Uh, moving uh, north and east along this fire perimeter. Unstaffed here, just really steep, rugged terrain, really inaccessible, um, just below Hawkins Peak. Um, but as we come off the face here, just south of Highway 88, um, this is once again, we move back into a high priority for us. Um, monitoring this fire spread as it backs down into Highway um, 88. And obviously keeping that fire spread west of Highway 89, where we've been successful so far with excluding these, these values and homes here with dozer line and hand crews. Um, some, some really good work. Um, this is uh, slow and patience is the key word here. We're going to have to wait for this fire to back slowly down and initiate and protect these homes in the lower end. So we have resources in there uh, 24 hours a day, including night shift focused in that area uh, to keep that fire south of Highway 88. So once again, in Woodfords, we're focused on, uh, we have a structure group focused in Woodfords. Um, we have a structure group, once again, a high presence here in Markleyville, which is still a high priority to make sure, you know, a lot of this was unburned, which is hard to see on the map. A lot of this was unburned around these homes that were excluded. So um, a lot of really good work has been done in there. We just need to stay vigilant in our patrol and monitor status. Uh, same thing goes for Grover Hot Springs. Uh, still in patrol status, everything looking really good in there. No real concerns or issues. Um, once again, four or five days ago, a lot of good work got done and more or less patrol status. Uh, we've got a group assessing Mesa, Mesa Vista right along Highway 88 as a point of uh, concern to, make, uh, to initiate some proactive structure protection and triage. Just in the event something gets surprised, we want to be ready for anything else to to pop up and be ready for, for any kind of other risk. Um, once again, I'll recap. Um, we are staffing this fire 24 hours a day, so night shift, day shift. We have firefighters in all these high priority areas in Division Foxtrot, the Highway 395 corridor, um, um, 24 hours a day. So I do want to emphasize the entire fire is a priority. Um, however, with the resources we have, uh, we have allocated those resources to, to high priority areas where the potential is high, the consequences are high, um, but our success is high as well, where we can, we, we can engage and be aggressive, um, where these fields transition into lighter fields, and we can protect the high values. Um, same goes here for the northwest corner. So just wanted to emphasize, we are looking at the south edge of this fire we're, we're definitely checking the back door we do know we have identified values off to the south and uh, so the entire big picture is being taken care of and that's where so that was the latest on the tamarack fire right there we know gusty winds and rough terrain is making it difficult for some of those firefighters uh, but they are heading right into it uh, and trying to battle tamarack we'll keep you updated on anything that we get any new visuals that we get but we want to move into a different story right now out of princeton uh, minnesota we are hearing that an explosion flattened a home out there that's where we're going to find fox 9's courtney godfrey courtney thanks for being with us here on live now what's the latest Yeah, well, witnesses say that they could hear this explosion nearly a mile away. Fire officials here in this small town of Princeton, about an hour north of the Twin Cities, say that when they got out here, the home was completely engulfed in flames. And as you can see behind me, it's now completely reduced to rubble. Family tell me that there are three victims here. One is now dead. Two others were transported to the hospital. Now, this all started around noon today. A uh, family tells us that the homeowner, uh, an older gentleman, was at the stove trying to make something to eat when the explosion happened. A 39-year-old, his granddaughter, who was on the couch, was then propelled out the window. Uh, his 59-year-old son, who lives in the house right now, was coming up from the basements in the stairs when neighbors actually pulled him out of the rubble. I'm just going to step out of the scene here so that you can get a good look at what's going on. You can actually see that the gas company is out here now uh, using an excavator to dig up the dirt. I presume they're trying to find that gas line. Law enforcement officials have not said what the cause of this explosion is, but we do know that the Office of Gas Safety is out here, that the state fire marshal's office is out here, but that the lead investigators are that local law enforcement. Now, family tells me that 
those uh, two victims that were injured, the 39-year-old woman, she is expected to be okay. She is expected to be released from the hospital this evening. Uh, the other individual was more severely injured, and so he is still hospitalized. And the grandfather, that gentleman in his late 80s, he is deceased tonight. Reporting live in Princeton, Courtney Godfrey, Fox News. So, Courtney, we do have a little bit of information from some of those eyewitnesses on the scene. I'm going to play that out, and then we'll follow up with just a few more questions here. From what we've heard is Gino started the stove about 11 o'clock or so. Summer's in there whenever the stove was turned on. And as soon as the stove was turned on, it exploded. The house exploded. So, Courtney, we're just seeing some of these images from down on the ground there, the uh, damage that is in the area. Uh, did any of these other houses get affected, or was it pretty much just consolidated to that one home? The house directly behind it did have one window that was blown out. They actually have a crew out here right now uh, boarding up that window and trying to assess the damage. But uh, amazingly, it appears that it's just that one house uh, behind, behind the rubble here that had one window blown out. All right. Fox 9's Courtney Godfrey reporting live for us out of Princeton. We appreciate you. We'll uh, speak with you soon. Absolutely. And we're going to take a two minute break here on live now from Fox. When we come back, we have more to be getting to, especially when it comes to coronavirus news, the Delta variant causing concerns across the country as numbers are surging. Case numbers are surging. We'll see you back here in just two minutes. Welcome back here to Live Now 415 here in Phoenix, Arizona. We're going to be going out live to Phoenix, Arizona in just a little bit here. But first, uh, we want to go out to a story from our Fox 5 Atlanta team as they're talking about the latest coronavirus news. We'll be speaking about that specifically the Delta variant. When Georgia reported a little more than 2300 new confirmed COVID-19 cases yesterday alone. And state health officials say infections, hospitalizations, and deaths are rising. Testing positive can be a frightening ordeal because you don't know just how sick you might get. But if you have COVID-19, there is a treatment that may keep you out of the hospital. The Fox Medical Team's Beth Galvin joins us live now to talk about how all of this works. This is encouraging news. Beth, good morning. And good morning, Portia. And we're talking about monoclonal antibodies, and that's a, a treatment for people who are at higher risk of developing complications from COVID-19 who, who test positive. And I want people to really know about it because it's an important option that can keep you from getting uh, sicker 
you know, as, as your disease progresses. So what monoclonal antibodies do is that they're molecules and you get an IV infusion of, of these antibodies and they kind of grab onto the cells of the virus and they keep the, the virus, I'm sorry, they grab onto the virus, keeping the virus from getting into the healthy cells in your body. And that's where the virus wants to replicate and, you know, uh, make you sicker and sicker and sicker. So what they're doing is they're kind of blocking the virus from being able to replicate and make you sicker. And it's been shown to be a really effective option for some people who, you know, we're concerned about them that if they did get sick and they, they do test positive, they could be the ones that end up in the hospital or having a really hard time, Portia. So it's important to know that this resource, this treatment is out there for you and it's being offered at 15 different centers here in the metro area. So if a person tests positive, how do they know if they actually qualify for this type of treatment? So there's a, a few criteria, and I think we have a list for you, but you need to test positive and you need to have a doctor's referral in order to get a monoclonal antibody treatment. You need to be 12 or older. Um, and your symptoms need to be mild to moderate. So you can't have really severe COVID. You can't be in the hospital already because this doesn't really help those folks uh, who are already hospitalized. And you need to start the monoclonal antibody treatment uh, within 10 days of having your first symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, you also finally, importantly, need to have one of these high-risk conditions, Portia, that, that may predispose you to having a tougher time with COVID-19. And, and there are things that are quite common. Like what kind of conditions are you talking about, Beth? So we're talking about, uh, we have, I think we have another list here. So it's anybody who is 65 and older, is it considered at higher risk for complications from COVID? But also people who are obese, uh, women who are pregnant, people who have chronic kidney, heart, or lung disease, uh, people who have diabetes, a uh, weakened immune system, those with sickle cell disease, and there are other conditions on the list. So just really important to, if you do test positive and you do have one of these conditions that I'm mentioning, and um, it's important to really reach out to your doctor and say, hey, is this an option for me? Uh, can I get a referral to do this? Because I've talked to people who were really frightened, you know, had hypertension, had diabetes, and were really frightened that, that, that their infection could go south, reached out to their doctor, got in at one of these centers, and were able to get this treatment. And it really kind of turned things around within a couple of days from then. They started to, instead of feeling steadily worse and worse and worse, started feeling better, poor I'm Beth. So you've been listening in to Fox 5 in Atlanta, you know, want to always go to the experts to figure out what uh, you need to know about the coronavirus. But as many Americans have been celebrating a return to normal in this pandemic, health officials are warning about a new potential wave of the pandemic. Some cities are even bringing back some of those pandemic restrictions that we all remember. Fox's Stephanie Bennett uh, joining us live from Phoenix, Arizona, with the very latest. Uh, Steph, how are you doing tonight? Hey, Daytona. Yeah, just in the last two weeks, our COVID cases have nearly tripled nationwide. In fact, the current average of new daily cases is more than 37,000. The Delta variant is responsible for about 83% of all cases right now in the United States. And doctors say, unlike the original strain, many of the patients they're seeing these days are younger in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. But now another new variant is also in the mix, the Lambda strain. It swept through several sounds. South American countries earlier this year and has been found in some states, including a Houston hospital this week. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have proven effective against it, but researchers say the J and J shot doesn't offer the same defense against Lambda or Delta. However, experts aren't sounding any alarms about it just yet, as there are less than 700 Lambda cases here in the U.S. So it's classified as what's called a variant of interest, which means it's of less significance than um, the other uh, variants like Delta. So the most important thing that people can do for themselves is to get the vaccine. The thing that we can all do fairly easily is um, reinstate masking, um, especially indoors. 
Yeah, and that's exactly what some cities are now doing. Los Angeles and Las Vegas are reinstating mask requirements, while some businesses are requiring proof of vaccines for indoor dining. That's happened a couple times here in Phoenix. And looking internationally, the U.S. is once again extending those border restrictions to non-essential travel at the Mexico and Canadian borders for land and ferry travel. In fact, according to the CDC, more than 56% of Americans have had at least one dose of the vaccine and uh, less than 50% or so have uh, not been fully vaccinated at all. Now, experts are saying the best thing to do is to get that shot and at least, you know, wear these masks for, you know, at least indoors, especially Daytona. And Stephanie, you know, we're in Phoenix, Arizona. How are numbers looking out here in comparison to some of these other cities that are seeing a major surge in cases? Yeah, Phoenix and uh, Arizona as a whole, the, our cases have been going up steadily throughout the last few months. I mean, at best, we were seeing about 300, 400 cases a couple months ago. But just over the last couple weeks, we're back into those thousand new cases daily. Mm -hmm. uh, just within, I want to say last week, we hit our first 1,000 case. And uh, it's just been between 1,000 and 2,000 so far. So it's definitely growing here and much across the country. And not just in the U.S., but things are going up uh, globally in the UK that's affecting travel still there without with throughout Europe and it's also impacting the Olympics now too. Yeah, you're so right. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if things change. Things are still pretty open here in Arizona, but as these cases rise, uh, that might not be the story anymore. Fox's Stephanie Bennett reporting live for us in Phoenix, Arizona. We'll speak with you soon. And we are going to go back out to uh, some of the coverage from Fox 5 in Atlanta as they're asking uh, those questions that some of you sitting at home might still have about uh, the pandemic as well. Here's the rest of that conversation. In a couple of days from then, they started to, instead of feeling steadily worse and worse and worse, started feeling better, Portia. And Beth, tell us just a little bit more about this treatment. What is this procedure like, the process like? It's an IV infusion. So you would go, it's an outpatient uh treatment so you would go to an infusion center and as i said like 15 different hospitals in the area are offering these you go in they put an iv in your arm and they infuse you with the monoclonal antibodies and then you need to sit there for a while um, just to make sure that you're okay and you're not having any kind of reaction to them and then you can go home and then you're going to recover you know at at home like you have been quarantining hopefully uh, at home and you know that's basically the treatment it's relatively pain-free it takes about an hour, hour and a half when you consider, you know, going in and getting observed and everything afterwards. So it's not a big commitment. Um, and, you know, it's a, I think it's a real option. Also really important to say that the, the antibodies themselves are paid for by the federal government. So you will not be charged for the treatment itself. You may wow. be charged or your insurance may be charged for the infusion fee that the, the, the center can charge, but uh, it makes it a much more affordable option for people who maybe don't have insurance. Um, so definitely talking to your doctor about, uh, hey, can I get in and do this? Um, you can also, you know, if you don't have a doctor, you can go to an urgent care, uh, it, you know, and or reach out to an urgent care and say, hey, can I get a referral for this? It doesn't have to be your doctor uh, you can get you know really any any kind of urgent care doctor could also do this understood and Beth I think you mentioned at the top of this interview there are 16 different facilities where do you go to get this treatment so 15 and they are um, kind of all over the metro area many of them are tied in with the big hospitals like Grady Health System or yeah. Piedmont uh, Atlanta Hospital so they have uh, facilities set up to do this um, and to keep everybody separated and safe and everything and so sometimes there's a little bit of a wait list so I would I would you know initiate this conversation with your doctor sooner rather than later because you want to hit that 10 day window when this treatment is really going to help you but it's really important to know that you know we're having a lot of people who are testing positive if you test positive you have some options there are other options if you end up in the hospital to treat you um, but this is one that can keep you out of the hospital hopefully so definitely something to know about if you've got diabetes or high blood pressure or you're obese you know and, and you're at risk of complications Portia. good to know it's an option that's available to so many different 
types of people with health conditions. Yeah. Great information, Beth. Thank you so yeah. much. All right, Fox 5 in Atlanta right there. Uh, nice conversation answering those questions that you might all have. Let's go away from some of that COVID-19 news and take you out to a pretty funny video out of Tennessee, a bear making itself comfortable inside someone's car. Take a look at this. <laughs> Go on. Go. Ah! Go. 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 Ah! Go. 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 On. Go. Ah! Go. Ah! Go. 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 People in Tennessee, a little surprised that their passenger was a bear uh, inside of this car here, shooing him off, saying, go, get out of here. Luckily, no one was injured in this situation, and I believe the bear just had a nice little ride there. Different type of Uber, uh, I have to say. All right, and then uh, another pretty interesting story to Fox 29 in Philadelphia. They spoke with a girl who also had an unexpected passenger on amusement ride out in Philly. Let's take a listen into this conversation. Right now, a video going viral. You have to see this one of two girls on the spring shot ride at Maurice Piers in Wildwood. After being launched into the air like a human cannonball, surprise, they picked up an extra passenger midair. You saw it? We're going to loop it again. So this happened earlier this month. We've got Georgia on the left, who was celebrating her birthday that day, and her friend Kylie there on the right. Georgia was just screaming. She had no idea what was happening right next to her as Kylie was just accepting her fate and that face full of bird. Was that terrifying? Did you know it was going to hit you? Like, what was going through your head when you saw it getting closer? I knew there was no going back. It was just going to hit me. And I didn't know what to do. So I wait for it to spin, spin over. And then I just grabbed it and threw it off me quick. <laughs> yeah, it looked like you just flicked it out of the way. Uh, Georgia, you were just busy screaming right next to her. Do you have any idea what was going on over there? Nope. <laughs> I asked the girls if they will ever go back on any kinds of slingshot rides. What do you think they said, Thomas? Uh, probably a big no. It was a hard no from both. Terror <laughs> times two. What are the odds over that one? All right, Scott, <laughs> hopefully the forecast not that terrifying. Right now. Pretty funny video right there. It looks like the seagull was trying to hold on for dear life onto the girl there. Uh, we're going to go out to a two-minute break. Again, that was Fox 29 in Philly. We have more to get to here on Live Now, 430 here in Phoenix, Arizona.
Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. We're going out to Chicago now as they are seeing a surge in crime. A 15-year-old boy was killed and 28 other people wounded by gunfire in Chicago just yesterday as the city was hit by three mass shootings in a single day. Here's the latest from Chicago Police. It's Brendan Dinahan who will update you on each of the three shootings we had overnight where we had multiple victims. Brendan. Okay, good, uh, good morning. I'm gonna give you guys just some uh, basic information on these incidents. Uh, detectives are you know, still out there from, you know, from last night uh, working around the clock on this, so uh, the investigation is obviously ongoing and fluid, but I can give you some basic information. So the first incident happened at 3348 West Douglas, so obviously it was on the 21st of July, just after 6 p.m. For that incident, there are a total of five victims and one of whom is, uh, is fatal and deceased at this time, and that's a juvenile victim who is 15 years of age. The second victim is an extremely critical condition, also a juvenile, 16 years of age, and um, just extremely critical. We're obviously waiting for the doctor to make a determination on that uh, individual. The third, fourth, and fifth, fifth victim are all in good condition, ages from 22, 23, and 24. And for that incident, there was a shot spotter alert followed by uh, several calls of people shot at that location. Um, one of the victims was fatally shot while standing in the alley right there at 3348 West Douglas. The other victims were shot while standing at 13, approximately 1340 South Christiana. The offenders were all male black offenders. They were all armed. They emerged from an empty lot at approximately 1327 Christiana and they all began to shoot in the direction of the victims. The offenders all en uh, entered a waiting vehicle and fled the scene. Uh, I don't want to give much information on the vehicle. That's part of our investigation, and obviously detectives are doing everything they can using video and all the other sources that we have um, to start this investigation at this time. Uh, the second incident also involved five victims at 1506 South Ridgeway, and it happened, as, uh, as you guys know, just several minutes after this first incident. As mentioned, also five victims in, uh, in this incident, a 15-year-old with a gunshot wound to the leg in good condition, a 22-year-old with a gunshot wound to the thigh in good condition, and there is a third victim who's 19 years of age with a gunshot wound to the chest, and that victim is still in critical condition. The fourth victim was 17 years of age with a gunshot wound to the back in serious condition, and the fifth victim was 14 years of age with a gunshot wound to the right arm in good condition. That fifth victim, 14 years of age, was an unintended target, not part of this incident, struck by a stray bullet while, uh, I believe, uh, entering a vehicle with his father. So for this incident, it was extremely chaotic. I know people saw the scene. There was a, a car that was flipped over. There were two, vic two victims sitting on a rear porch uh, on Ridgeway when two dark cars uh, pull up into a, into a vacant lot. Occupants begin uh, actually shooting through a fence at these individuals, first two victims, and that's when these first two victims were shot. These offending vehicles then flee the scene. The third and fourth victims were actually driving towards the area when they saw what was occurring and they attempted to either drive past or kind of flee the area. Uh, a separate group of males on that scene began to shoot at that vehicle that's what caused the vehicle to lose control and flip over. And when those two males exited the vehicle and began running, the group on the street continued to shoot at them. As I mentioned, this unintended target, the fifth victim, was in his father's car, stopped at a nearby stop sign uh, when he was shot. It has nothing to do uh, with the incident. So for this incident, there were uh, you know, multiple shooters in these two dark vehicles that initiated the original shooting in the alley. And then the second group of shooters on Ridgeway that shot at this uh, at victims three and four when they were driving past and trying to flee the area. The last incident uh, that took place last night was on the 22nd of July, just, just before midnight at 1647 North LaSalle in the 18th District at a gas station. And uh, for this incident, we have a, a victim that's 27 years of age with a gunshot wound to the chest in critical condition. We have a, a victim um, a female, female victim who's 26 years of age with a gunshot wound to the ankle. We have a male white Hispanic victim 
who has two gunshot wounds to the left thigh in stable condition. This victim was actually an employee of the bus. And then we have another employee of the bus who was the bus security, who is a male Hispanic, who also has a gunshot wound to the foot in good condition. And we have a, a fifth victim who's 24 years of age, gunshot wound to the right forearm in good condition. Sixth victim, 29 years of age, gunshot wound to the left arm in good condition. And then we also have an unintended target here who was in the gas station who suffered a graze wound to the groin area in good condition. That person was in a vehicle while the gas was being pumped. There was an eighth victim who showed up at the hospital with some sort of graze wound, and detectives are working now to see if that victim uh, you know, suffered a graze wound or possibly uh, suffered uh, injury from glass. They uh, left the hospital before we were able to talk to them. So for this incident, it was a, it was a party bus who pulls up into this area to use the, the restroom. And while this party bus is in the area, there's three vehicles that pull up and obviously are targeting victims of this party bus because they all shoot in the direction of these victims. And as I mentioned, the two employees of the bus suffer sh uh, gunshots as well. All three of these vehicles then flee the scene. And once again, we are working with uh, you know, all the cameras and we're back at the gas station today to get more video and to try to track some of, these, uh, some of these vehicles down. There was information that was put out that one of the vehicles had a stolen license plate on it, which was verified, which obviously makes it a little more difficult and complicated for the investigation for the detectives. Um, but regardless, the detectives are actively investigating all these incidents, um, but right now these are open and ongoing investigations at this time. Before I come back for my comments, I want to ask uh, Pastor James Brooks from Harmony Community Church to come up with a few words. I'm Pastor James Brooks from Harmony Community Church in Lawndale Christian Health Center in North Lawndale. First, I'd like to just tell you about North Lawndale and how special it is. It's special to me, um, first of all, because my family moved, moved to North Lawndale from, from the South in the 1950s, and we've been there ever since. I'm a resident of North Lawndale. I love the people of North Lawndale. And so in response, my remarks, I just want to say two things. Number one is that we have some great people in North Lawndale doing some great things. I know that, you know, you hear the bad stuff that happens, but really there are a lot of great things going on in North Lawndale. Grassroot organizations such as Boxing Out Negativity and then the Lawndale Legal Center, just to name a couple. And there are numerous of peoples and organizations doing some wonderful things to make um, North Lawndale a wonderful place to live. That's why I'm there. But number two, I just want to bring out, we need to come together in times like this. It's not a time to point fingers and point blame, but it's time to work together, work together as a community, work together with our 10th District Police that are doing a phenomenal job in Area 4, um, and trying to keep us safe. We need the community to help us. We need everybody. Yes, everybody. It's all of our responsibility to step out and say something. We want, the objective is clear, we want to keep our babies safe. They deserve a right to live. We can't wait. You know, Dr. King lived in Lawndale in 1966, from January 66 to November 66. And one thing Dr. King said, he said, what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. So we all, Chicago, we all have a responsibility to speak out if we know something. Thank you for this time. Just a few uh, comments before we open it up for questions. Number one, I just want to echo what Pastor Brooks uh, said about we need the community uh, to speak up, 
many of the victims of each of the shootings uh, that we uh, did follow up investigative information on are not cooperating. They're not forthcoming with information, which makes it, makes it much more difficult uh, to solve these cases. And part two of that is when you uh, are not forthcoming, the community is silent uh, with what information they do know about these offenders, the offenders get more emboldened. They, get, they, get, they feel like they got away with something and they are encouraged to do it again. And we see this cycle of violence that starts and then retaliation and then you start the back and forth. I would just say this one thing about um, not only the 10th district officers, but many of the officers in our community safety team who all responded uh, as these events unfolded uh, to protect the people of Chicago that live in the Lawndale area, risking these officers risking everything to stand in between uh, what would be further violence without regard for their own safety our officers run toward danger, run toward bullets without any regard. Otherwise, we would see much more violence when we have these types of incidents. Even though this is, seems just extraordinarily tragic with the multiple victims, uh, these offenders don't stop until officers are present because they fuel the street justice with retaliation after retaliation after retaliation and uh, our forward presence tonight, tomorrow night, the weekend is critical to continuing uh, to pursue uh, justice for the victims uh, today and in other incidents that we as police officers have to stand guard in these communities when they have these types of incidents where it's targeted, people are not cooperating who are victims, which signals to us we want revenge and we don't want police solving this case because we want revenge. We want to retaliate. We don't want you taking them to jail. That, that signals to us when you don't cooperate, when you're silent, that you prefer street judges, justice. And I, and I will just say this, street justice is never ending. The appetite for revenge is never satisfied. It only harms. It only ruins your community. And we need the community to step forward. Now, we are in a battle for the heart and soul of some of our communities. And now is the time to speak up. And with that, I'll take questions. So I don't want to step on uh, the announcements uh, that's forthcoming from the Attorney General. Uh, we'll let that play out uh, this afternoon. It's only a few more hours, so we can wait for the Attorney General to announce that structure. Uh, we did announce our team where we're going after gun traffickers. We believe there's, there's a threefold obligation that we have. Obviously, we need to be present and patrol and deploy resources uh, based on data to try and prevent whatever crime we can prevent with our presence. We also have an obligation to arrest offenders and bring them to justice. And we do that and we advocate strongly for the victim. You've heard me repeatedly talk about offenders need to be held more accountable. But we also have this effort that we need strategy around uh, gun trafficking, how the guns are getting, the flow of guns, how they're getting to Chicago for these offenders to use. And we need to use whatever uh, legal statutes that we have in place, whether that's state and or federal, to pr pursue the highest consequence for the people trafficking guns to these violent offenders. Uh, and we've dedicated 50 officers, uh, just as I announced uh, a few days ago, uh, to be involved on the front end of how guns get to Chicago in the hands of violent offenders so that we can hold them accountable and stem the tide of the flow of guns to these violent people. Yes. No. No.
We have to be relentless, and we can't. One thing, we're not going to ever quit on this community. We believe in the people of Chicago. And we don't want to paint everyone with a broad brush. There are people not associated with crime that live in these communities, that contribute to society in a positive way, that do things to help young people make better decisions. So let's not paint with a broad brush. I'm carving out this element of the community uh, that wreaks havoc. They terrorize people. Many are not even from the neighborhood. Uh, they come to meet out their violence, their revenge, their retaliation, their street justice, and then they leave uh, for community members like Pastor Brooks to pick up the pieces. So again, let's not paint this with a broad brush to say these communities won't come. I think our role is to uh, stand here, and I think your role as media is obviously to be adversarial toward us, but it's also to carry a message to these communities that the police officers need the community, uh, that being silent perpetuates the violence that occurs uh, because the retaliation is never ending. I think that message needs to be a top line in your articles and in your reporting at the top of the newscast, not at the bottom or lost on the editing room floor. We, we want these messages that we're using on our platform every time we have this type of thing uh, to change the communication dynamic with the community. And many people from the community are listening to mainstream media, print media, TV media, on how you tell these stories. That's why it's important. Don't paint the whole community with a broad brush. It's important for you not to do that as media. And it's important for you to convey the message that we, police officers, need the community. We need the community to come forward. We're much more effective when the community speaks up and gives us information to, to be able to solve some of these violent crimes so we can hold these offenders offenders uh, accountable. Yes. I'll pass it on to Dean Hannah to kind of go through the details because not all, some are employees of the party bus. So let me just have him just kind of talk through that for the party bus. Thanks. Sure. So obviously, as we mentioned, too, that there's, you know, it's it's still extremely active investigation. The, the detective who, you know, originally went out on the scene of the of the incident with other detectives, he's, he's still working right now. So the answer is many of the individuals who are targeted are not cooperating with the police at this time. You know, with that said, detectives will, you know, wait till hopefully cooler heads prevail. We will constantly re-interview people. As the superintendent mentioned, we have two employees of the bus, and that's, you know, where we receive a lot of information. So the individuals are targeted, are not very cooperative with the assigned detectives at this time, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that we, uh, that they won't be in the future. But right now, they are, they're not cooperating. No, so we don't have that yet. So uh, I don't like to speculate uh, on that. Um, so, but we just we do know that based upon the information and based upon the you know some of the video information we have, that the individuals you know in the party bus who were exited, who were going to the bathroom, specifically this party bus is targeted by those offenders. Correct, and I, and I think the soup went, you know, went through that, and, and it's something that, unfortunately, with the gang-on-gang -gang violence, the group-on-group -group violence, it's, it's nothing new, and as the superintendent mentioned, it's an extremely small segment of these communities, right? So, as the pastor mentioned, the, the larger segment are the people who get up and go to work every day and don't want this violence, but that is correct. So, the individuals that were targeted and the individuals who were shot are not cooperating with the police at this time. We had a couple unintended, you know, victims, and we spoke to them, and they're, they're cooperating, um, but right now... Uh, we don't have cooperation from the people who are specifically targeted. Mm -hmm. So I promised my comms director that I wouldn't become a White House press secretary today on this uh, announcement. I, I would defer and uh, allow the, the Attorney General and 
the local ATF special agent in charge uh, to uh, go further in their uh, discussions with the media about the strike force. Uh, and then we'll be glad to come back and talk about how this will work and enhance our capabilities, which I believe it will. Yes. It's more it's more than that, but again, I'll defer to the Attorney General for further announcements on further details beyond what was released last night. Any other last questions? Really last question. Yes. I believe in reform. I, I've consistently said whatever the council and mayor agrees to as it relates to this negotiation, when I walked in the door, that we'll be cooperative and work, work with the uh, group wh whichever way uh, the, the final negotiation has ended. And now we know how, and we are consistent with, we, we believe that reform is good for policing. Uh, it has the potential to build trust with the communities. Some of this not cooperating that we've been talking about is about not trusting us. So anything that can help us build trust is a good thing in solving crime, uh, as well as, you know, relationships with those in the community that obviously want input on, on uh, policies and other aspects of policing. We, we, we think if you're a police leader and you, you're not an advocate of reform, you're in the wrong business. Uh, one last question. Go ahead. We, we don't have any further, it's all preliminary. We have to review video uh, from uh, both private and any of our city-wide video pods. Uh, we don't have license plates, we don't have descriptions yet, uh, but it's still early. Our, our detectives worked throughout the night, they're still on scene, so we have more to discover in, in the future as it relates to video, but it will be helpful if people in the community came forward with additional information about who these offenders are. Thank you all very much. So that was the latest from the uh, Chicago Police Department. We wanna bring you some news though, uh, kind of concerning Chicago. Attorney General Merrick Jar uh, Garland said today that he hoped the Senate would confirm the head of the ATF to help front the federal effort against gun violence. The nomination of David Chipman has been stalled as Republicans and the National Rifle Association, the NRA, work to sink it. Chipman is a two decade veteran of the ATF who served as an advisor to a major gun control group and would be the first formal leader since 2015. Garland and Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco uh, met with agents before traveling to Chicago to launch an effort there and in four other cities to reduce spiking gun violence by addressing illegal trafficking and prosecuting offenses that help put guns in the hands of criminals. We wanna go out to just a bit of that with the Attorney General down on the ground in Chicago. Take a look at this. Here, uh, and then they send us the alert, and I'll play for you this one that was recent. So at this point, we would hear this and say, uh, 1102 okay, Sam, yeah. we're hearing uh, possibly full auto at uh, high capacity yeah. at 4133 West, uh, West End. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's somewhere between the properties. And then we would get a street view of it, and then the officers get an idea of where to go oh, to start looking. And uh, most times, like I said, high percentages, it's spot on. Yes, sir. Um, and so, then, so one, one, th one thing I think to keep in mind is my fellow mayors, shot spotters obviously out there trying to hawk right, uh, right, their right, services. Right, that's why and I get calls all the time saying, hey, the shots better work. It works if you've got a camera system. Yeah. If you don't have a camera system, it, it's not nearly as effective. Yeah, yeah. Right, you've got to have the camera system to be able to really zoom in and give the officers that are then responding uh, the guidance. Without the, the two uh, working hand and glove, I don't think it's that, that effective. 
And uh, finally, the one other set that you see, we have an inbox that every SDC room manages, and that's how we get information with partners. Uh, sometimes we get information from our community partners that they send, like just uh, alerts or uh, information that they have received. And then we try to put that together in slide forms uh, and then present it in roll calls. Because again, the beat cards, which are on the field, are the ones that need to get this information because that's their beat. That's who they're going to be constantly uh, monitoring those and patrolling those areas. Uh, which I'll pass over to our analyst, and he'll give you an example of how this mapping works. All right, sir. Um, gentlemen, thank you, everybody. Um, so real quick, I'm going to talk a little bit about the success stories that occurs here at the SDSC. So because we have all this technology fused together, we like to try to synthesize everything. Um, for example, in this particular case, this was back in October. I know it's a little bit dated. But the SDSC was instrumental in actually getting the cars at the proper location as soon as the, as soon as the shot spotter went off. And then they were able to direct, due to the cameras, specifically where the shooters were at this location and at this location, so that they, we had successful arrests. Particularly in this one right here, uh, the shot spotter went off at 234 South Independence. After the vehicle pulled up in the area, the SDSC was able to uh, direct our units to go to that particular location. Um, now, as far as the analytical portion of what goes on here on a day-to-day -day basis, I like to provide my commander with tactical level intelligence. A lot of the stuff that I provide on a daily basis, we do keep track of the shootings that occur within our district. A lot of it, we try to link whether it's going to be narcotic related, it's also going to be gang related or whatever the cause may be. Sometimes it's just a simple altercation that causes an actual shooting. But what I like to do is I like to highlight certain areas where I know with very high confidence that there will be a shooting whether it's going to be because of retaliation or because of the shot spotters that continuously keep occurring within that general area, there is a high probability that a shooting would occur within the next 24 to 36 hours. So I like to provide that with him with a little bit of an explanation why he's moving his resources to that particular uh, area for a more, uh, a better focus, so to speak. Uh, I also do the anniversaries like Officer Cortez uh, explained here. These tend to cause mass gatherings. Uh, in particular, some of them go back as far as hey, 2014. Hey, before you keep going, uh, yes, sir. just for the media, this is sensitive information. Some are juveniles, some are gang affiliations. We don't want so no, so no public reporting, okay? So just restrict the information if, if you don't mind. All right, thanks. Thanks, sir. Uh, so for the month, we just keep track of all the homicides. We do know that there's gatherings and a lot of shootings do occur because of these, so we like to keep track of them, and I also like to give uh, whether there's going to be a very high likelihood that there's going to be continued violence, or if it's low, uh, depending on the person's uh, influence in the neighborhood and so on and so forth, which a lot of that information comes from the district intelligence officers and then just based off the information and so the so historical. Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, um, do you want to talk, yeah. talk a little bit about why the anniversary is so uh, they ended up sending some of the media off. We wanted to show you this event here out of Chicago. Again, uh, this effort is going to include stepped up enforcement in so-called supply areas, cities and states where it's easier to obtain firearms, uh, in which are, they say, later trafficked into other cities with more restrictive gun laws. It's also uh, going to include New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Washington, but they're starting uh, mostly, as you can see right here, out of Chicago. We're going to be following everything with Attorney General Merrick Garland and the latest when it comes to gun violence. When we come back after the break, though, a story out of Phoenix, well, Ahwatukee, uh, the Phoenix Police Department has begun the process to fire the officer who shot and killed Ahwatukee father, Ryan Whittaker, last summer. We'll have a live report out of Phoenix on this story when we come back. See you back here in two minutes.
Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. The Phoenix Police Department has begun the process to fire the officer who shot and killed Awatuki father, Ryan Whittaker, last summer. Whittaker, who was 40 years old, was shot the back two times, less than three seconds after he answered the door of his Awatuki apartment. To bring us the details on this story, uh, we have Fox 10's Justin Lunn. Justin, what's the latest? Daytona Chief Jerry Williams has notified Officer Jeff Cook of the intent to end his employment. This comes months after the Maricopa County Attorney's Office declined to file charges against Cook for the death of Ryan Whitaker. Meanwhile, Whitaker's sister says this termination took too long. It is a step in the right direction, the bare minimum of what should happen, but at least it's something. Since the fatal police shooting of 40-year-old Ryan Whitaker, Katie Baeza continues to keep her brother's name in the public eye. Whitaker's family protested for months, demanding that Phoenix police officer Jeff Cook be fired and charged. In May 2020, Cook and another Phoenix officer responded to a 911 call about a domestic dispute at Whitaker's apartment near Desert Foothills Parkway and Chandler Boulevard. Seconds after Whitaker stepped out holding a gun he legally owned, Cook shot him twice in the back. But after reviewing the body cam footage, Maricopa County Attorney Alistair Adele said it appeared Whitaker was attempting to put the gun down and put his hands up. But she declined to file charges against Cook, saying his decision to shoot Whitaker was inaccurate in hindsight, but not unreasonable in the moment. Therefore, not a crime. Whitaker's then girlfriend told officers they were playing video games and there was no domestic issue. To me, it just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, my dad has said before, the only justice would have been Ryan being allowed to live. Last December, the city approved a $3 million settlement with Whitaker's family. There's no amount of money that's going to bring my son back. Whitaker's dad not satisfied. He told Fox 10 his family would fight for police reform and advocacy for loved ones of those killed by officers. To guide people through this time because no one is ever prepared for what they are about to endure, nor should they. In May, the Use of Force Board reviewed this police shooting and recommended that this incident be designated as, quote, within policy. Still, Chief Williams has decided on the termination move. Meanwhile, the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, they are disappointed and say they will continue to support Cook through the appeal process. Daytona. So, Justin, I'm curious why the timing? Why July of 2021 and this move from Phoenix Police? That is a good question. As you just heard, in May, they decided to review this and made their recommendation. But this obviously has taken a lot of time in the family of Ryan Whitaker. They have protested. They have demanded justice. Mm -hmm. And their big priority was getting charges filed. That did not happen. They say this, as you heard, is the bare minimum. They'll take it, but they still want to keep Ryan Whitaker's name out there and spread that awareness and continue to help other families that may be in similar situations. Yeah, this has been a uh, major story out of the Phoenix area and hopefully a little bit of peace for the family that's involved with Ryan Whitaker. Uh, Justin Lum reporting live for us out of Phoenix tonight. We appreciate you. We'll speak with you soon. Thanks, Daytona. And we want to go out to uh, Philadelphia as they held a press conference on a rise in crime out there as well. That has pretty much been the tone and theme of the week here, uh, addressing gun violence in several cities across the country. We just showed you some of those remarks from Attorney General Merrick Garland out in Chicago, speaking with officials with Mayor Lori Lightfoot uh, as they are seeing worse numbers than they've ever had before. Record-breaking numbers just in a single day, three mass shootings yesterday. So more to come out of Philadelphia right now. Uh, also getting to some of these other stories from across the country here on Live Now from Fox throughout the rest of the night. Community leaders to make a call for action around gun violence in our city. In October 2019, Almost two years ago, I stood outside the city's municipal service building and called on Mayor Kenny to implement a three-pronged approach to gun violence, an evidence-based approach that was shown to work in other places. Mayor Kenny responded by criticizing my office's report which was on the economic impact of gun violence as being focused 
on putting a dollar value on human life. This was a def deflection of the issue at hand that his administration wasn't doing enough to combat the gun violence in our city, in the neighborhoods. And today I'm reminded of that press conference because it was nearly two years ago, but not that much has changed. On that day, I talked about the violence in our city and about the level of homicides, about the death of a two-year-old girl, Nicolette Rivera, who was killed. She was the 278th homicide victim of 2019. As a mother, I can't even imagine the pain of that. And here we are, two years later, and this past weekend, dozens of people were shot, 33 people were shot this past weekend, including a one-year-old baby right here. In total, 356 people were victims of homicide in 2019. In 2020, we lost 499 people to gun violence homicide, one death shy of the highest ever recorded in our city's history. And there's, there is a record going back to 1960. So far this year, nearly 1,300 people have been shot and more than 300 people have been killed, an increase of 34% over last year. If we continue on this current trajectory this year, we could reach as many as 575 homicides this year. We can't let this happen. Today's gun violence is rooted in structural racism. Homicides and shootings are concentrated in the neighborhoods that are the most disadvantaged the poorest. And poverty in certain neighborhoods in our city didn't just happen. They were, it was created through racist government policies for decades, starting in the 1930s. This is what they don't teach you in school, but it's truth and it's history. It's the history of our country and it's the history of our city that these racist policies segregated our neighborhoods and created barriers for black and brown residents to access good paying jobs and a good education and prevented communities from building wealth. We must recognize that the high concentration of homicide in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods are the result of structural racism. And understanding and acknowledging this, this truth, that is key to combating the issues of poverty and violence. This lack of opportunity to engage in the American dream is the lens through which gun violence and poverty should be viewed. And it is why we all, all of us have a responsibility to lean in and fight this gun violence. And it is why we are demanding more from our mayor. Addressing our city's gun violence is an issue of racial justice. The data shows that much of Philadelphia's violence is concentrated in just 14 zip codes. That's 14 zip codes right here out of 48 of the city's zip codes. This disproportionately impacts our black and brown residents. Investment and resources must be targeted to these areas to ensure that the residents and the communities receive the care and attention they desperately need. And the data also shows that homicides in Philadelphia have increased every year since 2016. And that's shown over here. Calls for urgency in action have been met with excuses. The state needs to help us crack down on illegal guns and homicides are up by COVID because of COVID-19. These are both, both true, but are not the full extent of the problem. 
In a letter this week, I'm sorry, and while COVID-19 may have play, played a role in the increase in homicides in 2020, the data shows that homicides in Philadelphia were increasing in the years before the pandemic, while almost all other major cities were seeing declines. And that is shown here, that Philadelphia on a per capita basis has the highest per capita homicide rate. And the homicide rate had been increasing for the years leading up to the pandemic, while almost all of them were declining. In a letter this week, detailing why they thought a gun violence emergency declaration was unwarranted. The Kenny administration all but said they think they are doing all that they can. They think they are doing all that they can to stop this violence. I cannot accept that. The people of our city cannot accept that. Too many Philadelphians are dying, mostly young black boys and men and mostly by gunfire. I'm heartbroken for the families. I'm outraged that our residents have to live in this fear every day. And I'm devastated at the loss of life and potential of our people in our city. And I'm angry that our continued calls for action on this issue for a better coordinated response, for details, for progress, is shouted down as political grandstanding. We need to do everything in our power to combat this violence because our city, our kids deserve that. We have to solve it and we can. That is why we are all here today. We are here to demand specific actions from the Kenny administration. Enough is enough. We want more from the mayor and his administration, not more of the same. We need to end the violence. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the third district. Um, thank you, Controller Reinhardt, um, for those remarks and for your partnership in addressing this absolutely vital issue for our city. And thank you to all of my council colleagues, um, West Philly state reps, and the community advocates who are here with us today. I am so grateful to stand as a united front with you all to fight for the safety of our people and for peace on our streets. I wanted to become a council member because I believe deep, deeply that our city government has the power and the responsibility to build equitable communities. That means that residents across Philadelphia are entitled to a high quality of life in safe, amenity-rich neighborhoods where people can thrive. I didn't come into this role expecting gun violence to become my primary focus. But considering the tragic toll that this epidemic has taken on my district and what the day-to-day -day reality has become for my constituents over the last year, in my eyes, there is no hope for equity in this city if we don't tackle our gun violence crisis head on. I want to talk a bit about um, the, the location that we're in right now and the week that we've had here in West Philly. This past Saturday, not far from where we stand, a one-year-old baby was struck by a gunshot while in his mother's arms as she shopped for groceries. It wasn't even 8 p.m. Since then, there was a triple shooting at 53rd and Market, a triple shooting in King Sessing, a triple shooting in Mill Creek, a shooting where a pregnant woman was shot three times and thank God is expected to survive, and just yesterday afternoon, a shooting in Council Member Jones's district where two of my constituents, aged 15 and 18, were killed. We cannot accept a reality in which some people in this city have the privilege to feel safe leaving their homes, but others don't. We cannot accept a reality in which we are losing children, over 30 of them this year to date, to senseless violence. We cannot accept a reality in which black and brown people are getting traumatized and terrorized on a daily basis, 
even if they aren't directly victimized. And we cannot accept a reality in which making this madness stop is not the absolute number one top priority for each and every leader in our city government. And so that is why we are here today demanding that Mayor Kenny step up and act. All this week, we've been hearing about how the mayor doesn't want to declare gun violence an emergency. And you know what? Fine. Fine, call it whatever you want. All I care is that you do more. Today, in partnership with the controller, we sent a detailed description to Mayor Kenny of exactly what more looks like. We are calling for eight specific action items regarding the 14 zip codes most impacted by violence. More means training the attention and resources of the city's operating departments towards the parts of our city that are experiencing the most gun violence. Rec center programming and extended hours, trauma services from DBH IDS, workforce development programs from the Commerce Department, these are all um, examples. More means establishing an emergency response team within the mayor's administration that meets daily, not weekly, to coordinate efforts between agencies and carry out strategies to address hotspots. More means outreach workers blanketing our neighborhoods to head off conflicts before they turn into shootings. More means rising up to meet this unprecedented moment in our city's history with increased coordination, transparency, and resources every single day. This has never been about semantics. This has always been about action. The citizens of Philadelphia and all of us who stand here today deserve to know exactly what is being done to bring peace and calm back to our streets. We've requested a detailed plan along with a timeline for implementation of the action steps we laid out by July 30th. Our community members cannot wait any longer. They are crying out for help. Some of them are literally putting their bodies on the line. I'm honored to have Jamal Johnson joining us today. He held a hunger strike on the steps of City Hall for 26 days just to get the mayor to pay attention to our work. And I also want to acknowledge Movita Johnson Harrell, who has gone through more pain and trauma than any mother should ever have to endure. Movita lost two sons to gun violence, one as recently as this year but somehow she still finds the strength to get up every single day and fight for a future where no one has to suffer like she and her family have. And now with violence on track to reach levels we've never seen before in this city, we as leaders have to step up and meet their energy. Because every day that we don't means more unnecessary pain, suffering and injustice in our black and brown communities. Thank you. Council member. Good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank Controller Reinhardt and my colleague and the district council member for this area, Council Member Gaudier, for convening us this morning and for your ongoing dedication and commitment to addressing gun violence. I want to begin by offering my sincere condolences to the family members and friends of the more than 312 Philadelphians we have lost this year. I too have lost a family member to gun violence. My cousin was senselessly gunned down on the steps of his home two weeks after we were inaugurated into Philadelphia City Council. So I share your pain, I share your anger, and I share your resolve to do all that we can to prevent the senseless loss of life in our communities. I want to thank my colleagues in council led by our council president and longtime gun violence advocate council member Kenyatta Johnson for doing the hard but necessary work to ensure we are providing a significant investment in anti-violence this year for our budget. But now it's time to do the work. 
It is not enough to allocate resources. The money has to be spent. And I want to be clear, we want to work with the administration to ensure that we are being strategic and collaborative and that every arm of this government is working toward eliminating gun violence. But I stand here today not just as a member of Philadelphia City Council, but as a mother, a black mother of three black children, including a four-year-old black boy. And I don't know about you, but seeing the impact this crisis is having on our children, especially seeing a video of a one-year-old shot in his mother's arms, those are some of the lowest moments I've had as a member of city council and as a lifelong Philadelphian. So there is nothing more urgent than stopping the bloodshed that we are continuing to see plague our communities each and every day. And if everything is being done, then we wouldn't be seeing five people shot on average every day. We wouldn't have the highest number of shootings than any of our peer cities in the country. Think about that than any other city in the country. We wouldn't see 10,000 people shot in the last five and a half years. These shootings are not isolated incidents that have no impact going further. They create trauma for families, for friends, for neighbors, for communities, for the rest of their lives. The longer this crisis continues unchecked, the more harm we are inflicting on ourselves and our communities in the future. We all have worked in our respective roles to make change. We've held hearings, we've passed legislation, we've allocated resources, we track data, we've engaged with the community, and we will not stop doing any of those things. But today we are here to announce specific recommendations and to say we need more from the administration. We need coordinated and collaborative work from city agencies that prioritize these investments in our communities. As Councilmember Gaudier has stated, the call to issue an emergency was not symbolic. We are prepared to do work with the mayor on how to issue an emergency that can work to help us achieve our goals. And I remember waking up that morning after seeing the one-year-old that was shot right here in this community, and I went back and I read every emergency declaration since the Home Rule Charter was instituted back in the 1950s. So we have already drafted an emergency declaration that can be signed today, today. The rise in gun violence may be happening across the country, but we don't have to accept that here in our city. If we wanna call ourselves leaders, we cannot shrug and say our hands are tied or that this is just a trend. We must use the power and the authority we have to make a difference in our communities. No amount of effort is enough until our neighbors feel safe on these streets again. Thank you so very, very much. Yes, please. Uh, first, I would like to thank Council Member Jamie Gautier for convening this wonderful group of courageous elected officials and community leaders like Jamal Johnson. You're marching soon, aren't you? Yes, sir. All this night. You got a spot for me? Yes, sir. All right. And Movita Johnson Harrell, whom I've known for such a long time and is so courageous. And also people within my office, like the Reverend Myra Maxwell, who is with me here. I'm joined by her, and she is the director of the DAO's CARES program, which stands for Crisis Assistance Response and Engagement for Survivors. This is the group that provides very serious support for the families of homicide victims in the first 45 days after they suffer their loss. Reverend Maxwell and her dedicated team are all co-victims of homicide and they provide compassionate crisis support in the immediate aftermath of every homicide in the city, including the three teenagers who were shot yesterday at 209, uh, 200 North 56th Street, two of whom lost their lives, one of whom is a friend of her grandson. That is tough duty. That's a hard thing to do. And in the same way you are seeing community leaders, my fellow elected officials come up here and have a tough time emotionally talking about this. Can you imagine what that must feel like when you are talking directly to the people who have been traumatized 
by this kind of experience. I agree with Councilmember Gautier. I agree with the community. I agree with my fellow elected officials who are here. Time is now for a truly collaborative and intentional approach to reducing the number of shootings and gun-related homicides in our cities. All city agencies must work together. My front door is open. My side door is open. Our door is open. My hand is extended. Take my hand. We want to work with anybody and everybody who wants to work with us so that we can go at the problem and we can do something about it. There are just too many babies, too many teenagers, too many women, too many young men becoming victims of senseless gun violence. So what are the solutions? Well, you've heard a lot of great ones today. I'm just gonna touch on a few and I'm gonna get out of the way so Council Member Gim can step up and she can say some things that I know will be directly on point. But they are solutions that go to both enforcement and prevention. There are solutions we haven't used. We have had eight consecutive years, essentially eight consecutive years of increases in homicides in the city of Philadelphia. And yes, there's no question. We have a national phenomenon during this, this pandemic affecting many big cities, but this city is worse. And this city has been worse my entire career in criminal justice, which is 33 years. It has been more broke. It has made terrible decisions and it has been worse at gun homicides for my entire career than other big cities. So what are some of the solutions in addition to the ones my fellow elected officials have stated? Well, in terms of enforcement, forensics, it is a joke that this city won't drop five million in one year and a couple million a year after that to do the kind of forensics that could increase a solve rate in the city. You know what our solve rate is for shootings? 20% for non-fatal shootings, and that's before the pandemic. That went down during the pandemic. You know what our solve rate is? So you've been listening in to this press conference out of Philadelphia. We've heard from local lawmakers, also community leaders speaking out about a recent surge in crime. I just popped in, though, at uh, the bottom right-hand corner, Attorney General Merrick Garland making his way to several cities to address gun violence. Looks like he's visiting a little baseball team here. We're going to listen in just down on the ground for a moment here of the Attorney General. And amongst our other, our coaches here, Coaches work today.
So we just wanted to uh, show you a portion of this event here. Attorney General Merrick Garland making his way across the country to several cities that have seen a surge in crime in recent weeks. We were just showing you that event out of uh, Philadelphia with several community members who are calling on changes when it comes to gun legislation. And we know that uh, Merrick Garland is taking some initiatives when it comes to programs to kickstart that uh, against gun trafficking specifically. That's what his focus has been on today. He spoke with uh, some Chicago police officers about, about what their technology looks like and addressing crimes when they happen in real time, visiting some of those 911 call centers. So as this shot kind of moves around a little bit and they follow Garland, we're going to move away from it, go back out to uh, some of that event in Philadelphia earlier today. Thanks for watching. Live now from Fox, uh, we're going to go out to Philadelphia and then more to come here throughout the night. Until it breaks. We have to do something about that. We have to end cash bail. Ending cash bail doesn't just get broke people on, on simple cases where they've done nothing serious out. Ending cash bail keeps really dangerous people in custody. And that's not happening right now. It is not happening right now. We're seeing bails that are allowing people with resources to get out no matter what they do. We have to look to best practices around the country because some things work. Cure violence which is a non-law enforcement-led system of intervening in beefs. Cure violence works. It works. Put your money in something that works. What they're doing in L.A. with GRYD works. What they've done in certain neighborhoods in Chicago works. We have to move forward. We have to move in modern ways. And what that means is we don't repeat the mistakes that have passed. So when somebody wants to tell you mandatory sentencing, well, that's a solution. Let me tell you what mandatory sentencing did. It impoverished Philadelphia. It made people broke, which causes crime. Let me tell you what else mandatory sentencing did. It discriminated against black people. And discrimination against black people increases crime. It disqualifies them from participating in the economy. Because of that incarceration, we cannot go backward. I will not go backward. We have to move forward in ways that are actually going to help. We will not repeat the mass incarcerationist, racist, anti-poor mistakes of the past with our policies. And let me just say this, we gotta move that money. This city has never properly invested in prevention. A lot of these elected officials and community members here have succeeded for the first time I can remember in getting a serious investment in, in prevention. And no, it's not actually 155 million new dollars, it's 68 million new dollars. And the rest of them are dressed up as new dollars. But at, but at least we got 68 million new dollars. The communi community said, give me 100. And government responded, we got 68. Well, it doesn't do any good unless you move the money. You got to move the money. We are in the middle of the heat of summer. We're in the seasonal high for violent crime every single year. Move the money and don't move it from the, to the same people who may not have gotten the job done in the past. Move it to some new people. My office has obviously a tiny budget compared to the city's budget, but it includes a certain amount of money that has been taken from drug dealers and has been taken from other people who are engaging in criminal behavior. It's forfeiture money and it's money that was taken the right way. 
You want to know how to give money away? You give it away. So what have we done? We have given grants between ten and thirty-five thousand dollars to several different community-based organizations doing the work on the street in ways that prevent crime. We've given it to the Institute for the Development of African American Youth, Power of Paint, the Mighty Writers, the Kensington Soccer Club, the Jarrell CA Foundation, Potter's House Mission, Savage Sisters, Give and Go Athletics, Sakor Incorporated, Camp Jameson, Black Girls in Sports Foundation, CB Community Schools, and that's only about 240 grand. We got another 760 to go just this year. It's not that hard. You take applications, you read the applications, you vet the applications, and then you give the money away. And then good things happen. This is how you build a healthy society. This is how you build the beloved society. I'll let Reverend Holston talk about that. This is how you build what we want Philadelphia to be. So let me just say this. I, I am here with my arms and hands extended. All my doors are open. Come on now. We can do this together. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for letting me march with you even though I got a foot problem. Thank you for that. We can do this. And the other thing that you can do right now is any nonprofit in this city that feels the work they do is going to benefit us in reducing gun violence, reducing crime, you can apply to the Philadelphia Foundation at this email, grantmakingservices at philafound, P-H-I-L-A-F-O-U-N-D.org. We're giving more money out shortly after Labor Day, but we need to hear from these organizations or we have no way to do it. I just want to thank you once again for, for giving me the opportunity to be here. I must leave, but I must leave only because we have a very, very important related issue, which is that somebody is trying to get the city of Philadelphia to take peanuts for an opioid epidemic when a lot of this gun violence is in fact related to illegal drug dealing and that illegal drug dealing is in fact related to giant pharmaceutical companies that have poisoned the city and now don't want to pay and they're going to need to pay so I will be spending today filing certain legal motions we'll talk about that and in a press conference because this country and this city are not going to get ripped off like they got ripped off by that tobacco settlement. We are going to fight for Philly. We're going to stand up for Philly. Thank you once again for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I am proud to be here with my colleague, um, Council Member Gautier, with my council colleagues, um, and with other elected officials. We fought like hell uh, to get to re to reconstruct uh, the city budget so that it would prioritize the needs of communities, the needs of our young people, the needs of women, of family members, and of uh, community members who have been all across the city uh, for years demanding reinvestments in communities. I am going to be brief, but I am not going to be polite. And the reason is, is because I am outraged that the mayor would say that this conversation is about semantics. This is absolutely not about a war of words. We are here because the mayor has no coordinated plan to deal with gun violence. I'm gonna be very specific about one area that we invested a tremendous amount of time in over the past year, and that is how we treat our young people across the city of Philadelphia. Since 2020, more than 830 children have been shot in the city of Philadelphia, and half of them come out of just 25 schools in this city. We have made that clear to the mayor. And what have we gotten in return? Where are those schools right now? This school board and the mayor's administration has been caught off guard because they don't even know about bell schedules. In less than four weeks, school starts, 40,000 teenagers will be on our streets one hour earlier with no plan for coordinated after school, for programming, for employment, and for discussion. That is not somebody who is taking gun violence seriously. When we came into this summer, Every single summer, we know what happens with young people. We know we need these young people's programs to be ramped up in every single high-impacted neighborhood. This mayor has treated gun violence like it is evenly spread across the city, and that is not what is happening. 14 zip codes, 25 schools, we want a plan. 
We want mental health supports. We want youth programming. I want guaranteed employment for these young people. Tell me why we can't promise that. That is why we fought so hard to get that money. It is now in the mayor's court, but we will not be quiet. We will not be silent. You don't want to declare gun violence a citywide emergency. We will make it an emergency for this administration. It is outrageous that principals, that, uh, at that educational leaders have no idea what to tell their students the day after children are shot who attend their own school. They don't have a response from city agencies. They don't get information from the police department. We do not have a coordinated plan. This is not impossible. Cities across the nation are dealing with this and Philadelphia will not be left behind. We will become a leader. We have a roadmap on how to do this. I want to thank Council Member Gautier. I want to thank our controller and the, all the elected officials who are deeply committed to this. But in four weeks, school starts. Our young people deserve better than what this city is giving them. And we are going to continue to fight like hell for them. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm already just moved by my colleagues that came before um, and just this issue as a whole and how it not just affects me as an elected official, but as a mother and a community leader, um, it's real. And it's already been an emergency. You know, we have been fighting to make this crisis an emergency two years now. We've been talking about what's in place for our kids every summer before summer hits. We've been talking about what's available for our children after school every year since I've been doing this work. I came into this work as an education activist, and it's real. I also want to touch on the realness of a couple folks said, you know, my child is 275 victim or the reality for me is I always say, I can't remember names. Names hurt too bad. I refuse to put a number on our kids because they're our babies. But the reality is that if we do not make this emergency, our village is dying. Our village is dying. I'm a mother of five daughters. And I just spoke to these two mothers back here behind me. It's like I refuse to become close to the people that my kids bring around because every phone call that I get just Saturday G Lamar called I wait for the phone call after the call so folks that don't understand how it works as an elected official you get a, a phone call about mass shootings or death of a child or a, a ch child shooting the call after that has been my cousins my friends telling me it was a loved one or that it was one of my godchildren. So the, real, the realness of this crisis, it's not just real to me, it's real to all elected officials, especially when you, I live in my one for oh. That's one of the zip codes. When they say names and corners on the news, I wait for the picture or I wait for my kids to come and tell me, Mom, it was, whatever the name is. So this state of emergency that we need to call yes. is to save our babies. When I think about the level of trauma that I feel as an elected official and as a mother and had out trickles down to my kids and my grandkids. It's real. And I'm not really in the streets. I'm not, you know, directly impacted or whatever words that people want to use. Someone talked about semantics, but I am. Because if I'm traumatized, and I want to know who else is traumatized out here about the number of killings and murders and shootings and the safety in our community. I need to raise your hand. So if we don't make this an emergency 
to address the trauma in this city, it's going to be more blood on our hands. The blood on the hands of the mayor, blood on the hands of the elected official, even us that's standing out here fighting. I cannot say that I'm an elected official and I can move, help move money and write legislation and in good faith saying that I can't, I'm, not, I'm doing all that I can do because there is more. Yeah. Councilmember Gautier and uh, Controller Reinhardt gave a list of what more could look like. I don't give a damn about semantics. I give a damn about my kids. I give a damn about your kids. And I give a damn about the future of Philadelphia. And if we don't step up now, I'm talking about now, it's, the blood is on our hands. Adults, all of us adults, community members, the media, it's our responsibility to save this next generation of Philadelphians. And it's all hands on deck. I'm sick of crying. This is a fight. Those are from the tree. You know, when the tears fall, that means the fists go up. We got to fight. We got to fight for our kids. And I want to stay for so much more. But right now, my staff is in a retreat fighting on what we're going to do for next year. But I had to come stand with Jamie. I had to come stand with Rebecca and the rest of my colleagues to let the mayor's office know that this is serious for us. And we're going to fight for what we need for our communities. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Councilmember Thomas, and um, I want to thank all of my colleagues for being here today, uh, our district attorney, as well as our state legislators. But I, I do want to give a special thank you to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Gaudier. And, um, you know, I, I'll say for her what she probably wouldn't say uh, for herself. This is not the way Councilmember Gaudier wanted to go about this. Uh, Councilmember Gaudier um, had been working uh, for some time to come back to the table to figure out how can we negotiate behind the scenes and put us in a position where we can see more of an immediate response. We did vote for a, a significant amount of money to be allocated to gun violence, not just on the city level, but on the state level. But look, uh, let's be honest, we, we, we're not naive enough to think that those dollars are going to be here to do something right now, to do something today. Anybody knows who knows how the budget works, you knows that once, once we vote on the budget, it takes time for those dollars to be allocated. A lot of these organizations won't get that money this summer. But those of us who know how this city works, right? I've been here all my life, 37 years. We know whether it's a good day or a bad day, whether it's a good year or a bad year, the summertime is where we always see an increase of crime, right? Like that's just part of the Philly DNA. That's an unfortunate side of the city of brotherly love. So the summer didn't creep up on us. Right? It starts the same time, every single year. We knew that the summer was coming, and for us to be as unprepared as we are, well, what is council members supposed to do? So I appreciate you for trying to go about it the right way, but it forced, we're forced to be here to do it like this because the message just isn't resonating. So, so with that being said, again, I think that it's important to recognize when we talk about this idea of semantics, right? Philadelphia is lawless right now. People have the perception that you could do anything you want to do in Philadelphia and get away with it. So we need semantics because semantics changes perception. We have a perception issue that we have in the city right now. And it's not just criminals. It's the working man. It's the entrepreneur. Every single day, every single day, I hear a story or a narrative about a business or a young professional who is trying to leave the city of Philadelphia. I still coach high school basketball, and if you like really coach high school basketball, it's not like a season thing. It's like all year round. All right, so we want to just step into uh, this. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, some of these other stories we have to get to yet uh, on this Thursday night. I'm Andrew Kraft. This is Live Now from Fox. Thank you for being with us and for choosing Live Now as your go-to source for live, raw, and unfiltered feeds and events uh, from around the country and around the world. We're going to take just a very quick two-minute commercial break. When we come back, uh, a lot in store, what President Biden was up to today, some news on Capitol Hill. Uh, also, obviously, we're gearing up for the Olympic Games, the opening ceremony to kick off tomorrow there in Tokyo. The White House 
is already getting ready as well. You can see that uh, the White House is lit up in Team USA colors, the red, white, and the blue there in the front. And so uh, we'll leave you with that. We'll be back in two minutes here on Live Now. Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. You can just see uh, the White House at this hour, almost 9 p.m. Eastern there. They're getting ready for the Olympic Games, kicking off tomorrow there in Tokyo, Japan. The First Lady representing the U.S. delegation will have more on that story uh, a little bit later in this hour. But we want to stay in Washington, D.C. And, and give you an update on what the Biden administration was up to today. He signed into a law, a bipartisan bill, that would ensure new funding for the Crime Victims Fund, the bill passing unanimously in the Senate. The fund had been depleted in recent years, and the president says the pandemic made getting victims help more difficult and more dangerous. We want to show you some of uh, the president's remarks, along with the vice president at this bill signing today in the East Room of the White House. In that other office I work in, Pat, and I apologize for keeping you waiting because I know you're all equally as busy as I am. I want to thank you. Today, uh, I think, is a day of hope. And I mean that, a day of hope and healing for victims of crime and organizations that support those victims of crime. And I want to thank uh, the Vice President uh, and the Second Gentleman, Senators uh, Durbin. I think he's here. I thought I saw him. Senator Durbin and Baldwin and Grassley and Graham and Murkowski, Representatives Nadler and Fitzpatrick and Jackson Lee and Wagner and Scanlon, and everyone uh, who has helped make possible this moment, including so many of you who are here today that I haven't mentioned. Uh, when someone commits a crime, it's, uh, it's not enough to bring the predator to justice. We also uh, need uh, to support the victims. And it's something that uh, way back 150 years ago when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, we spent a lot of time working on and setting up victims' funds. What, uh, that's what this Crime Victims Fund does. In many years of working on the issue, I've visited an awful lot of domestic violence shelters. 
Every time I go into a city, I quietly, before I went to where I was supposed to be, quietly slip in and spend time in the domestic violence shelter to speak to the people giving the services and people getting the services. And, uh, you know, many times the body language that you'd see when you walked in was one of the victims of crime uh, find themselves almost curled up uh, Diane in a ball. They were still suffering from a serious, serious, not only physical abuse they received, but quite frankly, uh, the emotional abuse. And you can see the pain. You can see the pain was still with them. And you wondered, when was this going to uh, abate, no matter what we did? According to the CDC, and I'm, I think uh, uh, Senator Feinstein remembers, I got in trouble because when I was pushing the legislation, way back in those days, I said, I'm convinced that women who are victims of domestic violence suffer from post-traumatic stress no different than a soldier being shot at regularly. You come home and uh, every time your significant other would come home, if dinner wasn't ready and he smashed your head against the wall, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no difference in being shot at. And uh, the, CDC, the CDC, two years later, came out and said survivors can experience mental health problems and uh, such depression and uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress syndrome. Even before research confirmed it, you could see it. And there are economic costs for survivors as well. Medical costs, lost productivity from work, and navigating the court system. That's why Victims' Compensation Program helped victims and their families cover the costs they've suffered from the crime. They can. There can be counseling and medical bills, lost wages because you couldn't work, paying for temporary housing for a family fleeing abuse, even fixing a broken door kicked down by an abuser. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of children out in the street are the children who are, in fact, the children of abused women. It can also be a long-term support survivors need to heal every time in every single sense of the word. In 2019, these victims' compensation funds went directly to 230,000 victims. 230,000. These funds also got to states, territories, and tribes to support thousands of victim service organizations. And these organizations have provided services and support to over 13 million survivors. And by the way, last night, some of you heard me talk about the need for more policing that understands the need for communities and citizens. These funds are also go to law enforcement agencies to support training on how to respond to victims who have experienced trauma. In 1984, I was proud to support the, the passage of the Victims of Crime Act and created, that created this fund. I'm also proud to sign the law that significantly strengthens it today. This fund doesn't take a dime of taxpayers' money. It uses fines and penalties paid by convicted federal criminals. However, fines from what are called non-prosecutorial agreements or, or defendant or deferred prosecution agreements did not go into this Victims' Crimes Fund in the past. Since there has been more and more of these agreements in recent years, the fund is being depleted. That meant dramatic cuts in the funding it could provide for victims and for organizations to support these victims. Between 2017 and today, the amount of money in these funds has gone down 92 percent, which has resulted in a 70 percent reduction in victims assistance programs and grants. This means that for a lot of victims, uh, the help they need isn't there any longer. When my son, Bo, was the Attorney General of the State of Delaware, he took pride in getting more support more quickly to victims, especially to protect and care for child victims. And I know uh, that as a San Francisco DA and a California Attorney General, Vice President Harris uh, expanded support for victims of crime and launched one of the nation's first medical centers focused on treating childhood trauma caused by violence in a home or in a community. This bill is going to allow us to make, uh, make sure that all the fines and penalties <clears throat> that are from federal cases go into the victims, the Crime Victims Fund, to rebuild this fund, because it's badly needed. This is going to enable us to provide more help and support to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, 
child abuse, trafficking, and other crimes all across America. In order to provide more access and safety and services for victims of gender-based violence, it's long past time to re reauthorize and strengthen the protections through the Violence Against Women Act. Please, please. You know, you can... All right, we're going to move into uh, some breaking news we're getting out of Washington, D.C. This is live at the moment. You can see a heavy police presence. This is on 14th Street and R Street, if you're familiar with the D.C. metropolitan area. That is a very, very busy uh, area of D.C. Lots of popular restaurants uh, and shops there. Uh, but we're now learning that two adult males were shot in this vicinity and possibly a drive-by shooting. Uh, but police right now according to them, confirmed two adult males shot. Uh, both are conscious and, and breathing. And right now, we don't know if they were targeted or if they were just unfortunate uh, bystanders uh, to what is uh, being described as a possible uh, drive-by shooting. But this shot just came to us from Fox 5 in D.C., our affiliate on the ground there. And this, uh, for those of you uh, who are familiar with D.C., who might be watching or who have lived in the district, this is a very, very active, popular uh, street, 14th Street in Washington. It has a lot of popular restaurants, uh, shopping. You see there's a West Elm there uh, in the frame. This is also by the very kind of uh, ritzy uh, uh, restaurant, uh, Le Diplomat, uh, that a lot of you know, politicians frequent. So right now we're just getting this ground shot, live look. Uh, we don't have too much information at the moment, but we wanted to bring you uh, the first live look that we are getting here uh, because there had been reports uh, on Twitter that uh, a suspect was shooting from some type of car while driving, and that according to witnesses on the ground, people on the ground were receiving medical attention. Uh, that is coming from a Huffington Post reporter who was in the vicinity at the time tweeting that. That's a, a solid source. And so right now, um, it does look like police have confirmed two adult males were shot. And so uh, it remains to be seen on if we'll get uh, a possible you know, press conference or, or police update from them. But this is, a, like I said, a very popular area with, uh, you know, young D.C. residents, uh, a lot of uh, really hip, uh, fun restaurants in the area, a lot of shopping. Uh, and so from someone, uh, myself, who used to live in Washington, uh, very, very close to home uh, for some of these D.C. residents, it's been quite a summer uh, of violence, not only in the district, but in large cities across the country. And there you can see people kind of milling about, gathering around, trying to figure out what exactly happened. And we earlier saw police uh, on the ground investigating, uh, possibly you know tagging bullet casings and shells that were left on the ground. You can see the police tape set up. But this is a massive response uh, for, like I've said before, a very busy area in the nation's capital. Uh, so we're going to uh, 
move on from this story until we get more information. We're going to keep this shot up, though, uh, just so you can kind of witness and observe how police uh, do their investigation. Uh, and so we're going to go back into uh, some of President Biden's remarks from earlier uh, as he signed into law a bipartisan bill that would ensure new funding for the Crime Victims Fund, the bill passing unanimously in the Senate. Uh, the fund had been depleted in recent years, and the president says the pandemic made getting victims help more difficult and more dangerous. Back out to President Biden at the White House from earlier. In a bipartisan, bicameral way, and to pass this bill, we need to do the same thing to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act without further delay. You know, uh, after uh, these changes in the Victims' Crime Act passed this week, a leader from one of the states, states' coalition against domestic violence sent a letter to our national organization. And she wrote about working in a shelter where their ability to serve people rose and fell based on the fundings of victim services. She told the story of a client she lost to domestic violence homicide because the budget cuts left them without space at the shelter or staff needed to help this particular woman. Upon learning about the law I'm about to sign today, she wrote, and I quote, I quote, I think about her every day. This is going to be truly life-saving, end of quote. This is what you've done, truly life-saving. In closing, I want to thank those angels working in the front lines to help these victims, especially during this pandemic. It's made the work both more difficult, more in demand, and more dangerous. And I want to thank the advocates uh, who mobilize and bring together these important changes in the law. There are thousands of people out there who may not know about the work you did to get this bill passed, but they'll know that they're getting the help they need to put their lives back together and move toward healing and toward justice. I will now have the great honor of signing the bill, and I'd invite the sponsors to come on up and stand with me, if you're willing. Obama and use nine pens to do it, <laughs> but I'm going to turn, I'm just going to hand you all. <laughs> and you're not going to know which one was signed. Let me get the rest of them. Shall I be polite or grand? No, grand. No, 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 no. You, you better. You want it handed to you by the president. If we're sure of any. Somebody back here, Mr. President. We got two more. I'll get one later. <laughs> no, no, no. I think they. We should have one. Do we have. And who doesn't have one? He's got one in his pocket. I don't know. I got one in my pocket. We've got one in his pocket. You can read your name back uh, <laughs> Anybody doesn't have one, I promise you. Me. you. I gave them away. <laughs> Hey, Steven, you have one of my pens? <laughs> Come here. There's one coming. So we're just going to move on uh, from this story there, the president signing that bill, joined by uh, a number of uh, bipartisan group of senators there. You can see Senator Feinstein, the vice president, Representative Jerry Nadler, Senator Cornyn, Senator Klobuchar, uh, this is uh, quite the group of lawmakers joining today for this event in the East Room at the White House. New funding for the Crime Victims Fund. So we want to move on from that story. We're still monitoring the situation outside of Washington. 
or excuse me, inside of Washington, D.C. Uh, this is on 14th and R Street in the nation's capital. If you're familiar with this area, this is a very popular, busy area for D.C. residents, D.C. tourists as well, visiting lots of popular restaurants and shops. Uh, police uh, apparently confirmed that two adult males were shot tonight uh, in a possible drive-by shooting. And so right now, this uh, very, very heavy police response trying to investigate exactly what happened. You see the police tape up. Uh, it's about 9.15 there on this Thursday night. Many people would no doubt be out having dinner almost the weekend. And so very scary situation as uh, we've been reporting many of these cities around the country have seen an uptick in violence, especially gun violence this summer post pandemic. And so we'll be monitoring this shot here uh, for the remainder of the night. Uh, while we have it. But uh, in the meantime, we do want to take just a quick two-minute commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be talking about uh, a lot of news on Capitol Hill, especially regarding the infrastructure negotiations. Seems like they have reached, uh, unfortunately, an impasse in those negotiations. We'll have more on that in two minutes. Thanks for being with us. All right, welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. Uh, we are still monitoring this situation uh, in Washington, D.C. after reports of uh, two adult males shot in this area in a possible drive-by shooting. We'll have hopefully a police update, maybe a press conference on that uh, in the uh, hours to come here on this Thursday night. I want to move on to some of the news that we are going to be focusing on uh, on Capitol Hill at the moment because uh, a lot of news uh, in the House and the Senate. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure deal suffered a setback yesterday after the Senate blocked a procedural uh, vote to advance it. But the group of senators working on the bill are still moving forward, saying that they could even put it up for another vote as early as Monday. Fox News correspondent Madeline Rivera is in Washington with the latest on where both sides stand. Negotiations for the $1.2 trillion infrastructure package are chugging along, even as the details remain in flux. We're looking for this bipartisan effort to get this infrastructure bill passed. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer adamant, though, that the Senate pass the bill before August recess. I laid out that precise schedule at the end of June, and I intend to stick with it. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi talking tough on Thursday. Repeating the fate of the bipartisan infrastructure bill in the House depends on whether the Senate takes up the larger human infrastructure package. We will not be taking it up until the Senate passes the reconciliation bill. The White House believes infrastructure talks are gaining momentum. We're very close to a point where there's going to be a vote. The administration is citing a new report from the International Monetary Fund, which states the new administration's policies have put the U.S. economy on a strong footing as another reason to pump trillions of dollars more in investments to sustain the country's growth. A move Republicans call a mistake as prices soar in almost every sector, from clothing to used cars. It's like they have systematically identified the worst idea for American families on every single issue 
and set about rolling them into one huge, reckless proposal. Though the president points to economic growth as an incentive for infrastructure investments, a new report from the Labor Department shows initial jobless claims jumped to 419,000 last week, up 51,000 from the week before, suggesting that the country's rebound in the jobs market may be slower than expected. In Washington, Mother Rivera, Fox News. Madeline, thanks so much for that update there. What we want to do now is show you uh, some of the remarks on the Senate floor from Senate uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer as well as Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell talking about uh, what Madeline was saying, the infrastructure impasse uh, so far in the Senate at this hour. So we'll hear first from Senator Schumer, then from Senator McConnell while we're still updating and monitoring uh, this shooting that happened in Washington, D.C. tonight. We're going to put those both on the screen for you here. Last night, Madam President, the Senate took a vote on whether to proceed to a debate on infrastructure. Unfortunately, our Republican colleagues blocked the Senate from taking this first entirely procedural step. I understand that the effort to finish the text of the bipartisan bill has progressed since I announced the, this vote last week. The negotiators have made significant progress, but there are still some outstanding issues. Therefore, at the end of the vote yesterday, I changed my response to a no so that I may move to reconsider the vote at a future time. <clears throat> my colleagues on both sides should be assured. As Majority Leader, I have every intention of passing both major... <clears throat> excuse me. My colleagues on both sides of the aisle should be assured. As Majority Leader, I have every intention of passing both major infrastructure packages the bipartisan infrastructure framework, and a budget resolution with reconciliation instructions before we leave for the August recess. I laid out that precise schedule at the end of June, and I intend to stick with it. A new report by the chief economist at Moody's, Mark Zandi, hardly a liberal economist, someone who actually served as an economic advisor to Senator McCain, concluded that both major infrastructure proposals are essential to maximize our economic potential. Not just one, both. And together, they would give a massive boost to the economy, ease inflation pressures, create jobs, increase productivity, and reduce income inequality. These are incredibly worthy goals, and the Senate is going to keep working on both tracks of infrastructure in order to achieve them. Now on another matter. Today, in the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, President Biden's nominee to lead the Bureau of Land Management, Tracy Stone Manning, will receive a vote to advance her nomination to the Senate floor. While it sometimes flies under the radar, the Bureau of Land Management is responsible for overseeing nearly 250 million acres of public lands and 700 million acres of mineral rights, a vast tract of the United States of America. No agency is more important to the maintenance of public lands for public use. BLM will play a huge role, Bureau of Land Management, that is, will play a huge role in the fight against climate change as well. Over the past four years under Donald Trump, the agency abandoned its mission, shrunk public lands, targeted our national monuments, and opened up those beautiful landscapes for corporate industrial development. In short, the next leader of the Bureau of Land Management has a tall order in restoring and protecting America's public lands. Ms. Stone Manning is exceedingly qualified to take on this important job. After serving on Senator Tester's and Governor Bullock's staff, she went on to lead the environmental agency in Montana, where she was respected not only by conservationists, but by ranchers and fossil fuel interests as well. She developed a reputation as an honest broker, someone who is firm in their principles but always willing to try and build consensus. And yet, the members of the Republican minority on the committee are trying to turn this consensus-driven, well-respected nominee into another partisan flashpoint, dredging up a letter she forwarded while in graduate school and claiming it was evidence that she is, quote, an eco-terrorist. The claim is just as hysterical as it sounds. Ms. Stone Manning has the full support of the chair of the committee, the senator from West Virginia, Mr. Tester, the senator from Montana, and from me. We need someone like Ms. Stone Manning to manage our public lands, 
a staunch advocate for conservation, but also an honest broker, someone who will repair the damage of the last four years and be a faithful steward of America's national treasures, someone who understands that conservation policy has a critical role to play in the fight against climate change. Ms. Stone Manning has all of those qualities, and I, looking forward, and I look forward to moving her nomination to the Senate floor. And I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. With COVID-19 cases ticking up all across the country, with some bureaucrats and elected officials actually talking about reimposing various <clears throat> measures on the American people, the Biden administration continues to let illegal immigrants pour across our southern border. And reportedly, they are considering loosening our border security even more. Remember when the Biden campaign's rhetoric and then the Biden administration's early actions led to a rush on the border, they tried to wave it off as a seasonal springtime surge. But of course, that wasn't true. The numbers just keep climbing. Customs and Border Protection had more encounters on the southern border in June than they had in May. Nearly 190,000 encounters last month alone, the highest number in 21 years. Law enforcement is coming across huge groups of hundreds of individuals. With almost three months still remaining in fiscal year 2021, CBP has already encountered more illegal immigrants than it did in the entirety, the entirety of fiscal 2019, which was, of course, before COVID. We've exceeded that total with almost three months to go. The Biden administration claims they're addressing the crisis by simply speeding up the rate at which they get migrants out of custody out of border facilities, as if simply reducing the headcount was the goal. Of course, that's no solution at all if the individuals are simply being released into the interior of our country. Orderly legal immigration is part of the heart of the United States of America and always has been. But it simply is not a universal human right for everybody in the Western Hemisphere who would like a better job or to break our rules and turn up at the water. No country, none, no country in the world could govern itself that way. In fact, this ongoing crisis is supremely unfair and uncompassionate to the men, women, and children that it continues to entice into the scorching desert sun. Border Patrol agents are having to double as humanitarian workers and EMTs. They rescue people who get lost, who are at risk of drowning, who've been simply abandoned by smugglers or traffickers. And amidst all this, in the thick of this crisis, the Biden administration has spent weeks flirting with ending its Title 42 authority, declaring the COVID emergency to be finished and over at our southern border and letting even more people stream across. COVID is already on the rise again. The border is already in crisis, and the president and his team want to end the emergency safeguards at our border, reimpose COVID prescriptions, precautions on the American people, but end the COVID emergency for illegal immigrants? How does that make any sense? Meanwhile, our Democratic friends here on Capitol Hill say they want to push a massive amnesty plan into the reckless taxing and spending spree they want to pass later this year on a party line vote. As if damaging inflation, soaring costs, lower real wages, and more debt were not punishment enough for the American people. Democrats also want to stuff a massive amnesty plan into their tax and spend spree. It's like they have systematically identified the worst idea for American families on every single issue and set about rolling them into one huge, reckless proposal. Now, on a completely different matter, last year on a broad and bipartisan basis, Congress passed sanctions that were designed to block Russia from completing its Nord Stream 2 pipeline project. 
The Biden administration recently waived those sanctions to allow the pipeline to move forward. And now it appears <clears throat> the administration has cut a deal with Germany that will allow the pipeline to become operational. <clears throat> the initial press reporting about this deal does not inspire confidence that this administration is taking the Russian threat as seriously as it should, nor does it indicate that we're standing with our Ukrainian partners who are struggling to defend themselves against Moscow's aggression. The administration appears to have ignored the border implications of the Nord Stream 2 project and Russia's approach to Europe writ large. Green energy initiatives or promises of diplomatic meetings will not address the real risk Moscow passes. Not even close. Just a couple of years ago, Washington Democrats were absolutely melting down over their belief that the prior administration was being too soft on Russia and leaving Ukraine in the lurch. Where's the outrage today? For several years there, my colleagues across the aisle sounded like big time Russia hawks. So I hope they'll now join Republicans in pressing the administration to explain this curious decision. To explain how President Biden intends to impose meaningful costs on Moscow for all its misdeeds at the same time they have America greasing the skids, greasing the skids for this Putin pipeline. Now, one final matter. Next week, President Biden is set to meet with Prime Minister of Iraq, Mustafa al Ghanemi. The meeting comes at an important moment for our shared efforts toward peace and security in Iraq and the entire region. ISIS has been significantly weakened in Iraq and Syria after years of shared efforts. But the terrorist organization remains a grave threat. And ISIS is far from the only threat Iraqis and the Iraqi government are facing. For years, Iran has systematically sought to undermine Iraq's sovereignty. Iran's well-armed proxy militias report to Tehran, not Baghdad, but they operate inside Iraq. These groups have conducted campaigns of intimidation and assassination against peaceful protesters and independent journalists in Iraq. The same brutal methods they employ in Syria, Lebanon, and in Iran itself. <coughs> These Iranian-backed militias are also threatening our own American interest in Iraq. Iran wants to pick fights with a superpower while making the nation of Iraq bear the risk. The fact is, the U.S. is in Iraq at the invitation of their government. We're there to support the Iraqis and to help the Iraqis kill terrorists and defend their sovereignty. Our presence in Iraq also helps our operations in Syria against ISIS and al-Qaeda. Again, it's pretty obvious the terrorist threat is not over. Remember, the disastrous withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan may not simply be felt in that country. A Taliban victory and resurgence of al-Qaeda could embolden jihadists all over the world, just as the rise of ISIS did in the wake of President Obama's withdrawal from Iraq. As we watch Afghanistan descend into chaos and ISIS continue to lash out in Iraq and Syria, now is not the time for either the U.S. or Iraq to pretend that our shared mission is over. As I've warned again and again, terrorists don't observe our political timetables. They don't pack up just because we lose faith or lose focus. So let's hope this administration is already learning from their mistakes in Afghanistan. When the Iraqi prime minister visits next week, the White House should provide strong assurances that the U.S. will stand strong with our friends and continue to support our partners who are standing up to terror and to extremism. If parents All right, so there you heard from uh, the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, talking on the floor earlier today about a number of different foreign policy issues uh, as well as the uh, infrastructure deal. Uh, and so you heard there he was talking about Ukraine, he was talking about Iraq as well. We know 
that the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, will visit the White House at the end of August. And he was also really railing against the Biden administration uh, about this Nord Stream 2 pipeline between Germany uh, and Russia. And so uh, a lot of Republicans going after the Biden administration on that front uh, as well. We want to just show you once again uh, the live pictures we're getting out of Washington, D.C. at this hour because we're monitoring all the latest uh, and developments uh, on this shooting that took place earlier this evening. You can see there investigators are on the scene tagging down you know, possible bullet casings, fragments, and the like. We were getting reports that there was a, a very, very heavy aroma uh, of uh, gun residue, gunpowder uh, in the street as well. And so right now we're getting some more word this uh, in from the D.C. Police Department's Twitter account. This was from about 20 minutes ago. They said, shooting at the intersection of 14th and Riggs Street Northwest. Lookout is for a male wearing a lime green, yellow hooded sweater fleeing in an older black Honda Civic with D.C. tags last seen eastbound towards S Street Northwest. And so at the moment, uh, you can see investigators are still uh, on the scene, combing through uh, possible evidence, interviewing witnesses. Uh, and so hopefully we'll get a little more information, some more answers uh, tonight uh, from police. Hopefully they do hold a press conference. We'll, uh, we're gonna keep coming in and out of this shot here uh, on this Thursday night. Thanks for being with us. I'm Andrew Kraft. We do want to continue on with some of this other political news. As you know, last week, the uh, child tax credits went out to millions of families uh, across the country, uh, reducing child poverty. And so uh, we want to hear from Fox 13 in Tampa as uh, American families got this tax credit uh, in their uh, you know, bank accounts or in the mail uh, very, very recently to see what the impact is having. Let's go out to Fox 13 in Tampa. as a child credit, it's legit. It's part of the president's American Rescue Plan, and they'll keep coming monthly through the end of the year. But that doesn't mean you have to accept them. Well, our consumer reporter, Sabani Banerjee, is here to explain why some families would even want to opt out of the child tax credit, as well as who's getting them now. Hi, Sabani. Yeah, hi, everyone. The next deadline to opt out of the child tax credit payments is actually coming up soon, August 2nd. I'll talk more about why you'd want to do that in a moment. But first, a reminder who's eligible for this in the first place. About 90% of families are expected to qualify for at least a partial credit, and those who are eligible will get payments every month through December. $300 a month for every child five and under, 250 a month for kids between ages 8 and 16. You'll get those payments either by paper check, direct deposit, or on one of those uh, preloaded debit cards that comes in the mail. Anyone making more than $240,000 for single taxpayers or $440,000 as joint, you are not eligible for the credit here. Well, free cash sounds great. Right. So why might some parents actually want to opt out. You know, really, this is a budgeting thing. Do you want your money later or do you need it now? It's kind of the same decision making process as choosing how much you take out of every paycheck for taxes. Are you okay with owing? Do you want to break even? Or do you want to get that refund later? Remember, these are all completely different payments than the stimulus checks that the government issued earlier in the pandemic. Those did not count as income. They did not affect future tax returns. These are advances on what would be included in your tax return in April of 2022. So the government, though, they're betting that the families, many of them probably want that money now. It's absolutely up to you, though. If you'd rather have one large payment next year instead of these seven smaller ones spanning, 2021 and 2022, then opt out. Let's say your household circumstances or your tax situation is changing, maybe a divorce or something like that, and you don't want to deal with updating info, opt out. Or if you don't want to owe back later on, let's say your household income goes up or maybe a dependent ages out in that time frame, now is your chance to say, you know what, I want that lump sum later. Well, first of all, that was a very good explainer. Thank you. And now, how does someone opt out should they want to? Okay, go to the IRS website. So that's where you get started. 
a little more detailed here, you'll see the Child Tax Credit Update Portal. It's new. You want to click on the Manage Advanced Payments button. Then on the next page, you'll be asked to sign in. And you use your IRS or ID.me account. If you don't have any of those, the page actually walks you through setting one up. You'll need an email address, photo ID, your social security number, and some sort of smartphone or tablet to verify your identity. And then on the next page, you'll see your eligibility status, and that's where you click on enroll from those monthly payments. So yeah, start out with the website, truly page by page. It walks you right through the options. Remember though, if you choose to get these payments right now, there's something to watch out for. There's no sort of processing fees for this payment. So if anybody contacts you claiming something like that, yeah, you know you're being targeted by scammers. So watch out for that. And they're everywhere these days. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Urbani. Uh, really great uh, kind of uh, info there uh, on some of uh, the child tax credit and uh, how families uh, will know if they've gotten it or how they can go about uh, requesting it and, and applying for it. Uh, and so right now we want to uh, continue with some news out of Washington, D.C. Uh, at the moment. want to show you some of the White House press briefing from earlier. We're also monitoring, uh, obviously, this scene out of Washington, D.C. at the moment where two people were shot earlier tonight uh, in a very popular, very kind of upscale uh, neighborhood in the nation's capital. This was 14th Street and R Street. Obviously, this comes uh, after yet another shooting uh, over the weekend outside the Nats game on Saturday night that sent people fleeing from the game. And so right now you're hearing a, a lot of uh, chatter on social media just about how, you know, not only does uh, some sections uh, of Washington experience this very frequently, but now uh, it seems like other areas that does not see this uh, every day are experiencing it much like these other kind of uh, more volatile sections and neighborhoods in Washington. And so many people on social media are saying a lot has to be done uh, to stem this rise in gun violence. We want to just uh, note that we got a tweet in from DC Metropolitan Police, essentially offering some type of uh, a description telling D.C. residents what to look for. I'm going to read that tweet right now. They said, a shooting at the intersection of 14th and R Street Northwest. Lookout is for a male wearing a lime green or yellow hooded sweater fleeing in an older black Honda Civic with a DC license plate headed eastbound towards S Street. The latest tweet from the DC Police Department was from five minutes ago, saying that Chief Conti is on scene at the shooting that occurred at 14th and Riggs Road Northwest and will provide a live update. Stay tuned for more. So it does look like DC Metropolitan Police Chief Conti will be providing a live update uh, we don't know when that's going to take place, but uh, we will be monitoring this shot here uh, for the duration of the night, and, and we'll bring that update to you live as it happens. In the meantime, like I said before, we do want to head out to the White House briefing from earlier today. Jen Psaki taking a number of questions from reporters, uh, but she was also joined by Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, and so we're going to listen to both of them uh, kind of take questions from reporters in the briefing room from earlier today. Okay, we have a special guest. Uh, happy to welcome back Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo. Uh, today she will be telling us about a new economic development initiative that the department is launching thanks to the American Rescue Plan. She'll take a couple of questions after that. As always, I'll be the bad cop. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Raimondo. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, as the President often says, and as we all know, uh, we're on the road to recovery. And today, with this announcement, we mark a real step forward in that recovery. Uh, as Jen just said, the President signed the American Rescue Plan into law, intended to get our country back on its feet. And thanks to that law, I'm thrilled right now to be announcing the launch of a transformative $3 billion economic development initiative that will be running out of the Department of Commerce. I'm even more excited 
to say that starting today, this afternoon, every community in America can begin applying for that funding. Uh, we believe that this is the largest local economic development initiative that the Commerce Department has ever made. And it's a testament to the President's commitment to do far more than simply recover, but to build back better and make sure every community and every American is included in our comeback. Um, everybody ought to benefit from this $3 billion initiative, from working mothers working to balance multiple jobs, to young adults looking for work, to factory workers or retail workers who lost their job in the pandemic, many of them mid-career, and they're wondering, what happens to me now? What happens to me next? These funds, this initiative, has been specifically designed to make sure that we are going to be providing high quality, real jobs for you and for your community. What we saw during the pandemic and what we all know is that some people did very well. Those who are doing well did very well. But millions of Americans continue to struggle. And it's uneven. Those who continue to struggle, uh, it's disproportionately women, people of color, communities of color, rural communities, and tribes. We know two million American women dropped out of the labor force since the start of the pandemic, mostly because of lack of affordable child care and paid leave. So ensuring that these $3 billion are distributed equity is core to our investment strategy. It, and we know that equity is good for workers, good for business, and good for the economy. As many of you know, I'm the former governor of Rhode Island, and as a governor, I saw what good paying jobs mean to American families and mean to communities. This initiative has the potential to create, we believe, 300,000 jobs in the near term, revitalize dozens of communities around America, and drive innovation in underserved communities and revitalize um, depressed economies. The good news is the Department of Commerce's Economic Development Agency has been doing this for decades. They have a track record of success. In fact, I saw that on Monday when I was in Albany, where EDA's investments over the last 10 years have helped that city and region become a global semiconductor and bioscience hub. And in fact, the employment r growth rate there has grown by 30 percent in those industries. Uh, this initiative that I'm announcing today will bring that type of transformative growth to communities all over the country. So at the end of the day, as the President has so often said, our economy can't recover until everybody in every community is included. So I'd like to briefly describe the components of this $3 billion initiative. It begins with what we're calling the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. This is a $1 billion challenge um, for up to 30 regions across the country seeking to revitalize their economies. Uh, it's designed to focus on innovation and spur projects that grow new industries and scale existing ones. Secondly, is what we're calling the Good Jobs Challenge, which allocates a half a billion dollars towards industry-led workforce training and apprenticeship programs with a particular focus on women, people of color, and underserved communities. Importantly, we have designed this so that funds can also be used um, for uh, support services like child care and transportation while folks are getting trained so we make sure they, they get to the finish line of the training and get a job. Uh, for the hard-hit hard, hard hit communities hit hardest by the loss of travel and tourism, we're providing $750 million to accelerate the recovery of travel, travel tourism, and outdoor recreation. Through the economic adjustment assistance, we're offering a half a billion dollars to hundreds of communities across the country to create new jobs, spur economic development, and put Americans back to work. Our indigenous communities commitment sets aside $100 million to meet the needs of indigenous communities with everything from broadband to health centers and more, deliberately designed to be flexible to meet the needs of the community. And finally, we're making a $300 million commitment 
to invest in economic development in coal-affected communities. Uh, we believe that this $300 million investment in coal communities is the largest economic development that EDA has ever made in coal communities, and we know that it will enable these communities to recover, diversify their economies, and grow. So these grants together reflect the values and priorities of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda, and they, alongside of the jobs plan, will accelerate America's economic recovery and help the country continue to get back to work. So spread the word. Uh, it'll be applications go live this afternoon, and we look forward to working with communities around America. Jeff. Uh, Madam Secretary, two questions. One, can you explain how people can apply for these grants? And two, on a separate topic, the Commerce Department has a uh, supply chain advisory committee. Can you give us an update on what you're doing about chips and other supply issues? Yeah, thank you. So as I said, this afternoon on the EDA website, uh, the EDA website applications will be live. Uh, so we want to get this money out the door as quickly as possible. EDA has six regional offices around the country, uh, which we will be uh, working with. But this is, I want to clarify, this money is for states, cities, counties, nonprofits, universities, uh, not for companies. So it's coalitions of nonprofits in communities specifically designed to be locally led and managed. We're doing a lot on the chip shortage. Um, uh, I am engaging almost daily with industry. Uh, we are working as hard as we can to get the House to pass the CHIPS Act or their version of USICA. That, and we're putting plans in place right now already on the team to invest the $52 billion. We need to incentivize the manufacturing of chips in America. Uh, and so we are very focused on putting the pieces in place so that can happen. With regard to the EDA grants, I understand that you're going to judge some of these by return on investment. How are you defining ROI, given that that can often exclude uh, priorities like gender and racial equality? So our number one investment priority is equity. And as our team decides which, these are, this is a competitive grant process. Uh, by the way, I think that the fact of the competition will help communities to come together as a community and, and put their best ideas forward. In order to qualify to get the money, you have to prove to us that equity, you'll have an equity lens, and whether it's job training that you're doing, you have to give, you know, I have to make sure that women, people of color, veterans, people who've been left out will um, be included in this. So it's a, it's a lens that we're going to take across the three billion. And like whoever does it the best? Correct. Exactly. Rachel? What type of, um, thank you, Madam Secretary, what type of follow-up will there be? You're emphasizing equity, but uh, will you be following up to make sure that that money is distributed fairly to the communities that you're speaking of that really do need it? Great question. So we are deeply committed for this to be transparent. Everything's going to be online. It's going to be on our website. It's going to be a wide open, transparent process. And we are at the get go putting in place accountability measures. And this is something I am very serious about having been a governor, being on the ground. Uh, we are going to track every penny to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And the ROI, the ROI is jobs. We think we can create in the short term hundreds of thousands of jobs and fundamentally revitalize dozens of communities around America so that a few years from now we'll create 300,000 jobs. Ten years from now we will have communities that are a beehive of economic activity that five years ago were distressed. Thanks, Secretary Raimondo. A few days ago, the U.S. government and governments around the world accused China of malicious cyber activities. Have you gotten any reaction from your Chinese government counterparts about these accusations? And do you believe that the statements alone are going to be enough to change Chinese behavior if they aren't paired with punitive measures like tariffs or sanctions? Yeah. So I have not had, uh, to answer your first question, the answer is no. I have not had any, any interaction. 
The pre President Biden's been very clear on this. There will be consequences, and we will use all tools at our disposal at our disposal in order to protect Americans and American businesses. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, some of this money would go to communities hit hard by the loss of travel and tourism. Do you have a sense of how big that hit has been and how what share of that is because of the public health related travel bans? Uh, so we know that nearly every community in America has been affected. And um, I want to be clear that of the 750 million, uh, every state will receive something. So uh, 500 million is going out as quickly as we can in the next few weeks, and everyone will participate, and then 200 or so is competitive. Uh, I think that it's, in, I think the answer to your question is, is in, it's impossible to answer, or I don't, I don't think it's possible to figure it out that way. But we do know about a year and a half ago, we shut down travel and tourism. I lived it in Rhode Island. You know, Newport, Narragansett, Block Island closed. We shut it down. And we're still trying to build back after that. And so that's what this money is intended to do, to help these communities to get back into the business of tourism and travel. Kelly? How would you assess, Madam Secretary, the work, worker shortage that many employers are finding where they're having difficulty getting back up, um, especially in some of the hospitality and uh, tourist areas? Uh, it's, it is acute. Um, there, there is um, every business I talk to says that they uh, need to find talent. So I don't know if I would call it a shortage per se. I would say there's a skills gap. And that's why we put so much money of this $3 billion. You know, a half a billion of $3 billion is just for skill development, apprenticeship, high quality job training. What I hear all the time is from companies, we are ready to hire, but people need to have the skills. They need digital skills, cybersecurity skills, data, you know, data skills, cloud computing skills. And and so that's what we have to get at the business of. And by the way, we need to make sure that women and people of color and people in rural areas have those digital skills so they can get those good jobs. So that's what this is about, and that's what I hear most often from companies. Caitlin's going to have to be the last one. Thank you, Secretary. Last week, the President said he would have an update for us on international travel. All right, we're going to step away from that right now. Uh, we want to take just a quick two-minute commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we're still monitoring all the developments uh, about a shooting that happened earlier this evening in Washington, D.C. We are learning that D.C. Metropolitan Police uh, will brief the public tonight. Uh, we don't have an idea yet uh, on the timing of that. We'll bring that to you live uh, if we do see that. But when we come back, we'll be talking uh, about the opioid pandemic, a major drug bust as well, and fentanyl. Uh, overdoses and seizures are on the rise. All that and more in two minutes.
Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. I'm Andrew Kraft. Thanks so much uh, for being with us. We're still monitoring uh, this shooting that happened in Washington, D.C. a little bit earlier tonight. We still have live pictures and uh, we are waiting to hear uh, from the chief of police uh, in Washington at the moment. Uh, we don't know when that will take place, uh, but we'll bring that to you live once we get it. But in the meantime, we do want to move on to uh, some other stories that we have yet to get to on this Thursday night. Uh, and the opioid epidemic could be costing some of the nation's leading drug manufacturers and distributors billions of dollars. Fox News correspondent Kevin Cork has more on the settlement aimed at trying to help states work to reverse the damage caused by the drugs. Here's that story. national opioids cases are coming close to their resolution. Lawyers representing state and local governments are on the verge of reaching a $26 billion settlement with Johnson & Johnson and three drug distribution companies, Amerisource Bergen, Cardinal Health, and McKesson, over their alleged involvement in the opioid epidemic. The money in this settlement would be divided among the states based on their population, also the severity of drug crisis. Although the full extent of the settlement is still up in the air, experts say it would also prevent Johnson & Johnson from manufacturing opioids for 10 years and force the three distribution companies to develop a new system to monitor the nationwide shipment of their drugs. State and local governments have accused drug distribution companies, particularly, of sending drugs to where they're not needed, not flagging suspicious orders, you know, sort of overfilling prescriptions. Officials remain hopeful the settlement will help states develop better treatment options to counteract the devastating impacts of the drugs. But opioid reform advocates say the $26 billion deal is actually underwhelming. We were expecting the numbers to be in the hundreds of billions, not not 26. Meanwhile, data released by the Society of Actuaries finds that the opioid epidemic cost the U.S. economy some $631 billion between 2015 and 2018 alone. In Washington, I'm Kevin Cork, Fox News. Kevin, thanks so much uh, for that story there. Uh, we're going to stay on that story because earlier today in, in Philadelphia, the district attorney, Larry Krasner, uh, announced uh, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office uh, has filed a complaint against the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office related to that very opioid settlement that uh, Kevin Cork was talking about in his story. The, uh, the district attorney, uh, Krasner, will also share his strong concerns about the settlement in a press conference uh, today. So it does look like maybe some of these leaders in these cities across the country are not really entirely on board with some of these states uh, and their settlement negotiations with some of these major drug manufacturers like Johnson & Johnson uh, and uh, as well as these drug distributors as well. Let's uh, listen into what he had to say earlier today. Okay. First of all, thank you all for being here. We are here for a very important purpose, and that is to figure out whether or not the city of Philadelphia is going to be protected from corporations that think it's okay to poison Philadelphians. Opioid manufacturers, distributors, and dispensers systematically poison Philadelphians for years. That poisoning has caused the deaths of countless people. When I get up in the morning and I have breakfast, one Philadelphian will die from opioid overdose. Same thing will happen at lunch and same thing will happen at dinner. We will have a thousand Philadelphians die this year from opioid overdose. And the finger points directly at the corporations that have profited from their cheating, their lies, and their violations of the law to make that money. If you're gonna poison Philadelphians, you're gonna pay. That is how we are in Philly. If you're gonna poison Philadelphians, you better be ready to pay. I'm here to announce 
that this morning at about 9 o'clock, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office began a lawsuit against the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office to make it clear that the DA's lawsuit is not going away. We are not going to allow it to be signed away by the Attorney General. We are not going to allow it to disappear. I first want to acknowledge some people who are here, and then I'll get into specifics and we'll take any questions. You should know that in February, two and a half years ago, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office filed its own lawsuit against opioid manufacturers. We have been litigating that lawsuit vigorously for a long time. The city also filed its own lawsuit, which it has litigated vigorously with many of the same attorneys for almost those three years. I'm going to introduce you to the attorneys who have done that, but I want you to know the Attorney General never filed a lawsuit against these defendants. This so-called settlement is a settlement of a lawsuit that was never filed, that was never litigated against these defendants, and yet somehow we find ourselves in a posture where there's a sweeping settlement we know very little about. We have with us today John Weston of Sachs Weston LLC, Stephen Scheller of Scheller PC, Jerry Desiderato of Dilworth Paxson, Greg Heller of McLaughlin Lorcella, and we also have here in spirit Jennifer Connolly of Barron and Bud, who's in DC, because yes, this is a national effort, and it's a serious effort to hold those who profited from opioids accountable. We also have with us today a few people who will be speaking. We have Sarah Laurel and Mac Allison of Savage Sisters. Did I mispronounce your name? Oh, okay. Mac Al-Assad of Savage Sisters. We have uh, Qasim Rashad, who's the Emir at the United Muslims Masjid of South Philadelphia. They will all be speaking, and I hope to see Councilmember Maria Quinones Sanchez, who is here. Thank you for being here, Councilmember, who uh, perhaps more than any other member of council has worked long and hard to try to lift up the situation that is addressed in Kensington, and we appreciate her being here. The message that we have here is quite straightforward. It is that the settlement that the Attorney General has been speaking about is too low, meaning it's not enough money. The money comes too slow, meaning it comes over almost 20 years, 18 years, before the payments are supposed to be over, and that money may not even show. That money may not even show because over 18 years these companies have the ability to go bankrupt because there are provisions in this deal that indicate that if these companies are not as profitable as they want to be, they don't have to pay for that year. And it may not show, perhaps most troubling, it may not show because this money doesn't come directly to Philadelphia. This money goes through the hands of state officials and state agencies that have made it clear that they don't want to fund Philadelphia the way they fund other parts of this state. Just look at Philadelphia's public schools if you have any question of what I'm talking about. So take that situation and look at what the mayor has done. The mayor filed a lawsuit on behalf of this city, the people who live here, against these manufacturers. All the money from that lawsuit goes right here. The DA's office filed a lawsuit, a separate lawsuit, against these opioid manufacturers under a special law to protect consumers. All of that money goes right here to Philly. It doesn't go through the hands of people who would like to recount the last election. If you understand what I'm saying, they seem to have a funny sense of math. It comes straight here, and it comes straight here for the real needs that we have in Philadelphia. At this time, I would like to call forward Sarah Laurel and Mac Al-Assad of Savage Sisters. Savage Sisters is an organization in and around Kensington that does important work with people who are suffering from addiction. It is an organization that my office appreciates and respects, and therefore when they applied for a grant, 
from our office, we gave them a grant because we think the work that they're doing is very important. After we hear from them, we will also hear from Qasim Rashad, and then I will return to address some other specific points uh, and to introduce Council Member Maria Quinones Sanchez, who will have some comments. Savage Sisters. Um, my name is Sarah Laurel. I'm here um, on behalf. So we just wanted to show you uh, a little bit of that from uh, the Philly District Attorney, Larry Krasner, earlier today. Uh, he is not sitting by. Uh, he does not like this uh, possible settlement negotiation that some of these states and these drug manufacturers uh, and distributors have reached. It's going to be a massive settlement. That's what we're hearing. But uh, he said it does not go far enough. So uh, we want to just move on. We have one more story we want to get to. Uh, and as you know, uh, fentanyl is the main driver of the drug overdose deaths uh, in the country. Uh, and much of the illegal supply being trafficked across the border. Uh, is making its way to a new distribution hub in the country. Fox News correspondent Brian Yenis has more on this story from New York. Let's go out to Brian right now. Fatal drug overdoses spiking to record levels in the U.S. last year. A majority of those deaths blamed on fentanyl, an opioid used for pain treatment that is 100 times more potent than morphine. According to the DEA, approximately 90% of fentanyl-laced drugs can be traced to the southern border. In the month of June alone, more than 1,000 pounds of fentanyl were seized there by Customs and Border Protection. In terms of the major traffickers, they could care less. They're really just merchants of death. They don't care. Once it's trafficked across the border, fentanyl makes its way, often on produce trucks, to New York City, which has become a major distribution hub for the lethal drug. Fentanyl seizures there are up 236 percent, with 806 kilograms seized, enough to kill more than 400 million people. The special narcotics prosecutor in New York City saying lethal amounts of fentanyl are now being mixed into all major drugs, including pills, meth, heroin, and cocaine. It's coming in in very large volume. And so instead of just being mixed in with heroin now, it's being pre-pressed into pills that look just like pharmaceutical pills that you might buy from a manufacturer. Drug overdoses in the city are up 22% in just the last year, 75% of those deaths involving fentanyl. And it's finding its way into drug markets across the country where it hadn't been seen before. In the U.S. last year, more than 93,000 people died of a drug overdose. In New York, Brian Yenis, Fox News. Brian, thank you uh, so much for that story. It's so important to tell. Uh, and like you said there, uh, 93,000 uh, Americans dying uh, just in the last year because of overdose deaths. That's up 30 percent from the year before. And so uh, we want to just uh, move on to some of these other stories. First, we're going to take a quick two minute commercial break. Thanks for being with us uh, on your Thursday night. We have more where that came from in two minutes. We'll see you then.
Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. Uh, as we uh, have been following for about the last hour, hour and a half now, that shooting out of Washington, D.C. in a very busy area, very upscale area, lots of restaurants and shops, uh, as many people were dining out to eat tonight on this Thursday night. And so we're still awaiting a police press conference at the moment. We see uh, some of these uh, reporters and photographers are uh, getting ready to uh, get briefed by D.C. Metropolitan Police. It looks like some of these representatives are coming to the podium very, very soon. Uh, and so hopefully we'll uh, get a little more information and more details on exactly what transpired tonight. You can see uh, the photographers uh, frantically trying to get all their microphones in for this update. We're going to keep uh, on this shot here. Uh, this is not too far from the scene itself where two adult males were shot on the intersection of 14th and R. If you're familiar with D.C. at all, you know that that is a very busy area. Lots of D.C. residents, especially on Twitter, the D.C. press corps, many of them live there. It's uh, right around the corner from the very popular restaurant and French bistro Le Diplomat. Many lawmakers and dignitaries eat there quite frequently. And so now we know two adult males were shot in what police have been describing as a possible drive-by shooting. We'll uh, hopefully hear from them in just a matter of moments as uh, these reporters and photographers get this podium with their microphones set up here. Let's listen in. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay, here. I see the problem. Okay, I got the problem. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Right, That's where you break with me, Matt. Everybody. So we are still waiting for police to come up to the podium. The podium now is set, but we, this is what we know so far. Two men were injured in a shooting that sent pedestrians fleeing on a busy street in the northwest section of Washington, D.C. According to Metro Police, officers responded to the scene uh, at a busy intersection uh, filled with restaurants and bars around 820 tonight. Police found two men suffering from gunshot wounds. Uh, source tells our affiliate there on the ground, Fox 5 DC, one man was shot in the arm and, and the other in the chest. And so at the moment, we know they were both conscious and breathing when officers arrived and their injuries are considered non-life threatening. Fox 5 in DC spoke to many people who were out and about when the shooting happened. They reported hearing about 20 gunshots. I myself, my brother lives in D.C. I have many friends who live in D.C. I've been texting with them, asking if they are okay. Uh, we do have kind of a better, clearer vantage point of this podium here. Let's go to that shot at the moment we have here. According to Fox 5 in D.C., a couple eating outside says when they heard the shots, they thought it was firecrackers or fireworks because they saw flashes hitting the street. Then they saw people running. The latest shooting comes amid a rash of crime that has plagued the district and led Mayor Muriel Bowser to direct the Metropolitan Police Department to, quote, use any overtime necessary to meet our public safety needs. On Wednesday, just yesterday, Metro Police also announced the launch of their new mobile units that will be engaging the community on bikes 
and scooters in just yet another attempt to curb violent crime. Uh, this is all coming as well uh, after a terrible and really scary situation in D.C. outside the Nats game on Saturday night uh, that sent uh, scores of uh, sports fans running and fleeing because they also heard gunshots right outside the Nats stadium. And so uh, Washington, D.C. right now plagued by what many residents who live there are saying is an unprecedented surge in gun violence this summer. And so we're waiting for police officials to come up to the podium here. D.C. police uh, about a little less than an hour ago said that Chief Conti will provide a live update very, very soon. Right, if you're just coming here to live now from Fox, you are looking at a uh, podium set up. We are just waiting for uh, the D.C. Metropolitan Police Chief, Chief Conti, to come up to the podium there to address the public and the press about what exactly transpired tonight uh, on 14th Street in R, in uh, the heart of Washington, D.C., where we know two men were injured in a shooting. Police found the two men suffering from gunshot wounds on the street. They were both conscious and breathing when officers arrived. Their injuries are considered non-life-threatening. And so at the moment, uh, you can see there, police are still on the scene uh, investigating at this moment while we wait. And so at the moment, I do want to just keep on this shot because you never know when uh, the officials will come up. It does look like possibly they might be walking up very soon. Uh, I don't want to move on to some of these other stories, uh, but this one uh, is live uh, as it has happened, raw and unfiltered, like what we do here on Live Now. We have just another vantage point we want to show you uh, from the scene of the investigation itself. You can see here just kind of another angle uh, of uh, how police are you know, looking into this. You can see the number of tags on the ground, possible bullet casings, bullet fragments that might have fallen in this area. It's still uh, a quite an active scene and you can see the yellow tape, police tape cordoning off some of these areas. So we are waiting for this at this hour. It's almost 7.30 here on the West Coast, almost 10.30 there in the nation's capital. Uh, and like I've been saying, uh, since we uh, got these live pictures, it has been quite a dangerous summer, not only in Washington, D.C., but in many areas, uh, in many big cities around the country. Uh, we were hearing from, I was seeing from some of my friends on Twitter, some of my friends in the D.C. press corps who live in this area that this part of D.C. is not accustomed to violence. They acknowledge there are many neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. that experience this each and every day. But for something like this to have happened at 14th and R Street 
It's an upscale area, a lot of nice shops, a lot of nice restaurants. It's quite stunning and is uh, really putting into perspective for some DC residents, uh, my friends and family included, about the nature of the surge in gun violence this summer. And so you can see, uh, we're just gonna go back full here as we await Metropolitan Police to come up to the podium. We're gonna take just a quick two minute commercial break. We'll be back in a moment with more updates on this story. And we'll go back here to live now from Fox, where we are still monitoring that situation outside of uh, Washington, D.C., though. We're going to move on uh, to some other stories uh, at this hour. We want to just put up this live look we are getting. This is uh, the main stadium in Tokyo, Japan, as the Olympic Games do kick off tomorrow. Uh, we'll be hearing right now that they're just obviously one day away, but excitement is mixed with apprehension in Tokyo as COVID-19 cases there uh, continue to rise. Let's hear right now from Fox News correspondent Amy Kellogg with the latest. prepares to open the 2020 Olympic Games after a year-long delay. But with less than 24 hours to go, the city has hit a six-month high in new COVID-19 cases. 1,979 new cases were reported on Thursday, the highest since January. Under such circumstances, the managing of the Games, while at the same time taking all possible measures against COVID-19, it's a far from easy task. All this in spite of a state of emergency that was declared on July 12th in an effort to curb the spread of the virus. <laughs> Meanwhile, groups of protesters in Tokyo continue to oppose the games, calling for them to be canceled in the face of these rising COVID cases. The West African nation of Guinea has pulled out of the games last minute, blaming the resurgence of COVID-19 and its more transmissible variants. These Olympic Games are the most restricted sports events in the world ever. And on Thursday, First Lady Jill Biden arriving in Japan, leading the United States diplomatic delegation to the Games. Biden meeting with Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga and his wife in the Japanese capital. Meanwhile, those athletes whose training has already been impacted by the pandemic are now having to deal with extreme heat and humidity with temperatures rising well into the 90s. In Milan, Italy, Amy Kellogg, Fox News. 
And we thank uh, Amy Kellogg there. Uh, we wanted to uh, just kind of show you some of these other scenes from earlier today where First Lady Jill Biden uh, landed in Tokyo. There she is stepping down. This was a little bit earlier today. The Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga and his wife hosted the First Lady for dinner at the Akasaka Palace in Tokyo. Dr. Biden is leading the U.S. diplomatic delegation to the Tokyo 2020 Olympics with opening ceremonies scheduled to start tomorrow. She plans to meet with Team USA athletes, U.S. Foreign Service officers, and the Japanese Emperor Naruhito during her stay. So there you can see her as she landed in Tokyo a little bit earlier. We also have some of this video that we want to put up as well. This is a meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga. And so with his wife as well, the First Lady of Japan. And so we just wanted to show you that as well. But it looks like right now we do have D.C. police officials also accompanied by D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. Let's listen in. You ready? Yes, yes. All right. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Robert J. Conti, the third Chief of Police of the Metropolitan Police Department. I want to give you an update on the shooting uh, situation that we had here uh, this evening. Uh, just about 8.20 p.m., members of the Metropolitan Police Department were in the area, uh, heard gunfire uh, in, the area of the third, 14, in the area of 14th and Riggs uh, Street Northwest. Uh, members responded uh, to that area, with, uh, responded to the shooting scene within about five seconds after hearing the shots, where they located uh, two individuals suffering from non-life-threatening uh, gunshot wounds. It appears at this time that at least one of those individuals uh, was the target of the shooting. Uh, the other individual uh, is possibly an innocent bystander. Uh, those individuals are recovering right now from an area hospital. Uh, they're recovering uh, from their wounds and being treated at area hospitals. Uh, I think this really kind of speaks to the brazenness of some of the criminals that we're seeing in our community. Uh, just prior to this uh, shooting, uh, members of the Metropolitan Police Department recovered a firearm uh, just blocks away from here in the 1100 block of S Street. They recovered another firearm in the 1400 block, at 14th and Irving Street. And uh, we're just seeing a proliferation of firearms in our communities. Uh, we've recovered over 1,100 illegal firearms off the streets of the District of Columbia so far this year. That's on pace of where we were same time last year. Uh, we're asking for the public's help. If anyone has videos or anyone has information, to call us at 202-727-9099 or 50411. You can text us anonymously. Uh, you can also send videos to uh, press at DC, press at, at MPD at DC.gov. Uh, you can send videos to that and we will uh, be able to view uh, any videos. Uh, we believe that there were a lot of people uh, in the area when this occurred. Uh, we have a video that we will be releasing to the public immediately following this as well as still images of our suspect suspects and the vehicle that was involved in the shooting. Chief, do you believe that uh, either of the two men shot were bystanders or do you think they were part of some kind of altercation? It appears that at least one person was targeted and the other person may be an innocent bystander. Again, this is very, very, very preliminary information. Can you identify which one was the target and which one was the bystander? Uh, no, I'm not able to make that distinction at this point. Okay. How many shots were fired? Uh, more than one shot. You know, this happened just down the street from the place where a man was killed by a stray bullet leaving dinner. What do you say to people who feel like this is not a safe place for me and certainly not for my family? Yeah, we had officers, again, who were here. Uh, within five seconds. They were there in the block uh, where the other shooting uh, occurred. And I think what we say is we got to make sure that we're doing everything we can as an entire system here in the District of Columbia to hold offenders accountable when these things happen in our community. This is unacceptable. That's the bottom line. It is totally unacceptable behavior. I'm asking the community to take a look at these videos. Uh, if you know the person or the vehicle or somebody who was in that, there's one individual with a very distinctive hoodie uh, that he was wearing. Please look at that very closely. And we're asking for the community's help to call us, again, 202-727-9099 or 50411. Uh, there's reward money from crime solvers as well as MPD that will be offered uh, for anyone who provides information that results in the arrest and prosecution in this case. 
Any other questions? You know, police were, they were so close. They were right here when it happened. And I know that was in another case as well. And it shows how brazen people are. They can see officers, they'll still start shooting and police can't stop it. And I think, again, it goes back to that safety element that even when people see police, you can't necessarily feel like someone's not gonna get shot or you're not gonna get shot. Well, ma'am, I can tell you this. We'll find the individuals and we'll hold them accountable. And that's what we have to do as an entire city. Uh, when it comes to people who are not afraid to use guns in our community, there has to be a measure of accountability there. We have to make sure that these individuals are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, right now, as you know, we're coming out of this COVID environment. We need to get our court system back open. There are individuals out here on our street who we know are violent felons, and we need to make sure that these individuals are being held accountable for their actions that they commit in our community. It makes the community unsafe. It makes our police officers unsafe, and that is totally unacceptable. Chief Conti, it has been nearly a week since the six-year-old murder, yep. followed by the shooting near Nats Park. Uh, you changed some tactics, but any plan to make more improvements to the tactics? Yeah, we will certainly assess that, and with respect to those cases, we are making uh, progress in both of those cases. Uh, I am hopeful that we will continue to do that and hopefully bring those cases to closure soon. Well, we'll go back, we'll assess our, uh, our tactics, what we're doing right now. As you know, uh, the mayor has directed the police department to make all officers available to do what we need to do to ensure that our residents of the city and our visitors to the city that they feel safe. With so many different agencies in the area, are you calling in any help from federal agencies? We saw Secret Service police cars here, FBI. Yeah, we're working very closely with our federal partners. As you may know, uh, we stood up our new uh, NIBIN investigations unit uh, that uh, focuses in on shootings. That's a collaborative partnership between the Metropolitan Police Department, the ATF, as well as our United States Attorney's Office. So again, uh, we have the resources that we need, and we also need, just need to make sure that we're holding these violent criminals accountable when they are brought into custody. So are you concerned about some of the rhetoric surrounding policing right now and that making it harder for your officers to do their jobs and making it easier for criminals to feel like they can do something like this? Yeah, sure. There's a lot of rhetoric around the issue. I mean, that's a national issue, but we're not going to accept that as an excuse. We're going to go out here. We're going to continue to do our jobs. We have a job to do, and that is to make sure that our communities, our communities are safe. And that falls on the shoulders of the Metropolitan Police Department. We have to do our jobs. I'm asking, you know, again, as we go through and we assess, we reassess what we're doing, that everyone that's part of our justice system reassess what they're doing. The laws that are being made, the actions that are happening in court, are we all doing what we need to do to ensure that communities are safe. I can assure you that the Metropolitan Police Department, we're making those assessments daily. We're making changes daily. I wonder if everyone else within our system are doing the same. Mayor, what would you say to citizens who are scared and outraged by this violence? Uh, well, I'm outraged. The chief is outraged. And the community should be outraged. Uh, and I have to reiterate what the chief has said. Uh, and to answer our earlier question, we certainly are working with our federal partners. I think you uh, know that the ATF has committed resources to the district actually outside the district to prevent the trafficking of guns uh, in our city. Uh, we've also had conversations at the White House, including the Attorney General, uh, who has also committed to make federal resources available, specifically the federal grand juries, um, so that some of the arrests and indictments that MPD seeks are actually moving through the court system. Uh, we have also strongly encouraged talking about our federal partners, uh, the supervision agencies, um, that would be C. Sosa, who monitors uh, people who have been released to the community, uh, as well as the court supervision agency who monitors juveniles who are court involved. We need all of those agencies, like D.C. government, to be open in person uh, in administering those services. Keep in mind. Um, that the entire system hasn't been 100% uh, and hasn't been in person uh, coming out of COVID. Uh, and we want to make sure, not just the D.C. agencies, MPD, DYRS, and the whole of D.C. government, uh, but all of our agencies uh, are working. What we saw tonight, and unfortunately what we uh, saw over the last several days, is an illegal firearm brazenly used on D.C. streets. Uh, and we know uh, that our investigators and detectives are going to track down every lead. 
Our citizens have already been helpful in supplying leads, video, and anything else that they saw so that we can get these individuals off the street and hold them accountable. The last plea that I'll make to our residents is we need to get to them before they use their gun. And we have a plethora of programs and services, even for people who are criminally involved, uh, to come in and get help from us. We're asking their family members who know that they have a gun in their home, they're involved in some criminal activity, they're involved in some beef, to reach out before they use that gun um, because it can destroy the lives of so, so many people when that gun is used indiscriminately on our streets. And there are, Mayor Bowser, what do you say to the public members, the members of the public that are concerned that until the court system is back up and running that this will keep happening? Um, I, I say to them that we have to press on every everything that we know about stopping crime right now. It won't be one single thing. Uh, and I say to them uh, to just what, I, I'll repeat what I said. We need to get to people before they use their guns. That's how we prevent it. And if we can't prevent it, we're going to make sure that we hold people accountable for this. But I can assure every resident, now not just MPD, but all of DC government will be doing um, checking everything that we're doing uh, to make sure that we're addressing it as best and as fast as we can to stop the shooting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right, uh, we were just listening to Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C., as well as D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, joining me right now to kind of recap exactly what was said and what we know at this hour. My colleague Daytona Everett. Daytona, what were your key takeaways? What do we have to know about this? Yeah, so Andrew, uh, incredible timing on this. As we've been showing you all day today, Attorney General Merrick Garland making his way to several different cities, one of them not being Washington, D.C., uh, but talking about gun trafficking. You heard D.C. Mayor Bauer, uh, Bowser saying right there that this is yet another illegal firearm brazenly used on city streets. Uh, we know that there's been several shootings just over the past couple of days. You heard one of those reporters asking if this is even a safe area in anymore. And then she also asked, uh, is it safe to think that even if there's a police officer in the vicinity, uh, if that would even keep the area safe? And they said, you know, they're doing what they can. They said a police officer was there within five seconds. There was officers right down the street during this shooting, but still uh, two men being shot tonight. The investigation underway uh, they are hoping that someone from the public can come forward with more information. They have released a little bit of info about the suspect. Uh, a black Honda Civic is the car that they were driving. Of course, they're going to be releasing new images, uh, new videos to the public uh, to hopefully help in this investigation. But yeah, that's pretty much what I got from this, uh, you know, a couple big quotes from that press conference there. They said that We'll find them and we'll hold them accountable. They're taking these situations seriously. These shootings, uh, they said, need to be uh, they need to be held accountable. These sh these shooters, so that in the future it doesn't happen again, and it's not so easy for them uh, to access these firearms, illegal firearms. Yeah, Mayor Bowser definitely saying that uh, no doubt in her mind that she thought that uh, the gun or the weapon, whatever, used in this particular shooting will uh, turn out to have been illegal. We also heard from Chief Conti that they believe that one uh, of these uh, victims today was targeted by the shooter and that possibly the other one was just an innocent bystander. Uh, they said that the police department will very soon after this uh, briefing we just listened to tonight They'll be releasing vi new video uh, and new still images of uh, possibly the vehicle in question uh, and some images of the suspect or suspects involved in this. Uh, you were talking about words used by those officials there, and we heard from Chief of Police Conti brazenness, the mm -hmm. brazenness in which you know, people feel that they can do this uh, in a, a very, very busy area of the nation's capital and get away with it. Uh, you heard there uh, that many of the questions from reporters were indicating that 
these things do not happen in these areas of Washington, D.C. And having lived there myself, I know for, uh, from experience that you know, outside of the Nats Park uh, and in the 14th Street District where there are tons of restaurants and shops, this is unprecedented and mm -hmm. this is highly unusual. I also thought it was very interesting as well uh, that Mayor Bowser kind of attributed, uh, and you also heard from Chief Conti as well, attribute some of the rise in this uh, gun violence and in this crime this summer to the fact that many of the D.C. courts uh, have been uh, not in Close. person right. uh, and so therefore you have uh, basically, you cannot have uh, you know perpetrators, suspects come in to be arraigned, to be indicted on mm -hmm. these charges. They either have to sit in detention or just be out on bail because the court system is so backlogged right now because they cannot have hearings in person. Right, exactly. Uh, also, you know, coming from the police chief and from Bowser today, they said the community should be outraged with what is going on right now in the streets of Washington, D.C. Going a little bit further into what you just mentioned, Andrew, yeah, they're saying everyone needs to be pulled back in person. This is just as much uh, of an issue as the coronavirus pandemic. That's uh, the status that, that they're pointing this towards, violence in the streets. Uh, also, they said that they want to make sure all of these agencies are working together, both locally and federally. Uh, she did talk about those gun trafficking initiatives that Garland and the rest of the Biden administration are trying to take here. It'll be interesting to see what that looks like moving forward. Uh, also interesting to note the other day, Bowser coming out and talking about the fact that she has already told the Metropolitan Police Department that they can use any overtime they need. She said, use as many resources as you need to make sure that the streets are safe and that we are tending to them as much as we need to be. So uh, not looking like it really helped uh, out there tonight, but hopefully they can be getting some answers from the public when they release a little bit more information, images and, and videos. And of course, we'll bring those to everyone at home as soon as we get them. But Andrew, this is happening not just in the D.C. area. This is happening right now in Houston, Texas as well. I think we still have that uh, live picture up. We're getting these from Fox 26 in Houston as we are hearing of another reported shooting tonight. Authorities on the scene of a drive-by shooting where multiple people have been injured. According to Harris County Precinct 1, uh, the shooting occurred at Sammy J's Bar and Grill. It is on uh, North Houston, Roslyn Road. Authorities said that four people had gunshot wounds. EMS and the Houston Police Department are on the scene right now, as you can see. Uh, looking pretty similar to what Washington, D.C. is looking like on this uh, Thursday night. Uh, yeah, Daytona will be monitoring uh, that scene out of Houston as well as uh, hopefully more developments out of Washington, D.C. Uh, at the moment. Uh, and so uh, we have still a little bit more of live coverage left uh, in store for our viewers here on live now from fox on this thursday uh we just got uh some new video in that we're also going to show you a little bit later uh because as you know the olympics are starting tomorrow the opening ceremony will be kicking off very early uh tomorrow morning our time here in the united states but we do have uh right now just a live look at the uh, main venue where all of these, uh, well, not all, but many of these uh, events uh, and competitions will be taking place starting tomorrow, lasting through August the 8th. We just got new video uh, from, uh, it looks like, uh, in Japan, in Tokyo, of the First Lady Jill Biden uh, virtually speaking with some of the members from Team USA. So we'll bring that to you a, a little bit later tonight uh, in Daytona. Uh, some more stories as well on this Thursday night. We're going to head out to a quick two-minute commercial break. We'll see you afterward.
and thanks for being with us here on Live Now from Fox. Almost 8 o'clock here in Phoenix, Arizona. As we said, we are monitoring a few different uh, breaking news situations. This first one out of Washington, D.C. And then, of course, uh, we just got this one in out of Houston, Texas. So if we get any official update out of Houston uh, with the police department on what happened, we will, of course, bring it to you as soon as possible. Until then, though, we want to go out to uh, another event that we're getting live here just in the last couple of minutes the first lady arriving in tokyo for the olympics let's play that out <laughs> you know to see everybody it's just how hard they tried to get here my god yes thank you all for being here i really appreciate it I mean, did you feel emotional too? You know, yes. to see all the athletes and you know how they're all getting ready. And they're all just amazing, right? That we're here at this moment when we just wondered whether we would be. So, thank you for your help. And I really thank appreciate you. it. Just thank you. Of, just think how hard it is, how hard all the like it's just on top of everything else what they've got to go through here and everything. Oh. It must be incredible. Yeah. I think that meant a lot to them. Well, no, but like yeah, that's have families be able to say that, mm -hmm. you know, to say like, you know, we're all behind. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, we are. <laughs> so, it should be exciting to watch the event. Am I allowed to shake hands or I guess I'm not? Okay, just pretend these are hugs. Thanks. Thank you so much. Enjoy the opening ceremony. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'm very excited to have you here represent. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. So that was just the uh, ending portion of the First Lady heading to Tokyo. She spoke with some of those athletes. We're going to get that for you in just a minute. But until then, let's go out to Fox 11 in L.A. as they interviewed a Paralympic jumper as he gets ready for the Olympics. Here's that conversation. Basically, we are not worthy. <laughs> you are watching the workout routine of Trenton Merrill. He's an athlete who is headed to Tokyo next month to compete in the Paralympic Games. It is quite an amazing accomplishment. Trenton joining us now live to talk about uh, what we can expect. There he is coming to us uh, from San Diego where you are training. How you, how, I want to know how you're feeling. Are you ready to go? What's, what's going on now that we're uh, getting really close to the moment. Hey, Bob. I'm feeling pumped, man. I'm ready to go. Ready to uh, represent USA and uh, carry that flag, you know, after competing. We're, we're, we're really proud of you. We're really excited. We can't wait to see all the things you do. I've seen all, all the videos, and, and you're, you're a completely inspiring guy. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey so that the folks at home know uh, how you got here. In fact, you're a motivational speaker, too. So, uh, you know, you, 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 this all started when you were 14 years old and... So sorry about that. We're going to cut into that conversation because we have some live pictures coming in. The arrival ceremony for the Olympic flame of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic torch relay coming in here. Let's just listen in to the ground as we've been getting these pictures in ahead of tomorrow, the very beginning of uh, the Tokyo Olympics.
So thank you everyone for uh, watching live now from Fox on this Thursday evening here, eight o'clock in Phoenix, Arizona. But uh, across the globe, we're taking a look live at Tokyo where the arrival ceremony for the Olympic flame is currently underway. The governor of Tokyo, along with torchbearers, are participating in the ceremony. They're lighting the torch, and the final torchbearer will place the flame on a special celebration cauldron. So we're just going to stay on this shot here. As you can see, all of these uh, Tokyo fans out there, masks on, of course, uh, but just trying to witness this 2020 Tokyo Olympics. They're still coining it 2020 Tokyo Olympics because couldn't happen last year, unfortunately. But you can still see the excitement on everyone's faces out there. It's not looking like that everywhere in Tokyo. We are seeing some protesters showing up in droves as well, as many were hoping that the protest that the Olympics was not going to happen. We're going to pop in some of those live pictures for you as well here on live now from Fox. Giving you your full coverage. 2020 Tokyo Olympics.
full Olympics coverage here on this Thursday evening and Friday afternoon. If you're in Tokyo, Japan right now, we uh, want to have all of these shots for you. So you have a vantage point of everything Olympics tonight. Uh, that bottom right hand corner anti Olympics protests just as the arrival ceremony is taking place for the Olympic flame. Let's listen in to some of those protests down on the ground there as uh, this ceremony still is getting underway right now. So you see the signs right there, no Olympics. A lot of uh, Tokyo residents said that they didn't want the Olympics to be happening at all in the middle of this pandemic, especially as fears of the Delta variant continue uh, across the country and across around the world. Uh, you can see some of these other signs out there as well. No Olympics. That is the uh, common plea out there for uh, a lot of Japanese people who have really struggled throughout the pandemic here. But on the left hand side, you're seeing a, co a totally different scene as the torch relay is underway here. We're going to go out to that full and allow you to uh, listen in as I think there's only a few minutes left of the relay here.
So as we stay on this shot right here, just want to give you some tidbits of information about the Tokyo Olympics thus far. Hasn't even started, but is uh, really making headlines. Two members of the Czech Olympic team tested positive for COVID-19 today. Part of a cluster of infections suspected to be linked to the team's flight to Japan, making them just the latest in a string of athletes who have had to withdraw from the Tokyo Olympics due to the disease as the summer games kick off. In spite of concerns regarding the ongoing pandemic, that's why in the bottom right hand corner, you're seeing a lot of people out and about angry that the Olympics are carrying on, carrying on despite a surge in cases right now. For all of our American Live Now watchers right now, U.S. men's beach volleyball player Taylor Crabb tested positive for COVID-19 in Japan despite having been vaccinated and testing negative before leaving the U.S. U.S. women's gymnastics alternate Kara Eaker tasted, tested positive for COVID-19. That was announced just two days ago. She was also fully vaccinated. U.S. women's basketball player Katie Lou Samuelson tested positive that was also announced two days ago. She was also fully vaccinated and said that she took every precaution she could. U.S. tennis player Coco Goff announced on Sunday that she would not be taking part in the Olympics. This would have been her first Olympics after testing positive for COVID-19 as well on July 18th. The list goes on and on. It's not just uh, Americans that are testing positive for the pandemic. 87 people, that's the total number of COVID-19 cases re reported among people affiliated with the Olympics. That tally as of today. Of the positive tests, 52 are Japanese citizens, including staffers and contractors working on the games, and 35 are people who traveled from overseas. Some interesting background information for you. You know, COVID-19 has been a concern for the Tokyo Olympics, which are taking place despite this year-long delay and long-standing speculation over whether to even have the Summer Games. Public health experts have criticized holding the Games and warned of the danger that they could pose including potentially resulting in the creation of a new coronavirus variant as athletes are coming in from around the world. So that's the main concern that you're hearing from a lot of these protesters who are out and about this evening, afternoon, I guess you could say, out in, uh, in Tokyo as it's 1220 there. The Winter Olympics set to be in Beijing in 2022. We do know that spectators have been banned entirely for the Olympic Games. But also interesting to point out, athletes are only encouraged to be vaccinated, not required. So here we have it, uh, taking it full, the torch relay here. Showing you from beginning to end on Live Now from Fox, bringing you live events from across the country and around the world tonight. We're going to send some of you off to a two-minute commercial break when we come back. More coverage, the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. More to come here on Live Now.
最終ランナーに成果がつながれます舞台上には小池百合子都知事宮城議長本橋副議長にご登壇いただいておりますSo you've been listening in to the Tokyo 2020 Olympic torch relay. We'll get back into that in just a moment here, but we want to update you on a few different stories we were following right before this. Take a look at this. We are just getting in uh, from DC police here. They're releasing video already of the suspect vehicle. They're asking for the public's assistance in identifying the suspects and the vehicle in reference to uh, the shooting that happened tonight. They say if you have any information, call 202-727-9099. The suspects and vehicle described as an older black sedan captured by a nearby camera. You can see in the video right there, uh, one of the suspects in a black hood the other suspect in a white hoodie. So two people that they're gonna be searching for uh, in this double shooting out of Washington, D.C. We showed you the press conference on that. D.C. Mayor Bowser showing up to that one, calling definitely for the public's help in trying to identify these two individuals here. We'll be keeping our eyes on any more updates out of D.C. into the night, but we're also getting a little bit more information out of Houston, where four people were shot, were shot in a drive-by shooting at a Harris County bar. Houston police tweeting out, saying that an adult man died at the hospital. Two more patients have arrived at the hospital by a private vehicle. So before we knew just four people were shot, now we know that uh, unfortunately one of them have died. Two others taken to the hospital in a private vehicle. If we get any more on the ground there from Houston police, we'll be sure to bring it to you live here on Live Now. But we'll go back into our live coverage of the Tokyo Olympics, where I believe uh, the main torch is going to be lit here in just a moment. As we've said, though, they are not all Tokyo residents are happy about the Olympics with the rise of the Delta variant cases around the world, including with many of these Olympic athletes. But we'll listen in to the rest of the ceremony here in Tokyo a little after noon. It is 1230 out there in Tokyo.改めてご紹介いたしましょう。東京都の最終ランナーは歌舞伎俳優の六代目中村太郎さんです。大きな拍手をお送りください。それでは中村さん、聖火皿へ聖火の点火をお願いします。当地を聖火皿に掲げてください
そしてこちらに咲いているひまわりでありますけれども暑さに負けず花を咲かせる復興のシンボルといたしまして福島県から送っていただいたものでございます成果は全国の皆様のお力によって全47都道府県しっかりと一つ一つつながれて7月9日都内に入りましたそして15日間かけまして都内全62の自治体のランナーの皆様のそれぞれの思いでつないでつないでつないでついに今日この都内のリレーのゴールであります都民広場に到着いたしましたこの瞬間を迎えることができるのも全国そして都内全区市町村の皆様方のお力によるものと改めて感謝を申し上げますそして聖火の最終ランナーはご覧のように日本人初のオリンピアンの一人でマラソン競技の花栗思想役を演じられました歌舞伎俳優の中村勘九郎さん神ですよね今日はねはいあ,ありがとうございます金栗選手第一次世界大戦が終わったその直後そしてスペイン風邪を乗り越えたベルギーアントワーク大会にも出場された選手なんですね数多くのアスリートの夢と努力がいよいよ本日開会式を迎えます2020東京大会にもつながっていると考えますと感慨もひとしおでございます2020東京大会、新型コロナウイルス感染対策を徹底しながら、世界中のアスリートの皆さんが、素晴らしい競技を繰り広げていただける。So obviously uh, speaking in Japanese right there, we showed you the lighting of the torch though uh, in real time, also giving you these live pictures in the bottom right hand corner of anti-Olympics protests. And then the top right outside of the stadium there, 12.34 in the afternoon in Tokyo. 834 here in Phoenix, Arizona. We have more stories that we're going to be going in and out of. Want to bring to you anything that we have live here on live now. So take a look at this. We are keeping our eyes on the podium in Houston, Texas. As you can see, Houston police are getting ready for a press conference and update on a shooting at a local bar. We heard four people were shot. One person has died in the hospital two others taken to the hospital in a private vehicle there. So hopefully we'll be listening in soon here to Houston police. Until then though, let's uh, go back out to Tokyo as we see these final images of the torch flame being lit here. ありがとうございます。嬉しいでしょうか。では続いて、え、ちょっとご協力様、今お座りいただきまして、ムービーの皆様のお時間になります。ムービーの皆様、え、ご準備ください。でしょうか。ご覧様の方々、そしてご本セン
Well, good evening. I'm James Bryant, commander of North Division, J-A-M-E-S-B-R-Y-A-N-T. Tonight at about 8.40 p.m., we received a call of a drive-by shooting at about the 9700 block of North Houston, Roslyn. When officers arrived, they found two victims on scene, one male, one female, began to perform first aid on both victims. Uh, ambulance arrived shortly thereafter, transported both to the hospital. Uh, the male has been pronounced deceased at this time, and the uh, female is uh, in critical but stable condition right now. As we were working this scene, uh, we received calls from local area hospitals who also had victims of gunshot wounds who may possibly be related to this scene. We have officers en route to those hospitals right now to uh, confirm that information. Uh, right now, we're really early into the investigation, so my information is limited at this time, but the homicide investigation, investigators are working the scene. As far as what led up to the shooting, do we have any Right, right now, um, it appears that there was some sort of disturbance uh, at the establishment at 97, at the 9700 block, and it may have led to the shooting. But that's just preliminary information. Uh, we have to look into that. Suspect description at all? Not at this time, no. They responded. They the drive by. They drove by in the car and shot. Well, we we've tried to. Uh, look into possible witnesses right now but of course our investigators have to talk to them but we don't have that information right now we're going to try to see if we can get some surveillance footage also but right now uh that information is limited i don't have it at this time is there a large crowd there at the bar a smaller crowd a lot of witnesses to work with right now um from what i understand there was a, a gathering a benefit at the location at the time and um that may have been the source of, of the uh, disturbance. Too early to tell if they knew each other, the shooter and the victims? Yes, it's, it's, it's early at this time. Is um, We won't be able to have that information right now. There were no uh, children there, right? Because I see a bounce out there. I'm sorry? There were no children there, right? Uh, at this time, I did not see any children. I have no information that children were there. As far as where the investigation goes from now, I see there was somebody who's deceased as a result of the shooting. Investigation is still early on, but kind of walk us through where things go now. Excuse me. Sorry, can you repeat the question? As far as where things proceed from here, it's still early on in the investigation, but obviously somebody responsible for a deadly shooting here kind of walk us through what happens next. Yes, yes, the homicide investigators are going to work the scene and, and talk to all possible witnesses as well as try to uh, check for any surveillance of the area. Any more questions? Has there been problems at this bar before? We've heard there been, have there been other issues here you know about? Uh, not that I know of. Since I've been here, I haven't had any issues at this location. All right, all right thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. I vouch for all y'all, and y'all all did be good. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so the, the latest from Houston PD right there. One man dead, one woman in critical condition in this drive-by shooting. This was at a, a local bar, Sammy J's Bar and Grill. They say that they are currently investigating the situation, hoping to gather some surveillance video to get more of an idea who these suspects are. No suspect description at this time. They are interviewing witnesses who could have been there. Interesting, though, uh, from police, they say that there was possibly a benefit that was going on at the bar at the time there. Uh, but just tragic news once again. One man dead, one woman in critical condition. Other people wounded by gunshot, uh, gunshots as well, gunfire. They didn't say if they could connect the two uh, with the same bar there in Houston. So... I think they're still trying to put the pieces together as well. So if we get any more updates from Houston Police Department, we'll bring it to you as soon as we see them. We're going to take one more break here on Live Now from Fox. Turning out to be a pretty busy night here on this uh, Thursday night going into 9 o'clock here in Phoenix, Arizona. More to get to in just two minutes.
Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. You are seeing a few different live looks from around Tokyo. You're listening in right now to uh, kind of the ending parts of the arrival ceremony for the Olympic flame. But really interesting shots that we've been getting out of these anti-Olympics protests as large crowds are coming out and saying that the protect or the Olympics should not be taking place this year with so many health concerns and the Delta variant on the rise. We'll be uh, giving you any type of 2020 Olympic coverage that we can give you here on live now, uh, including a conversation with Fox 11 in Los Angeles. We tried to show you it and then wanted to go out to some of these uh, live events. They spoke with a Paralympic jumper who's getting ready for the Olympics. Let's go out to that conversation. Basically, we are not worthy. <laughs> you are watching the workout routine of Trenton Merrill. He's an athlete who is headed to Tokyo next month to compete Pete in the Paralympic Games. It is quite an amazing accomplishment. Trenton joining us now live to talk about uh, what we can expect. There he is coming to us uh, from San Diego where you are training. How how, Want to know how you're feeling? Are you ready to go? What's, what's going on now that we're uh, getting really close to the moment? Hey Bob, I'm feeling pumped man. I'm ready to go. Ready to uh, represent USA and uh, carry that flag, you know, after competing. We're, we're, we're really proud of you. We're really excited. We can't wait to see all the things you do. I've seen all, all the videos, and, and you're, you're a completely inspiring guy. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey so that the folks at home know uh, how you got here. In fact, you're a motivational speaker, too. So, uh, you know, you, 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 this all started when you were 14 years old, and an accident happened, right? That's correct, Bob. So my journey has been nothing but adversity and, and trials and triumph. And it, it hasn't been easy. I wish I could say that it, you know, it was an easy path to success. But for me, it's always been like a little bit of progress and then like some type of setback and then a little bit more, some type of setback and just year in, year out. So it's been really tough. And I know like this year specifically, a lot of us athletes have had a, or these past two years have had a really tough year and I think my past from 14 years old losing my foot to where I'm at now it's all been like preparation and helping me mentally be prepared for years like this where it's it's really challenging years and it's it's hard to stay focused but day in day out you just got to grind and and stay focused on your goals and your dreams and um, believe that it's possible. What happened when you were 14? I know, I mean, it's, it's had to have been traumatizing for someone so young to uh, lose uh, part of your leg like that. That's right, Bob. When I was 14, I was in an accident that resulted in the amputation of my right foot. My best friend Scott and I, we had um, a little dirt bike track we built in his front yard, and we were just Essentially, we were coming back from my house to his house to go ride on it. And we looked both ways on Paseo Cristina and Simon Creek Road, and we didn't see a car coming. We crossed the street, and right as we passed the center median, mm. we it was like a flash of white. I just saw a flash of white, and essentially a BMW crushed my foot in between a little dirt bike. And, um, you know, we both, we both got hit by that car, and my foot was eventually amputated shortly after. Wow. So we're watching a lot of the videos of you training and, and your jumps. It looks absolutely unbelievable. And many of us had questions here about having the prosthetic and doing this long jump, is which, which you kind of specialize in. So does, what are the challenges of having the prosthetic when you're making that jump? Or does having that prosthetic kind of like propel you even further? Are you able to jump further than, let's say, uh, another athlete? Those are great questions. So jumping on a prosthetic is very challenging for me i had to relearn how to jump off of my prosthetic it was more natural for me once my right foot was amputated even though it was my dominant leg to start doing everything with my left foot so my left foot became my dominant foot and then later on 
as I was training and pursuing my career in track and field, I decided that I essentially wanted to preserve my left foot as much as possible because it's the only one I got left. And uh, it was taking a beating in training, trying to jump and sprint. So I decided to use my right blade as my jumping prosthesis and takeoff foot because if it broke, I could, you know, replace it. So wow. uh, it took a long time to learn how to align the prosthetic because aligning the prosthetic for a long jump is different than just a jogging foot or a sprinting foot. The, the blades themselves have different stiffnesses to them. So you have to find the right category. It's just a ton of trial and error. So eventually once I had accumulated all these data points, you know, from training yeah. and trial and error with uh, the guys on my team. Hey, we got like 90 uh, seconds. We got like 90 seconds left. And and, and first of all, I, the sensation yeah. that you must have being in the air for that long must be unbelievable. You went to the Olympics, the Paralympics in Rio a, a couple of years ago. You almost made it. How are you feeling again coming into this uh, uh, the, this Olympic Games just a couple of weeks ahead? I know you said you have a practice coming up uh, in just a few minutes, but uh, how, how are you feeling coming into the Games uh, this year? I'm pumped. Last Games, you know, I just missed out on the podium. I placed fourth. So this year I'm hungry. I want it. I need it. Uh, so I'm going out there to fight and to win. So I'm, I'm ready to go. All right. And, and you know, there's... A, there's this COVID-19 thing that's out there, we keep talking about that as that relates to the Olympics. Are, are, are you concerned at all? Are you taking extra precautions? What goes through your mind? With COVID-19, you know, that's a, it is a big concern for, concern for a lot of people, but we've been training all us athletes for a long time. And so the biggest thing is just stay focused on, on what we're trying to go out there and do. So I can't control anything that happens with COVID-19 but I can control my effort and what I focus on and my discipline and going out there and giving it the best I can. So that's what I'm going to do. Hey, Trenton Merrill, we are so proud of you. I know you uh, came uh, out of uh, college out here, right? Uh, and you're from San Juan Capistrano, so you're a local guy. We're really proud of you. Go, go Team USA, and we're going to be watching. Let's go. Thank you for having me. Really cool conversation right there. Like he said, uh, he can't control what happens with the pandemic. He can only control himself and his preparation for the big games. So uh, not last live look here as uh, the flame lighting ceremony in Tokyo has officially wrapped up. Happy to bring all of that to you here on Live Now from Fox. We are now going to come back to America, about as American as it get gets to the White House. Uh, White House press briefing held today with uh, Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Play out some of that for you and then uh, we'll go into the rest of the night with some of these other stories we just haven't been able to hit on because uh, it's really been a busy night here. Quite a few breaking news stories, some shootings that we were following out of Houston, Texas, as well as Washington, D.C. Any new information that we get on that, you know, we'll bring it to you as both of those police departments are now searching for information from the public on the suspects that are involved. No suspects in custody in either of those shootings. So we'll definitely be keeping our eyes on that through tonight and through tomorrow as far as coverage goes. Here's the White House, though. Play out this briefing for you. I'm sorry, she's got to go. Busy day. Okay. A um, couple items for you at the top. Uh, this afternoon, the president will bring together leaders from both the labor and business community at the White House to talk about the critical need to invest in America's economic strength by passing the bipartisan infrastructure framework. While some of the participants at this roundtable may have sat across the negotiating table in the past, now they've joined together as part of a broad coalition of labor and business leaders backing this plan. And they're joined in their support by bipartisan leaders in Washington, governors, mayors, and an overwhelming majority of the uh, of the American people. I also wanted to note uh, that today the Department of Justice is announcing or has announced the launch of five gun trafficking strike forces in regions around the country to combat the uptick in gun crimes that we've seen over the last 18 months. As part of this announcement, the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General will visit the headquarters of ATF in Washington before the Attorney General travels to Chicago to meet with the leaders from the Chicago Police Department and attend a listening 
session with participants in a group that offers innovative programming to reduce gun violence. The regional strike forces we've talked about a bit in the past, but they will leverage existing resources to ensure sustained efforts across city and state boundaries to help stem the supply of illegally trafficked firearms in five key regions, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, the San Francisco Bay Area, Sacramento region, and Washington, D.C. And this is part of the administration's comprehensive crime reduction strategy announced last month by at the White House with uh, Attorney General Garland. In addition to targeting gun traffickers to keep guns out of the hands of criminals, the President's plan bolsters local law enforcement efforts by giving them the resources they need to hire more police officers and engage in effective community policing. I also wanted to note that this afternoon the President will sign H.R. 1652, which will help strengthen and restore funding for the Crime Victims Fund, which has lost billions of dollars over the last five years. Uh, this was originally passed in 1984, uh, and uh, which established the Crime Victim Funds, which received most of its fundings, funds through deposits from criminal fines and penalties from convictions in federal cases, and does not receive any appropriated funding of taxpayer dollars. The awards grants, the, this, it awards grants to states, local governments, and other entities uh, for, through DOJ's Office for Victims of Crime. With that, Josh. Thanks, Jen. Uh, three subjects. Uh, first, uh, given the spread of the Delta variant, return to offices, is the administration looking at new mask guidance as reported by the Washington Post? Well, I know that the head of the CDC, our, our public health arm, just spoke to this earlier this morning and made clear that uh, there had not been a decision to change our mask guidance. Uh, two, it's being reported that President Biden plans to impose sanctions on Cuban officials. Uh, because of the attacks on protesters. Can you outline the administration's goals with regard to those sanctions? Sure. Well, I can confirm for all of you that uh, there will be more uh, from the Department of Treasury and the Department of State later this afternoon on sanctions, uh, and the announcement will be coming from then, uh, from them. But I, in terms of our approach to Cuba and what we're trying to accomplish, uh, we have, of course, condemned mass detention, sham trials, and disappearances that are attempts to threaten the Cuban people and to silence. We continue to call for swift, the swift release of peace protesters who have unjustly been detained. We've made clear over the last week that addressing this moment was a priority for the administration and for President Biden, and that he has he had asked his team uh, to look into a range of options that would both help the Cuban people, help provide humanitarian assistance, help look into uh, addressing issues like the lack of Internet access, and that also sanctions authority was a part of those considerations. So uh, this is an announcement that will be coming later this afternoon. I'd also note that we'll continue to engage closely and coordinate with our international partners from the OAS to the U UN and others uh, to collectively condemn the actions of the Cuban government. And then last, real quick, National Association of Realtors says that home prices are up 24.3 percent from a year ago to $363,300, a record. Are home prices too high for an economy that's supposed to be growing from the bottom up and middle out? Well, first I would say um, the President is quite focused on making sure we're doing everything we can to help uh, middle class families uh, as the economy is recovering and as there are ongoing challenges in our economy that have been longstanding, including supply chain issues, which you and many others are quite familiar with. And as he talked about a little bit last night, there are a range of factors that impact that. The, the shortage of lumber uh, that is starting to pick back up has, of course, impacted the building of new homes, which has raised the, pri the prices of older homes. So his focus and a big focus of this administration is on addressing supply chain issues to help address uh, some of these skyrocketing prices in the market. But also he uh, is focused on providing assistance to renters, to, to homeowners and others to get through this period of time in our economy. Go ahead. Uh, Jen, today China rejected a WHO um, plan for a second phase of an investigation into the origins of the coronavirus, uh, including audits of laboratories and markets. Uh, what is the White House's reaction to that, and how will this impact the U.S. dealing with China on this going forward? Well, uh, let me first reiterate that we, the United States, supports the WHO plan for phase two, which commits to ensuring these studies are scientific, transparent, expert-led, and free from interference. Uh, we have certainly seen uh, the PRC's comments, again, rejecting phase two of a WHO study. Uh, we are deeply disappointed. Uh, their position is irresponsible and, frankly, dangerous. Uh, alongside other member, station, member states around the world, uh, we continue to call for China to provide the needed access to data and samples. And this is critical so we can understand to prevent the next pandemic. This is about saving lives in the future. 
uh, and it's not a time to be stonewalling. Uh, I would note that we uh, believe in a multilateral approach. That has not been an approach that has been taken uh, prior to the president office, taking office, and that has been a big focus of his strategy, strategy as it relates to our engagement with China. So, uh, and that relates to our approach to global health security, which is why we rejoined the WHO on day one. Unfortunately, phase one, as you all know, did not yield the data and access from China that we think is necessary. Uh, but our support for a multilateral approach and the phase two plan uh, is, is because it's rigorous and science-based. But most importantly, it's not just the United States calling for this. As a part of our renewed engagement and our efforts to uh, build a coalition of support around the world uh, with allies and partners, we're joined by the international community on this, uh, partners and multilateral organizations who are also calling for and pressuring China to be uh, engaged in the, state, the second phase of this discussion. I would also note, I'm almost done, there's a lot to say about this topic. Um, in Cornwall, uh, at which many of you were with us, uh, with us for that trip, the G7 leaders together called for a transparent evidence-based investigation, including in China. And after the phase one study, we were joined by allies and partners across the world in a joint statement calling for a transparent and independent uh, analysis, expressing our concerns over the lack of access and urging momentum. It's clear China isn't living up to their obligations. What our focus is on is building this multilateral effort uh, and support for putting pressure on uh, and making clear that it's unacceptable and dangerous. Do you see any consequences for China for this decision? Well, I'm not going to get ahead of any policy process. I will tell you that, uh, again, our uh, approach to China as it relates to global health security is going to continue to be in a coordinated uh, fashion with our international Just partners. One last mm -hmm. on China. Yeah. They have also started a new crackdown in Hong Kong, this time on children's book authors. Any thoughts on that? I think we have uh, expressed many times before, unfortunately, because there has been uh, reason to express many times before our concerns about the crackdown on freedom of speech, freedom of media, uh, a crackdown on, uh, on, uh, on a right, a human rights activists in Hong Kong, uh, and we continue to express that. Go ahead. You mentioned there had not been a decision to change the guidelines on wearing a face mask for fully vaccinated Americans, but have there been any conversations within the administration about possibly changing those guidelines? Well, we are guided by uh, the science and we're guided by our public health experts and any decision would come from the CDC. The head of the CDC spoke to this earlier this morning. So conversations within the administration, that's what the Washington Post was also reporting. There were early conversations in the administration about possibly changing those guidelines. I've seen the reporting, uh, but what I can tell you is that there has been no decision to uh, change our mask guidelines. If uh, Any decisions about public health would be driven by the CDC. But of course, we are engaged with public health experts and the CDC about how to continue to attack the virus. And we've never said that battle is over. It's still ongoing. It would be more concerning or should be more concerning to all of you and the American people if we were not having those conversations. So there are certainly conversations about uh, steps we can and should take. But I think uh, Dr. Walensky was quite clear this morning. And just one quick follow up. We heard the CDC director today warn about the rise in the Delta variant, saying that it's spreading with incredible efficiency. At what point would the White House reconsider the protocols for the president and for administration officials? Well, we're guided by the public health guidance and the CDC guidelines, and that's what we abide by here. Uh, they have not changed those, and uh, so we continue to abide by the guidelines we have announced to all of you. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, obviously, there are a lot of parents who are wondering what school is going to look like in the fall. And last night, the president said this, quote, the CDC is going to say that everyone under the age of 12 should probably be wearing a mask in school. That's probably what's going to happen. Uh, has the CDC indicated that that is, in fact, their position? They, already, soon could we hear from that they did already announce that several weeks ago as a part of their CDC guidance for schools, um, because anybody under 12 is not eligible to be vaccinated, so they would not be vaccinated, and so therefore they should be wearing a mask. Um, also, we now know that Hunter Biden is going to be able to meet with prospective buyers at two art shows where his paintings are going to be on display later this year. How does this square with the goal of keeping him in the dark about the buyers of his art as a means to prevent even the appearance of undue influence? Well, this showing that was uh, that you're referencing was previously public. Uh, he's not going to have any conversations related to the selling of art. 
uh, that will be left to the gallerist, as was outlined in uh, the agreement that we announced uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, we believe this is a reasonable system that has been established that allows for Hunter Biden to work in his profession within appropriate safeguards. So, going to discuss anything related to the selling of art, uh, and I would reiterate that the gallerist will be the only person who handles transactions or conversations in that vein, and will reject any offer that is out of the ordinary. Wouldn't it be more transparent to just release the names of the buyers so that everyone would know who purchased this art and how much they paid? Well, we don't. We won't know who the buyers are. Uh, Hunter Biden won't know who the buyers are. So I think the re the origin I think of this line of questioning, which is understandable, is about whether this would provide on uh, provide a situation for undue influence. But we won't know who they are. So there's no scenario where they could provide influence. Didn't they just announce on social media that they bought a painting? Uh, again, I think we have set up a system which we feel is appropriate, has appropriate safeguards. Uh, we believe that Hunter Biden, just like any child of a president, should be able to pursue uh, their professions and their passions. And uh, any uh, selling of the art would be uh, through the gallerist. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Uh, on schools first, now that the education department admits they made a mistake in their guide for reopening by- How so? Well, uh, they included advice from the Abolitionist Teaching Network, uh, and they came out and said that was not supposed to be in there. Uh, is the administration going to follow up with school districts to make sure that the Abolitionist Teaching Network uh, material is not in lesson plans? Well, just to be clear for the context, because I know you love context of yeah. what you're yeah. asking about here, what you're referring to is a citation in a report of which there were a thousand citations. So I'm quite impressed with your researchers to, for finding one of a thousand citations. Uh, it was an error in a lengthy document to include this citation. Uh, the specific site does not endorse, we, does not rec represent the administration's view, uh, and we don't endorse uh, the recommendations of this group. And I believe it's been removed or is in the process of being removed. But we are close to schools reopening, and is there any concern if you don't endorse this material that was in there, citation or not, uh, that it's in lesson plans? Well, first I would say that, as we've said many times before, uh, we don't dictate or recommend specific curriculum decisions uh, from the federal government. That is and will continue to be handled at the local level. And we believe that the American people trust teachers to make those decisions, not and, government. And then on masks, a few weeks ago, the president said we were closer than ever to declaring our independence from a deadly virus. Is that still the case if you guys are now reportedly considering asking vaccinated people to wear masks again? Well, first of all, the CDC director who oversees decisions along those lines and all of our public health decisions made clear that that was not a decision that had been made just a few hours ago. So I, I point out that first. Second, I would say what the president was uh, referring to and continues to talk about, as he did last night at a town hall, is that we're quite proud of the progress that's been made. Uh, people over 65, more than 80 percent are vaccinated. Almost 70 percent of adults are vaccinated. 162 million Americans uh, are vaccinated. That is certainly progress. But we are still at war with the virus. We've never said that would be over. We've always said that we'd be, be continue to continuing to focus on ensuring we're meeting people where they are and getting them vaccinated, but, keeping them safe. But the president said in May, vaxxed or masked. I, is, I, I think a lot of people got the vaccine because they were hearing him say, if you get the vaccine, you don't have to wear masks anymore. Sure. So, And that continues to be CDC guidance. And you can say that that's going to be the guidance forever. I am not the CDC director. I understand, but people don't care who tells them to wear a mask. They, they should the care. House, should, the White House shouldn't the they CDC care if it's a doctor, a medical saying. expert, or a spokesperson? I think most Americans actually do care. It's the government. OK. Kelly, go ahead. Is there a conversation about encouraging people to make the personal choice that Dr. Walensky talked about today if they, for example, are vaccinated but live in a state with low vaccination rates or have other considerations? Is part of your messaging going to be encouraging the personal choice piece on mask wearing? 
Well, that is currently our messaging, right? So I would say that uh, for communities where there are lower rates of vaccination, and, and as we know, that that's really concentrated in only a handful of states across the country where most of the cases are coming from, uh, as we've seen the rise in the Delta variant, which is more transmissible, and if you're not vaccinated, it is transferring, no question, uh, more quickly uh, across people. People should wear masks, and that is something we will continue to encourage uh, leaders and civic leaders and educators uh, and uh, people who are trusted voices in communities to make clear. And those are vaccinated people you're referring to, the personal choice to wear the mask in those high rate areas. That's, that, not that's, that's not the advice of the CDC at this point in time, so that is not a message we are conveying to and people. Dr. Walensky said today that it can be a personal choice for of the course. vaccinated. Of course, it can be. And some people make that decision because they are immunocompromised, because uh, they have family members, because they just want an extra layer of protection, and we should all uh, respect that. But it is not proactive guidance that the CDC is providing. Last night, the president said you're not going to get COVID if you have these vaccinations. Why did he say that when that is not what the science says? Well, what the science says is that 97% of hospitalizations are people who are unvaccinated. So yes, there are uh, cases of individuals who are vaccinated, to be absolutely clear, who, uh, who do have gotten COVID. It is a very small percentage and a small number of people. And those cases, vast, vast, vast majority are asymptomatic and they have, uh, they have minor symptoms, which means uh, that you are largely protected. That was the point he was trying to make last night. It's been a couple of days since we talked about the breakthrough case on the campus here and that you acknowledge there were additional breakthrough cases. Can you give us now the number of breakthrough cases that have occurred uh, during the Biden presidency? Well, I would say first that um, our medical experts, our health experts, have been conveying from the beginning, as have we, that there would be cases of individuals who are vaccinated who uh, tested positive for COVID. Uh, there are 2,000 people who work on the campus. Uh, and of course, so that means that just statistically speaking, there will be people who are uh, vaccinated individuals who get COVID on the campus. Uh, what I announced yesterday or conveyed yesterday was what our policy would be moving forward. Uh, but no, I don't think you can expect that we're going to be providing numbers of breakthrough cases. No. Really? That's not transparency to give us a number, not the names, but a number of these cases? You must have that information. Well, Kelly, I think, one, we're in a very different place than we were several months ago. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of individuals who are vaccinated who get COVID will have will be asymptomatic or have mild cases. Oh, every individual uh, at this White House has been offered a vaccine. And we have been very clear that we will be uh, transparent with anyone who has had close proximity contact with the president or any of the four principals as deemed by the White House Medical Unit uh, with all of you. And if they, uh, if they approve having their name released, we will also release their names, but we will protect their privacy. That will be our policy moving forward. And we understand and agree that that is in the public interest. Go ahead. Jen, last night at the CNN town hall, the president was asked by a, a restaurateur about the worker shortage that the Commerce Secretary just called acute. She described it as a skills gap, uh, but the, the restaurateur said that he had, right now, job openings that he can't fill, and he asked the president if there's anything that his administration can do to help him and his business. The president seemed to struggle with an answer. Is there anything that his administration can do to help that restaurateur or people who are similarly situated with this acute worker shortage? Well, first, I, I would say that we have already implemented and the money has gone out the door, go is continuous to go out the door for our restaurant restabilization program, uh, something that was a part of the American Rescue Plan and helped many, many hundreds of uh, restaurants across the country stay open, reopen. And that was assistance that came from the American Rescue Plan uh, that the president signed into law. Um, I think what the president was noting is that uh, at this point in time, it's also a workers' market. And uh, in some places, uh, it may be that you have to pay more wages in order to attract workers. Uh, we don't have all the details, of course, about his individual circumstance, but we implemented a major program that helped restaurants stay open, something we strongly supported, we advocated for as a part of the package. I can ask a follow-up to the question about the president's son and the art gallery events. Mm -hmm. um, you said that uh, Hunter Biden is not going to discuss anything related to the sale of his art. Is that a promise that has been made in writing? And if, if so, is that uh, an agreement that can be made available to the public? I'm making that clear to all of you now that that is an agreement that has been made as a part of this, uh, as a part of these events. Is it in writing? I can check and see if there's more detail.
Yes. But I think it's pretty clear what the agreement is, so I'm not sure it's more complicated than that, but I will see if there's more to provide. Uh, thanks, Jen. One on masks and then one quick one on the Fed after that. Um, Dr. Fauci told reporters earlier today that there isn't enough research to know whether breakthrough cases can result in long COVID. Um, the president has repeatedly told the public that you know they should they're safe from the worst effects of COVID. How can he be sure without this research? And if there's even a chance that uh, breakthrough cases can result in long COVID, why not recommend masks more widely? Well, I think what the president's referring to one, we've seen some interesting polling over the last week. I believe it was a CBS poll that showed that vaccinated people in the country are more fearful about the Delta variant than unvaccinated people. That's clearly concerning to us because unvaccinated people should be more fe fearful. And what the president wanted to convey to people in the country is the impact and effect of getting vaccinated. So we also know statistically that 97% of hospitalizations are for people who are unvaccinated. And that the vast majority of cases are asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms, which the health and medical experts will tell you. That's true. There's still research about a range of components of the impacts of COVID over the long term, which our health and medical uh, 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 leaders will advise us on. They also have not changed their guidance on masks. That is not a determination that's being made by from a political standpoint or from anyone in the White House. That is something the CDC and our health and medical experts are advising on, and they look at a range of factors. And just on the Fed, is, is the president concerned at all that choosing a new Federal Reserve chairman during a period of economic uncertainty and inflation could complicate the economic recovery or spook the, spook the markets? I just have nothing to preview for you in terms of uh, the end of the term next winter. Go ahead. Oh, do you already ask? Go ahead, Jen. Um, on infrastructure, um, Senator Carper, one of your allies, um, said that he um, wants to make sure that the water infrastructure measures that the Senate already passed and the surface uh, transportation reauthorization bill um, that passed out of his committee are also included in uh, the, the infrastructure agreement. Um, I know that the, the bipartisan group said yesterday that they were 99% of the way there. I know there are some issues that Republican lawmakers are working out with the White House right now. Are Senator Carper's concerns also something that the White House is aware of and working on at this point? We're certainly aware of the, uh, the concerns that have been expressed or asks or requests uh, by uh, a range of members. Uh, this is typically what happens, as you all know, in this period of time where we're very close to a point where there's going to be a vote on a motion to proceed and everybody uh, who has initiatives, who has priorities, is going to make their voice heard. Uh, that's a part of the process. We respect that. Uh, so certainly we're engaged in discussions, as is the leadership. And uh, I would also note that that we are uh, we see clear signs of momentum. And and we were quite we were quite encouraged by the letter uh, yesterday's letter signed by 11 Republicans and 11 Democrats showing positive signs about being able to go uh, forward soon. And the president is, of course, eager to deliver these economic benefits to Americans in red states and blue states that they've long been waiting for. Do you think there's flexibility to add more money to this bill for those measures that were got wide support on the hill? I think there was a clear agreement that the president and members of both parties uh, stood outside of the White House and announced just a few weeks ago. Uh, of course, there will be final uh, discussions over the coming days uh, as they work to finalize the bill text. And just on, on the filibuster, um, the president said last night um, that getting rid of it would throw the entire Congress into chaos and nothing will get done. And that's sort of his justification for not getting rid of it. Um, with maybe the exception of uh, anything that can kind of be done along party lines and perhaps this infrastructure bill as well, likely this infrastructure bill, um, is anything getting done? Will anything get done, you know, that can't just be done for reconciliation? You know, once we get past this this infrastructure thing, and if, if and 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 or if things that can't get done are things like voting rights that are so big, or dealing with climate or immigration, um, is there really any difference between having the filibuster in place and getting rid of it, uh, with sort of the president's justification for not getting rid of it? Well, first, the president doesn't make the decision on filibuster rules or parliamentary rules in the Senate. The Senate does, and um, he'll leave that to the Senate. It also requires the majority uh, in the Senate to support 
uh, a rule change. And so what he was referring to is simply what that process would look like and the fact that there are some in the Senate who have said they would halt all business if that conversation were to happen. So in some means he was reporting out what is publicly known about what the process might look like moving forward. Um, I'll leave it to all of you to whip count on how many votes there would be for filibuster changes. You're just listening in to White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki answering a number of questions. She started out that press conference, though, talking about the latest push from the Biden administration when dealing with this surge in crime across the country. Attorney General Merrick Garland starting his day off today uh, at the ATF headquarters addressing illegal firearms and uh, everyone having easy access to them. Just tonight in Washington, D.C., a shooting, uh, and they believe it was with an illegal firearm. That's according to D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. We're going to play out that press conference for you in just a little bit here, but we wanted to show you this video first as the search is underway now for the suspect in the shooting. Suspects, I guess I should say, as you can see, these uh, two individuals fleeing into the car, hoods up, one with a white hoodie, one with a black hoodie. Uh, that is a good indication of who they're looking for at this time. They are asking for any information from the public. Uh, they say call your local police, DC police, very serious about these charges that these two suspects could undergo here pretty soon. Uh, so let's go out to that press conference happening just within the past couple of hours here on Live Now from Fox. We showed you the beginning coverage when we first heard about it, and now we are hearing more uh, details about the shooting itself. Again, two men shot there in critical condition. Uh, I'm sorry, non-life-threatening condition at this time. So here's the latest from police down on the ground. You ready? All right. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm um, Robert J. Conti, the third chief of police of the Metropolitan Police Department. I want to give you an update on the shooting uh, situation that we had here uh, this evening. Uh, just about 8.20 p.m., members of the Metropolitan Police Department were in the area, uh, heard gunfire uh, in, the area of the third, 14, uh, in the area of 14th and Riggs uh, Street Northwest. Uh, members responded uh, to that area, with, uh, responded to the shooting scene within about five seconds after hearing the shots, where they located uh, two individuals suffering from non-life-threatening uh, gunshot wounds. It appears at this time that at least one of those individuals uh, was the target of the shooting.